The following programs were originally aired live, long before the advent of high fidelity. And they were recorded using a variety of means, from direct recording onto early audio tape and glass records, to simply placing the microphone of a wire recorder in front of the speakers of a radio playing the program. I hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to these. Some of the all-time favorite shows. nightly old-time radio shows, and boy does time fly, we are already at June the 29th for this year. And here is what happened on this day in history. In 1613, Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London burns down during a performance of Henry VIII. <laughs> well... <laughs> I'm not sure I would ever perform that play again. Seems like God was making his feelings known on that one. Good point. So why is that... So why is Macbeth considered the, the um, cursed play, but not Henry VIII? No idea. 19, in 1900, the Imperial Chinese Court issues what is essentially, essentially a declaration of war against foreigners in China, blaming them for hostilities and giving license to the boxers for even greater ferocity. In 1964, Civil Rights Act of 1964 passes after an 83-day filibuster by Democrats in the U.S. Senate. In 1966, Vietnam War, U.S. planes bombed the North Vietnamese cap capital Hanoi and the port city of Haiphong for the first time. In 1994, U.S. reopens Guantanamo Naval Base to process refugees. In 1964, NBC approves Gene Roddenberry's script for pilot episode of Star Trek titled The Cave. In 1888, first known recording of classical music plays. Handles Israel and Egypt on wax cylinder. In 1958, FIFA World Cup Final, Ra Rashuda Stadium, Stockholm, Sweden. Veva Pele each score two goals as Brazil, as Brazil beats Sweden 5-2. And that was this day in history. Now let's get on with the shows. Hey, Maya, who's on first? Why, it's Bud Abbott and Lou Costello who are up next. <laughs> That's right, folks. C for comedy. A for Abbott. M for Maxwell. E for Ennis. L for Lou Costello. Yes, they spell camel. Your taste will tell you about camel's rich, full flavor. Your throat will welcome camel's cool mildness. So draw up a chair for tonight's camel show, starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. <laughs> Come over here. Hey, Lou. I saw you talking to uh, some city slickers downstairs. Now, I hope you didn't didn't let them sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. Them sell me the Brooklyn Bridge? Yeah. Not me, Abbott. 
They tried to sell me the Brooklyn Bridge for ten thousand dollars. Yeah. But I didn't buy it. Good boy. I bought the George Washington Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> Not selling you're impossible. You're a disgrace to the Abbott family. Hmm. Why we Abbotts belong to the upper crust, you know. You Abbotts are a bunch of crumbs. I hear now. <laughs> hey, Costellos are a high class family. Abbott. What do you mean? The Costellos are the only family in Patterson, New Jersey, whose garbage is gift wrapped. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Um, oh, is that so? And the Costello's very wealthy, too. Their mean? house has a 14-carat living room, a 14-carat dining room, and five 14-carat bedrooms. Solid gold? Nope, solid carrots. Solid carrots? Hey, in fact, Abbott, I was born with a silver knife in my, my mouth. You mean a silver spoon? No knife. We had more money than table manners. In fact, my family had, had money ever since I was at the awkward age. The awkward age? The awkward age. Yep, yep, the awkward age. Well, that's that's when you feel clumsy and homely. I Your imagine. clothes don't fit you. And girls, girls won't come near you. It started with me, Abbott, when I was about nine. When was it over? I don't know, but I hope soon. I... <laughs> you and your family, a bunch of nobodies. Now, look at these pictures of the Abbots. Now, there's a picture of my father. Well, poor Dad, he died just before I was born. He must have known what was coming. Now, never mind that. <laughs> never mind. Now, here, here's a picture of my sister, Olive. Yeah. Every once she says she looks... They say she looks like Lana Turner, Betty Grable, and Rita Hayworth. Rolled into one. Yep, and when you unroll her, she looks like Wallace Berry. Yeah, oh, no, 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 never mind. Never mind about that, Costello. I'm proud of my family. They're industrious, and they all work like bees. I'm glad you said that, Abbott. What do you because mean? Because that brings me to my bedtime story for tonight. Is... The story about the grasshopper and the little bee. I'm going to tell it now, and I don't need any help from you, Abbott. You keep your mouth shut in the all whole right. story. All right. I tell the story all by myself. Now, all right. Abbott. Right. You go over to Bloomingdale's and show them what a blooming idiot looks like. Nah, yeah. <laughs> that that happened one little story. Once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a happy little bee, and he was just about the nicest little nah, bee. Nah, he was a drone. He, 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 what? Drone, drone. <laughs> yeah, drone. If you drone, shut up, I'll have you drone out of the studio. All right, go ahead. Now, this little bee had a girlfriend, and his girlfriend would buzz around every morning and gather stuff from the flowers. No, 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 and no, 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 no. Stuff, stuff from the flowers. Stuff. The, and... bee, the bee and his girlfriend would gather nectar. Did I have that again? Nectar, nectar. Certainly he nectar. Yeah. It was his girlfriend. It was his girlfriend, Abbott. All if right. he wanted a nectar, let him nectar. Right. You and nobody else is going to stop bees from nectar. All right, well, go ahead. Forget about it. Go on All with right. the story. Now, these two bees were in love with each other. He got married. And one day they had a little baby bee. A little bumble from heaven. Uh, a little bumble from heaven. All right, all right. We heard I thought we it was heard. good for another one. Cut that out and go on. <laughs> go on with the story. Well, that was a honey, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm really getting sweet. Okay, right, well, don't now, me on one it. day the bee, the bee met a grasshopper and they started talking. And the grasshopper had said like this. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Said, now, wait a minute, huh? Costello, how can a grasshopper talk? A grasshopper talks by rubbing his hind legs together. Oh, now that's silly. Can you do it? Oh, now listen, please. You're, <laughs> you're messing up this a whole story. Uh, the story of the grasshopper and the bee is very simple. The moral of the story is be industrious. Now, I told this story to my brother Herman 20 years ago and he profited by it. Today, he is a very successful man. Yeah? What is your brother Herman doing now? Oh, uh, he's at the J&M dry cleaning plant. The J&M dry cleaning plant? What's he doing there? Dying. Dying? Mm -hmm. That's terrible, Abbott. I didn't even know he was sick. He's not sick. He's dying. <laughs> he's dying and he ain't sick? No, that's right. <laughs> if he was sick, he couldn't, uh, couldn't be dying. Why not? Well, because it's against the rules of the cleaning plant. Woo! <laughs> you see, <laughs> you see uh, if a man is sick, they, they won't let him in the place to die. They want him to die out on the street? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> they don't want him to die in the street. When he dies, he has to die on the seventh floor. He's got to die on the seventh floor. <laughs> Certainly. Is there an elevator in the joint? No. The nerve of the people making a poor guy walk up seven floors and still let him go home to die. No, wait, 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 wait. wait. Because his wife won't uh, let him die at home. Oh, he can't even die in his own house. No, 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 no. If there's any dying to be done around the house, his wife does it. Wait a minute. You mean his wife's got to die, too? Certainly. Look, Abbott, what are you trying to do? Bump up the whole family? I got a good mind to bring poor Herman over to my house to die. Oh, he couldn't die at your house. What's wrong with my house? My grandmother died there. If it's good enough for her, it's good enough for Herman. Look, Costello, the reason he couldn't die at your house is because you have no die. You've got to have die to die? That's right. That's right. That's right. This thing gets worse all the time. Look, tell me something, Abbott. Why does poor Herman have to die? He dies, he dies for a living. He dies for a living? <laughs> Look, Abbott, make up your mind, will you? Is he living or dying? Uh, yes. He's been dying for years. He even teaches other people how to die. Woo! He teaches other people you how to die. You mean he teaches people how to die? Yes. That's terrible. Hey, who taught him how to die in the first place? I did. Abbott, you're a devil! Listen! 
Question, you imbecile. When I say Herman is dying, I don't mean he's dying like a person dies when he dies. I mean he's dying for a living. And a person that dies for a living is living even though he's dying. Oh, when you say your brother Herman is dying, you don't mean that he's dying like a person dies when he dies. You mean he's dying for a living, and a person that dies for a living is living though he is dying. Now you've got it. Now I've got it. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> up a camel and listen to Skinny on as you talk. Skinny sings, I'll close my eyes to everyone but you. And when I do, I'll see you standing there. I'll lock my heart to any other career. I'll never say yes to a new love affair. I'll close my eyes to everything that's gay. To do nothing to share each lovely day. And through the years, those moments when we're apart, I'll close my eyes and see you in my heart. And through the years, those moments when we're Close my eyes and see you with my heart. Hey, Abbott. What? Abbott, I've got great news. My family is coming over here tonight to visit me. The whole family? Oh, but my Uncle Tom, he can't come. They put him in jail because his wife is as pretty as a picture. No, no, they can't put a man in jail because his wife is as pretty as a picture. They can if he tries to hang her on the wall. <laughs> I'm sorry, ma'am, but you can't come in here. I know my right. You can't keep me out of here. I want to see Lucatello. I've got to see Lucatello. I demand to see Lucatello. Wait a minute. 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 I got on the bus and the driver told me that I want to see Lucatello, and I don't think there's anybody... Wait a minute! <laughs> Would you mind shutting your mouth so I can see who you are? <laughs> It's my Aunt Alma. Louie, oh, my favorite nephew. My goodness, you look terrible. You've been working too hard. What you need is a few days rest. You're coming home with me and work on the farm for a few days. Work on the farm? What do I have to do? You'll love it, Louis. You get up in the morning at 4 o'clock, milk 40 or 50 cows, clean out the chicken coops, gather the eggs, take 20 or 30 pails of water from the well, chop four or five cords of wood, pile it in the barn, feed the pigs and the goats, clean out the pig pens, and zingo, you're ready for breakfast. Could I have an extra bowl of Wheaties? <laughs> Certainly. Now, right after breakfast, you hitch up the plow, turn over the back 40, then five or six miles of fence, dig a drainage ditch around the barn, pick and crate a couple of hundred crates of apples, pitch five or six tons of hay, weed the onion patch, cultivate the potatoes, clean out the rabbit hoops, whitewash the barn, grind the valves in the tractor, and zingo, you're ready for lunch. All I do is eat. I'll just have a moat. I'll just have a moat. I don't want to waste any time. Good. Now, right after lunch, you roll out the butter churn, turn 40 or 50 pounds of butter, get out the cider press and squeeze out a few barrels of cider, bale 30 or 40 tons of alfalfa, round up the turkeys, the geese, and the guinea hens, spray the apple orchard, clean out the duck pond, fill all the lanterns, bed down the cows, curry the horses, and zingo, you're ready for supper. Well, we haven't. Curried horse? <laughs> Now, right after supper, you hitch up the horse and buggy and go caught in the farmer's daughter that lives down the road. She's a gorgeous redhead with beautiful white skin and a luscious figure. She climbs into the buggy beside you. You ride along in the moonlight. The horse knows the way. And suddenly the horse stops. This gorgeous girl flies over close to you on the buggy seat. She puts her arms around you, and you put your arms around her. She strokes your hair, and you put your head on her shoulder. And then, do you know what you do? Zingo! I'm ready for lunch. <laughs> You sit over there, Ann. I'm going to rest your hands and face. Hey, look. Hey, look, Costello. Here comes Marilyn Maxwell. Oh, Marilyn Maxwell. 
Hello, Hi. Marilyn. Hello. Hello, Lewis, honey. Gee, Marilyn, you look wonderful tonight. That's a beautiful sweater you're wearing. Oh, do you like it? I made it myself. It's really a man's sweater. A man's sweater? You could have fooled me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go away, Marilyn. Costello's relatives are coming over from uh, New Jersey, and I'm sure you'd like to meet them. Well, I certainly would. Ah, oh, Lewis. Someday you and I will be married, and I'll be the wife, and you'll be the husband. Marilyn, I wouldn't have it any other way. Ah, <laughs> oh, Lewis. Lewis, you're so sweet. Oh, you have yes. such a lovable personality. Oh, you're so, so cuddly and so cute. <laughs> I hate to leave you. There he is, Mike. Louie, my boy, how are you? Hey, Ed, it's my Aunt May. Hello, Aunt May. Louie, my boy, I brought your Uncle Mike and your little nephew, Broccoli, along to see you. Broccoli, kiss your Uncle Louie. What for? I ain't do nothing. <laughs> Broccoli, where are your manners? Mike, speak to your son. Hello, Broccoli. Get up! <laughs> Go ahead, May. Tell him why we came over. Louie, you just gotta put Broccoli on your program. He's one of those talented boys in Patterson. That boy has a head on his shoulders. I've seen better heads on a stale glass of beer. <laughs> oh, yeah? I've been listening to your program, fatso. <laughs> What's wrong with it? And playing why is it safe? Uh, <laughs> just a minute, Broccoli. Uh, what would you suggest for our program? Kevin McGee and Molly. <laughs> now, you guys are all right for the round haircuts and the long underwear crowd, but the stuff you're doing went out with the high button shoes, Mac. Broccoli is right. You better listen to him, Louie. What your audience needs is young blood. And if you don't get broccoli out of here, they're going to get some. Oh, uh, please. <laughs> please, folks, we've got a program to do. Would you mind waiting outside till we're finished? Quiet, dudes. May show Louis the sketch which you have written for us to do with him tonight. Now, wait a minute. We can't do that. My sponsor wouldn't like it. All right, if your sponsor means more to you than we do, we'll go. We've got some poor relations. Now, wait a minute, Aunt You May. can kick us around. We don't care. Aunt May, wait we a minute. We mean nothing to you. Aunt May, wait, wait a minute. minute. That's the house she gave us for Christmas. What a house. <laughs> What's wrong with it? It's only got two bathrooms, and there's three of us in the family. <laughs> Please don't cry anymore, Aunt May. I'll do anything you say. Oh, good boy, Louie. I was only acting to prove to you that I'm a great actress. Didn't I sound like Lauren Bacalach? Bacalach? <laughs> you mean Lauren Bacall? <laughs> Sounded more like Lauren Jitus. Laura, Castella, we're wasting time. What are we going to do? Okay, give me the sketch, Aunt May. <laughs> Listen to this title, Abbott. A brand new love story entitled Beside the Shalimar Under the Garden Gate Waiting in the Cottage Small By a Waterfall in Greenpoint Where the sea is sunny And the dawn comes up Like flying fish In a good old summer time Good night, folks We're a little late I ain't gonna do it But, Louie This is a love story In this sketch You make love to Marilyn Maxwell I still I'm not Hmm? I said Marilyn Maxwell Is the girl you make love to In my sketch Oh, well You'll have to give me time To think it over Okay All right <laughs> Let me see that thing, Louie. Mm-hmm. Mm. Costello, this looks good. Look, the scene opens with you and Marilyn in a canoe, drifting down a beautiful stream. You're in the stern and she's in the bow. Can't you make it a rowboat and get us both in the back seat? No. It's got to be a canoe. Then rip out all the seats and make it every man for himself. Quiet. Marilyn looks into your eyes and says, Come to me, Louis. Come to me, my love. I drop the paddle and make for it. No, 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 you don't drop the paddle. But I can buy a new paddle for a buck and a half. No, 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 no not, not yet. You park the canoe under a clump of willow trees because that's where you're going to kiss her. And you know that no one can see you. Oh, am I a stinker? No, 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 no. <laughs> now, Marilyn leans forward. Her lips are parted. She says, I'm yours from now on. And now, do you know what you do? Singo, I'm ready for lunch. <laughs> oh, no, no. No, no, you're playing hard to get. You're a city slicker. I'm the village idiot. That's what I am. Please, Costello, you look at Marilyn and slowly you begin inch away. Way forward. Inch by inch. Inch by inch. Get me over there. I only rented the boat for an hour. No, no, no. <laughs> now the moment has come. You're underneath the clump of trees. You take her in your arms. You look up suddenly. You see that a tree is beginning to fall. You don't want her to be frightened by the falling tree. 
till you whispered tenderly in her ear, Sketch, Louis, my boy. That's the kind of writing that belongs to the ages. Yes, the ages between five and seven. Ah, take that sketch away from them, Mom. These two boobs will last it up anyway. Now, Neither listen. one of them knows how to act. Why, you... Wait little... a minute, Robert. Don't, don't. Let me talk to the boy. Broccoli. Yeah? Come here to your Uncle Louis. How would you like to be on the radio with me? Now you're talking sense. Mm-hmm. What do I do? Well, you can help me with my imitations. Yeah? The first one will be that of the Australian Auk. An Australian orc. How do we do it? Just put your neck between my two hands. Uh-huh. That's it. Oh! <laughs> and no jury will ever convict me. <laughs> Camel presents lovely Marilyn Maxwell from Metro Golden Mayor, producers of Lady in the Lake. For camel fans everywhere, Marilyn sings, He's Just My Kind. Why he left me, I don't know. I love him more than I could show. I've always had him on my mind. He's just my kind. Didn't even say goodbye. He never liked to see me cry. Afraid my tears might change his mind. He's just my kind. Mine was an ordinary man. Not the type you'd notice passing by. When he came along, my life began. And I love him. Till the day I die Take him back Well, I should say I'd even meet him On the way Though he's not worth it I don't mind He's just my does a cigarette register with you? Why, in your T-zone, of course. That's T for taste and T for throat, your proving ground for any cigarette. And when you try a camel on your T-zone, your taste will register the pleasure of camel's rich, full flavor of superbly blended choice tobaccos. Your throat will register the pleasure of camel's own cool mildness. So why don't you try a camel on your T-zone now? See if you don't exclaim like so many other happy smokers, camels suit my T-zone to a T. According to a recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Well, Costello, I hope you're satisfied. You brought your relatives over, broke up our show, probably got us wrong with the sponsor, and allowed your nephew, Broccoli, to publicly insult me. Me, your best friend. Why? Why? Why do you do things like that? Oh, I'm a bad boy. <laughs> Here I am. I'm ready to meet your relatives. Too late, Marilyn. I'll probably never see them again. They did a terrible thing. I'm afraid they got us in wrong with our sponsor. Well, Lewis, honey, what do your relatives do in New Jersey? They're jiggers in a burlesque show. <laughs> jiggers? You mean they do a dancing act? No. They stand outside of the burlesque show, and when the police come, they holler, Jiggers! The cops! <laughs> All kidding aside, Marilyn, I love my family. 
And I love my neighbors, too. I love everybody. Friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears, your eyes, your noses. Lend them your ears, your eyes, and your noses. Stop shooting, fool. Lay down your cues. We have a message to bring to you. Be a friend, be a pal. If your neighbor has a horse, help him hitch it. If he's ever lost, oh, help him yell. Open the door, Richard. Or you her chassis? Be a pal to your folks. Oh, Louis, my little dipsy doodle, you're so generous. Thank you for that quart of perfume. Oh, that's nothing, Merlin. But a quart of perfume, Louis. Mm -hmm. Most fellas only buy their girls a dram. <laughs> but I'm the kind of guy that just don't give a dram. <laughs> oh, one day I met an old friend that I knew. So thin, his clothes didn't fit him. He said, Lewis, I ain't had a fight for weeks. And so I bit him. <laughs> That's so. You know, I never realized how generous you really are. How democratic and... Congress may be listening. <laughs> and you're so good to your family. Oh, that's nothing, Abbott. Nobody can be too good to their folks. I'll uh, be a good boy to my family. They'll never uh, squawk. Mm -mm. Now every time I buy them uh, a pork chops, I won't remove the pork. I'm gonna buy my folks a auto one that is new. And in a year, if they still like it, I'll buy the motor too. I may be just a little guy, but I'm gonna be a biggie. I'm gonna uh, take my piggy bank and give it uh, back to my little piggy. I will never fight. I will always be polite. I'll try to bring everybody joy. Yeah. And he'll promise that he will always do what's right. Even though they say that I'm, I'm a bad boy. That's it, folks. That's it. Uh, uh, just, just a minute. Costello, it's the sponsor, and he wants to talk to you. Here it comes, Go ahead. Here it comes. Go ahead. Costello, oh. this is your sponsor. I heard your family on the show tonight, and I want Please, you to Mr. know... Sponsor, it isn't my fault. But I want... I'm sorry to... about the whole thing. I'm sorry it happened. Mr. Sponsor, I didn't know. Now, just Please a minute. Please don't fire us, Mr. Sponsor. Now, it's... just a minute. It's... Just a minute. Mr. Sponsor, I promise you it will never happen again. We want it to happen again. Those people are funnier than you are. You should take them to California with you. Goodbye. No, no, not that. Hey, I'm not. Oh, oh. Evelyn Costello will be back in just a moment for Camel Cigarettes. During the war, the makers of Camel Cigarettes sent a total of more than 150 million free camels to our fighting men overseas. Now, free camels are sent to servicemen's hospitals instead. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Tuskegee, Alabama, U.S. Army Tilton General Hospital, Fort Dix, New Jersey, U.S. Naval Hospital, Bremerton, Washington, U.S. Marine Hospital, Portland, Maine, and Veterans Hospital, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Camel broadcasts throughout the United States three times a week, a rebroadcast to practically every area in the world where our men are still stationed and to our good neighbors in Central and South America. And now here are Bud Abbott and Lou Costello with the final word. Well, Costello, next week we'll be back broadcasting from Hollywood. 
Uh, do you think the folks will be glad to see us, Lou? Abbott, the last time I went back, they welcomed me with a big celebration. They burned a streetcar in my honor. They did? Yes. Fortunately, I got out of it just in time. Good, good night, folks. Good night. Good night, night baby. Be right home next week, Mom. Pop and good night, baby. baby. Pipe appeal. That's what Prince Albert smoking tobacco gives a pipe. Say thousands of happy Prince Albert smokers. Yes, it's Prince Albert that has the rich, full-bodied flavor that smokers love. It's Prince Albert that combines that rich flavor with cool mildness. Prince Albert is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. So remember those initials, P.A. They stand for Prince Albert and for Pipe Appeal. Saturday night, be sure to hear Prince Albert's grand old opera with its sensational singer of American folk songs, Red Foley. Tune in to NBC Saturday night for Grand Old Opry with the Duke of Paducah, Minnie Pearl, and Red Foley. Be sure to tune in next week for another great Abbott and Costello show from Hollywood brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. And remember, try camels in your T-zone. See if they don't suit your taste, your throat, to a T. C-A-M-E-L-S America's housing shortage hits returned veterans and their families harder than anyone else. And although a record-breaking building program is underway, the need is so tremendous that it'll be some time before the shortage is eased. You can help the veteran by sharing your home if you have extra space, by giving veterans first chance at renting or buying, by listing vacancies with your local veterans housing center, and by not discriminating against veterans with children. This is Bert Parks in New York, wishing you all a pleasant good night for Camels. <laughs> as one of the crew of this faster-than-light spaceship of the future, sharing their curiosity to know the unknown, their tension, their readiness for inconceivable adventures. Sir, we're being radar scanned. United Planets Cruiser C-57D, J.J. Adams commanding. Who are you? Morbius of the Bellerophon. Well, Dr. Morbius, my orders are to survey the situation on Altair IV. Commander, if you sat down on this planet, I warn you that I cannot be answerable for the safety of your ship or your crew. When you reach the Forbidden Planet, you will meet Dr. Morbius, played by Walter Pidgeon. The doctor is sole owner of this fabulous world. Anne Francis is his alluring daughter, Alta, who has never seen a young man till she meets Commander Adams, played by talented Leslie Nielsen. Come on in. Didn't bring my bathing suit. What's a bathing suit? Oh, murder. You will meet a charming character in The Robot, able to produce, on order, ten tons of lead or a slinky evening gown. Always at your service. It must be the loveliest, softest thing you've ever made for me. And fit in all the right places, with lots and lots of star sapphires. Star sapphires take a week to crystallize properly. Would diamond or emeralds do? You explore all the wonders of a vanished civilization. You travel deep down into the heart of the forbidden planet to discover the incredible marvels of this lost genius race. These magnificent scenes in striking Eastman color stagger the imagination. 20 miles. Look down, gentlemen, are you afraid? 7,800 levels. Yet the wonders of the planet Altair IV conceal a strange and evil force, unknown, irresistible.
and Bing Crosby is up next. Here we are, Derwin. We'll be listening to you and Gary tomorrow. What are we going to do today, Bing? Well, why don't we get some music rolling here, huh? Hey, buddy. I don't want you, but I hate to lose you. You've got me in between the devil and the deep blue sea. I forgive you, cause I can't forget you. You've got me in between the devil and the deep blue sea. I'd ought to cross you off my list, but when you come knocking at my door, fate seems to give my heart a twist. I come running back for more. I should hate you, but I guess I love you. You've got me in between the devil and the deep blue sea. Becoming lovelier and lovelier each day. Oh, I sure am. And I'm also aware of the fact that I can do less and less about it. <laughs> <laughs> Be that as it may, do you know why the ladies are becoming more and more beautiful? Well, Ken, is it because uh, I, in fact, well, both you and I, uh, we've reached the age, shall we say, of uh, appreciation? Is that it? Well, that, naturally. And also the fact that they spend billions of dollars making and fixing themselves up. Ours not to reason how. No, not at all. <laughs> According go. to Look Magazine, women in the United States alone spend five billion a year in beauty salons and two billion on cosmetics. Gee, that makes seven billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And it increases each year. More and more each year, huh? Yeah. Well, it just goes to show you, Ken. It's not the cost of the original woman, it's it's the upkeep, huh? <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> But uh, you must admit it, our ladies are many splendid things. Yes, and their every whim, their every wrinkle is catered to these days. Nothing wrong with that, is there? No, not at all. Say, Rosie, you've been strangely silent, girl. What happened here? Well, I've been checking those figures over in my mind. You have? Mm -hmm. Sort of running them through the mental abacus, huh? <laughs> they meet with your approval, Rosie? Women spend $7 billion a year on beauty, you say. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, uh, completely unbiased. Neutral observer, and I'd say that this is a pretty high cost. That's what it I'd say. Sure is. And you realize, Bing, that we men pay most of this tremendous tab. Yes, but think of what it would cost if we weren't naturally so beautiful. Think of what the total would be if we weren't lovely to look at to begin with. Well, uh... Did you ever look at it that way? Well, I can see that would be a staggering figure. Oh, <laughs> more expensive than a moonshot, <laughs> wouldn't it? So you see, actually, you fellas are getting off dirt cheap. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess we are, considering. Considering what, Bing? Considering the fact that we can't do a doggone <laughs> thing about it. What else? Uh, your reasoning is irrefutable. I guess we best drop it and segue to song. It's not for me to say you love me it's not for me to say you'll always care oh but here for the moment i can hold you fast and pray 
press your lips to mine And dream that love will last As far as I can see This is heaven And speaking just for me It's ours to share Perhaps the glow of love will grow With every passing day Oh, we may never meet again But then it's not for me to say a bit more than when you married him. Be tactful. You don't tell him a fat man is far more likely to develop heart trouble. You, you don't mention that men have more heart attacks than women. And don't serve him those rich desserts made with fats and sugar. Serve luscious, low-calorie desserts made with deserted gelatin. Because dessert is made without sugar. A serving has only 12 calories, almost no calories compared with any other dessert, even fresh fruit. Deserter uh, lets you give a man the sweet desserts he loves anytime. Luscious, Double helpings of dessert at dinner, a big dish of dessert at bedtime. Here's one sweet dessert you can have all you want. Look for dessert, D-Z-E-R-T-A gelatin desserts, in the low-calorie section of your grocery store. Try dessert puddings, too, all made without sugar. Help your husband get his weight down. He'll like himself better, and so will you. Rosie, would you care to embark upon a rather large adventure with me? What venture? Well, I have here a very stylish love song to sing. Uh, I kind of like you for a partner in this enterprise. You got me. Shake on it. One time, wind blown, honeymooners at last alone, feeling far above. Oh, how lucky we are While I give to you And you give to me True love So on and on And 
to give to me love forever true love forever true You know, there are lots of annoying things you can ignore. Like my singing. Oh, don't butt in. <laughs> and after a while, you do forget them. But you can't ignore miserable cold distress. You want to relieve it fast. To do that, listen. Imagine a famous singer trying to make a hit recording when he feels miserable from cold and sinus trouble. He needs relief in a hurry. Right, Frankie Lane? Cold, sinus, and singing sure don't mix. To feel better fast, I take the newest medicine for those miseries, new, improved, four-way cold tablets. New four-way contains a decongestant to drain sinus congestion while it relieves cold distress. Clinical tests prove four-way acts faster than any other leading cold or sinus tablet. In minutes, four-way speeds pain-relieving medicine all through your body. In the same time, there was no trace with other brands. Only four-way starts so fast to relieve muscular pains, reduce fever, relieve headache without upsetting stomach. And four-way drains sinus congestion to restore free breathing. You're so right. Four-way is really great and really fast. To relieve cold miseries while you drain sinus congestion, get new four-way. Fastest acting of all the leading cold and sinus tablets. New improved formula, same familiar package, only 39 cents. You better hold my hand. Oh, out, oh, doggone. Who left that closet door open? I don't know. Oh, thank goodness. There, the lights are back on. Oh, yeah. Boy, did that ever hurt. No wonder you bumped into the door. There's no room to squeeze by. 
tell you what to do about it, Bing. About this barking shin of mine? No, about that open closet door. Replace it with an Easterner folding door. It's ideal where a regular door cramps your space. You know, I might just take that advice. Tell me more. Well, the Easterner, offered in fashionable colors, is made of flexible, full-length steel panels, laminated between two layers of washable vinyl. It's a snap to install and costs only nine ninety-five at department and drapery stores everywhere. And bing... Yes, Rosie? You won't get any of this with an Easterner folding door. It's heavy-duty track and nylon slides operate smoothly, luxuriously, quietly for years. Made by Eastern Products Corporation of Baltimore, who also make the famous Eastern Weave Lifetime Woven Aluminum Folding Door. It's excellent as a room divider, a backdrop, or other smart home decorating effects. If you want the name of your nearest dealer, just call the station. <laughs> One you without a coach It just happened to happen to me Each young girl with a grain of sense Could have tumbled down your defense It just happened to happen to me Step, I fell in with your step and stayed there just one step behind. You turned into my arms, I gave way to your charms and said to myself, the harm's done. All those girls with their hopeful eyes better look for another prize, cause it just happened to happen to me. Strive to come to the end. We've enjoyed it, and we hope you have, too. Thanks for listening, friends. Let's get together again soon, shall we? Uh, goodbye. If you're not getting your A.G.T. with your second cup of morning coffee, why, lady, you're only half-living. Costs nothing, is delightful to take, and A.G.T. really puts zing in your day. A.G.T.? Why, that's Arthur Godfrey time. Served up on the CBS radio network every morning, Monday through Friday. Fancy you're not knowing that. <laughs> I thought American women knew everything.
thing to brag about now is to gag about town. The things I do are never forgiven, just when I'm living them down. I hear music, then I'm through, cause music makes me do the things heaven can do when I hear you. A true legend of American comedy, Bob Hope, is up next. Lever Brothers, makers of new rinse with sodium, Spry, and other fine products bring you the Bob Hope Show. Yes, transcribed, it's the Bob Hope Show with Scarlett Day, Jack Kirkwood, Irene Ryan, yours truly, Hi Aberback, Les Brown, and his band of the now. And here he is, it's not an Easter bunny, but his nose twitches, Bob Hope! <laughs> How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob Globetrotter Hope saying I'm rushing east after tonight's show. Not that I'm in a rut. I may have to appear before Congress and tell them what's what. Senator McCarthy got hold of my red flannels and they didn't keep their trap shut. <laughs> yes, sir, after the program tonight, I'm flying to New York to do a television show. I'm not on till Easter Sunday, but they need a few days to attach the strings to my head. <laughs> it's an Easter TV show. It'll be shown out here a week later. That's great. I can lay them in New York and hatch them the next week in my own house. <laughs> I wasn't going to go on television until they perfected one feature, and they finally did. It's called Money. After all... <laughs> After all these years of turning down offers, I finally said yes. I feel just like Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm lovely. I'm engaged. I'm nervous. <laughs> but I was really thrilled when the Frigidaire people insisted on me for their Easter television show. Then this morning, I saw their ad in the paper. Folks, tune in on Bob Hope this Easter and have an egg roll in your own home. <laughs> television before. My nose is still tender from the last time I was on. Everyone kept twisting the wrong knob. <laughs> I'm a television fan. I love those old movies on television because they're so mysterious. Before you can figure out which are the bad men, you have to figure out which are the men. <laughs> but I've been walking around town memorizing my lines for this television show, and I must have been memorizing out loud. When I left the Brown Derby today, the waiter said, Who cares if you love me passionately? What about a tip? <laughs> and for my TV show, I wanted to get it that, uh, I sure did. Yes, I did. <laughs> and, and for my TV show, I wanted to get a tan, so I spent the week at Palm Springs. Palm Springs, that's Cyril's with cactus. <laughs> You know, for television, you have to be at least mahogany or you look like you just climbed over the wall. <laughs> I love Palm Springs with the desert, the sunshine, the beautiful girls relaxing by the swimming pool. They have to relax. In those bathing suits, they break the law if they move. <laughs> and while I was there this past week, I decided to go western, so I stopped at the Dude Ranch. That's a motel for blisters. And everybody... <laughs> And everybody dresses Western. I saw one guy in a 10-gallon hat, another fellow in a 3-gallon hat, and Phil Harris came by wearing a fifth. <laughs> I'll never forget the roping contest. I jumped off my horse, grabbed the bull by the horns, and he looked up at my face and said, Traitor. <laughs> and they had wonderful entertainment at the Rodale. The sons of the pioneer were there, Lindsay, Philip, Dennis, and Gary. And, uh... down there, and instead of putting on suntan lotion, I made a mistake and poured spry all over my body. You're now looking at the only actor in Hollywood with a flaky crust. <laughs> you know, it's so healthy down in Palm Springs all winter, they've only sold one bottle of antihistamine pills. And Sinatra's using those for golf balls. 
never forget the first time Sinatra came to Palm Springs. Two vultures circled over him, and one of them said to the other, if we knew he was coming, I'd have baked a cake. an amazing fact, but it's true. Rinso, the only soap that contains sodium, gets white clothes whiter than new and washable colors brighter than new. Yes, Rinso gets clothes Rinso new. Wonderful Rinso puts sunshine in your wash, even on rainy days, even if you dry your clothes indoors. No other soap in the world can make your wash so white or color so bright because no other soap contains the scientific sunlight ingredient, sodium. Use Rinso for your heaviest wash. And you'll see for yourself that Rinso gets out more dirt than any other type of wash day product. And yet, Rinso is so safe for your clothes and so kind to your hands. Get the economical giant size Rinso with a red sodium label. On wash day, use Rinso and see your wash turn out whiter, brighter than you. Rinso, 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 you. Ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard, Bob Hope leaves after the show tonight for New York City, where he will appear on his first television show on Easter Day. We now find Bob at his house, where Doris Day is helping him pack. Bob. Bob, as I was saying, what I don't understand is why you were chosen for this Easter television show. Why, what do you mean, well, why didn't they pick somebody like Fred Allen or Jack Benny? Oh, it's not so hard to figure. <laughs> oh, Doris, can't you understand why the Frigidaire Company wanted me instead of those guys? Because you're built more like an icebox? <laughs> Don't tell me my vegetable compartment is showing. <laughs> Don't bother your pretty little head about what I want to do in the television show. You're supposed to be helping me pack. Just hand me the stuff and I'll put it in the suitcase. Oh, okay. Cufflinks. Cufflinks. Shirt. Shirt. Necktie. Necktie. Butterfly net. <laughs> My lace nightgown. <laughs> well, what's that hanging around the neck of it? A bow and arrow. I walk in my sleep and I might run into the wild goose. <laughs> Handkerchief. Handkerchief. Necktie. Necktie. You know, Doris, I'm a little worried about my first television show. Why? Well, some people just don't fit the medium. You heard about Sidney Greenstreet on television, didn't you? Sidney Greenstreet? Yeah, by the time they got back far enough to get him in focus, the cameraman was treading water off for a Dondo beef. That needs some more stuff, Doris. All right. Cold cream. Cold cream. Hey, that reminds me. I wonder if I'll have a makeup problem for television. I'd like to look great for the cameras. In fact, I want to come out looking like about a 25-year-old boy. Chemtone? <laughs> Never mind. Here I am worried about my video debut, and you're no help at all. Well, now, what is there to worry about, Plenty. They tell me those cameras will exaggerate my most prominent feature. Aren't they a little late for that? <laughs> Serious. Those cameras do actually enlarge your features, Doris. I saw Cary Grant on television, and with that hole in his chin, he looks like his nose is peeking down an elevator shaft. <laughs> and you should see how Crosby's head and ears come out. How? A bowling ball going to lunch with two flying saucers. <laughs> Wait, let's have some more of my clothes, Doris. Okay. Sweater. Sweater. Bed slippers. Bed slippers. Hey, Doris, you want to hear the opening joke I'm using on the Easter Frigid Air program? Not especially. Well, just, uh, the announcer comes out and he says to me, Say, Bob, do you know a girl by the name of Lorna Doone? And I say, No, I don't know about Lorna Doone, but I go with a sister, nothing doing. <laughs> What do you think of it? Airwick. <laughs> 
I don't care what you think, Doris. You just tune into that television show and believe me. Come in. Hello, Doris. Hello, Mr. Ho. Oh, I'm so glad I got here before you finished packing. I brought you some food to put in your suitcase. Oh, thanks, Miss Ryan, but I really won't need any. Oh, yes, you will. I always take some along. Food? Oh, yes. I know I'm going to get hungry in my berth at night, so I always tuck a couple of hard-boiled eggs in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble was, the last time I did it, they weren't hard-boiled. <laughs> you mean? Yes. All the way to Chicago, I had to sleep sunny side up. <laughs> uh, why did they pick you for that Easter television show? Oh, I'm getting tired of that question, Miss Ryan, but it was partly because of my youthful appearance. You realize I'm one of the few comedians with no gray in his hair. Yes, why is that? Esquire shoe polish? <laughs> You've helped me too much already, so if you don't mind... I tried to get into television. Did I tell you about it? NBC were using me as a test for colored television. Oh, color? Oh, yes, but it wasn't very satisfactory. For some reason or other, my complexion doesn't come out tan or pink or flesh-colored. Well, how does yours come out? Stucco. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that, but my hair comes out a tile red. Well, what about... Well, with a stucco complexion, tile red hair, and wrinkles like Venetian blinds, I look like something the FHA said no to. And the foundation's a little wobbly, too, but it was nice for you to combine this one. Well, it was no trouble, and I'll be anxious to see, to see your uh, fidget air show on Easter Sunday. <laughs> Glad you got it in there. Thank you very much. Anyway, I think you'll enjoy it, Miss Ryan. We'll have Dinah Shore, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., that wonderful English comedian, Beatrice Lee, and naturally everybody will be seeing me for the first time. Airwick. Wait a minute. Pack that Airwick once. Well, I'll be looking forward to your Easter show, Mr. Hope. But it won't be a novelty for my Uncle Julius. Why not? Well, it, it's quite a story. <laughs> you see, Uncle Julius is very nearsighted, and he's crazy about Arthur Godfrey. Uh-huh. The trouble is, we can't get Arthur Godfrey on our television set. Well, what do you do? We just put a picture of you in there and tell Uncle Julius that Godfrey's been sick. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Yes. And it worked out just fine until last week when we got your picture in upside down. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Uncle Julius just sat there and said, Gee, I didn't know those two debakers had their noses so close to the ground. <laughs> Well, I'd better say goodbye to you two doors, so I'll be late at the airport. Goodbye, Bob, and good luck on the show. Thank you, Anna. Well, here's a cab. I'll get right in. Oh, take me out to the airport, driver. Okay, Max. Sit back in the seat. <laughs> What's an old lady like you doing, driving a cab? Oh, I just do this as a sideline. It's not my regular job. Oh, really? What is your regular job? I'm the Kevin Newby shoeshine boy. <laughs> oh, stop. I'm a great big bundle of Yeah, I know. Okay, okay. <laughs> no hot licks. Just keep your hands on the wheel, please. <laughs> Come on, will you drive me to the airport, please? just can't get over a woman your age driving a cab. Oh, I'd do anything for a buck. I've been driving a cab. <laughs> <laughs> I've been driving a cab for three years, and do you know what? What? Tomorrow, I get my driver's license. <laughs> You mean you've been driving without a license? Doesn't everybody in California? <laughs> you got nothing but pedestrians there. <laughs> you got a point. <laughs> uh, what are you going to the airport for, Sonny? Well, I'm going to New York to do a television show for Frigidaire. I'm Bob Hope. Bob Hope? Uh -huh. Why, I saw you in the first movie you ever made. Oh, you were wonderful. Well, thank you. We don't make pictures like the great train robbery anymore. <laughs> well, 
say you're a real cutie pie. Oh, now, you cut that out. You're old enough to be my father. <laughs> Can't you go a little faster, please? Stopping at this gas station. I gotta fill her up. Uh, what do you have, ma'am? Ten gallons, please. A regular or Ethel? Neither. Lydia Pinkham. <laughs> This could be Al Jolson and Flax. I'll do anything for a buck. <laughs> well, here you are, Sonny. That'll be a dollar eighty. Okay, can you break a five? Sure, I've got the change right here in my stocking. In your stocking? Yes, it's my mad money. <laughs> you have mad money? Yes, every time I look at my legs, I get mad. <laughs> Goodbye. United Airlines, flight number 42 for Chicago and New York, now loading passengers at gate number 7. Gee, it's good to be flying again. Hey, I know almost everybody in United Airlines. I think I'll go up front and say hello to the pilot. Well, hello there, Captain. Mind if I... Don't tell me you're the pilot. Sure, i do anything for a pilot. Brothers singing sisters, our young Chanteuse with a beautiful face and voice to match, Miss Doris Day, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, one of the best-known children's stories is Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer, a story that will live forever. Tonight, as a special pre-Easter treat for the kiddies, we present a story that is not long for this world. Bob Hope's Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer, you get out of bed this minute. Okay, Aunt Polly. Tom, you're certainly a trial. Look at your hair. I'm going to have to give you a haircut right now. Oh, please, Aunt Polly. I don't want a haircut. Don't put a soup... Don't flatter yourself. Where's the egg cut? <laughs> Tom, you've been promised the 
asking me that you'd whitewash the back fence. Now, you just get a bucket of whitewash and do it right now. Oh. Go on now. Now i got to paint that old fence. I never have any fun. Someday Aunt Polly will be sorry. I'll throw myself in the river and drown myself. When they bring me home, my poor little body will be all full of water. And when Aunt Polly starts to cry and puts her arms around me, I'll squirt all that water in her face. <laughs> I'm not going to paint the fence. There's a new girl just moved in down the street. I think I'll go look her over. Hello. Hello. So you're a little girl, aren't you? Yes. You're a little boy, aren't you? How long have you been a little girl? Oh, all my life. How long have you been a little boy? Ever since I found out there were little girls. <laughs> What's your name? Becky. What's yours? Tom Sawyer. Well, what are you doing around here, Tom? I'm playing hooky. Oh, I'm glad. I thought it was your real name. <laughs> You came over to my yard, Tom. Let's play house. You be the husband and I'll be the wife. Well, we just met. Why should we start fighting? <laughs> hey, Becky, how about if I kiss you, huh? <gasps> Gee, Tom, you're awful bold. Yep, I don't even know about the birds and the bees. I even know about them. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. I know all about him, yes, sir. But there's one thing I don't understand. What's that? Well, I get the part about the bees, but how do you kiss a girl with a worm in your mouth? <laughs> Ready or not, Becky, I'm going to kiss you. Oh, gee, Tom, where'd you learn to kiss like that? I used to be a tester in a bubblegum factory. <laughs> Tom, Tom Sawyer! That's my aunt calling. Tom, where are you? I'm painting the fence. I'm painting the fence. Quick, Becky, goodbye kiss. Tom, put some thinner in the whitewash. It sounds sticky. <laughs> Gee whiz, this is an awful big fence to paint. Someday I'll get even with Aunt Polly. I'll get even with the whole world. Hiya, Tom. Oh, hiya, Huckleberry. Hey, Want to go fishing, Tom? Fishing? I can go fishing any day. But how often do you get a chance to whitewash your fence? You want to get in on it, Huck? Nope. Takes a lot of skill to paint a fence. I wouldn't let just anybody try it, but we're buddies. I'll give you a chance. Nope. Why not? I read the book. <laughs> hey, Tom, you hear about the big fire at the school? What happened? Nothing yet. I just got the matches. <laughs> I hear about you being in a fight with Piggy Davis yesterday. I hear he beat you up. Piggy Davis, that sissy, he couldn't hurt a flea. Well, you sure look banged up. Yeah, but he didn't hurt my fleas none. <laughs> and besides, he didn't fight fair. He hit me when I was down. Really? Yeah, I should have stayed up in that tree. <laughs> Come on, Huck, grab a brush. Oh, I ain't got no time to paint the fence now. I'm running away from home. You want to leave home with me, Tom? Boy, that would fix Aunt Polly. Where we go? Let's run away to California. No, we're not that desperate. I know where we're going. <laughs> Just take our raft and float down the river. Okay, Tom. I'll meet you at the cove at mid Okay, case. Gee, I wish Huck would get here. The river is so spooky at night, I'll sit here on the raft and wait for him. What do you want, boy? <laughs> hey, who are you? Well, everybody calls me Three Finger Joe. Why do they call you Three Finger Joe? Because I got red hair. You're not related to a cab driver, are you? <laughs> no, I guess not. Hey, look, this raft doesn't belong to you. You must have stolen it from Huck Finn. Yeah, I did, boy, and I'll hate myself for it in the morning. <laughs> hey, boy, can I take $5 from you till next Wednesday? What do you need this money for? It's for a good cause, son. It's a big firm that I'm connected with that has to keep going day and night. What's that? My stomach. <laughs> Why should I lend you any money? I didn't even know who you are. Who, me? I'm a transient troubadour. A traveler along the shores of the sea of life. What does that mean? I'm a bum. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and you know why I'm a bum? No. It's on account of my ex-wife. What a brute. <laughs> I cursed the day I met her. You do? Yep. I'll never forget it. I was in a hog calling contest, and when I got through yelling, there she was. <laughs> She was so homely, she even confused animals. <laughs> Every time I'd come home from work, my hound dog would have her up a tree. <laughs> well, she was still your wife. How come you're not with her anymore? Oh, I don't know. Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> and now I'm just a hobo heading down the river. That's where I'm going. I'm running away from home, Joe. Well, why is that, boy? Because my Aunt Polly always makes me paint the fence. She's real mean. That's because she's got a lot of money and nobody loves her. A lot of money, huh? <clears throat> Come here, boy. I want to talk to you. Tom! Tom Sawyer, you get out there and paint that fence right now. Oh, gee. Now, listen to your Aunt Polly, boy. All right, Uncle Joe. <laughs> Opportunity along with NBC to wish you a happy Easter time in all sincerity and thank you so much and thanks for the memory of happy tots of play who run and laugh all day because Easter seals have helped to heal the crippled kids who say. We thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you live on the New York end of the coaxial cable and have neighbors who own a TV set. Invite yourself over next Sunday evening at 5.30 and demand free popcorn in the ringside seat at our 90-minute Easter parade on NBC TV. Only wish we had time to mention all the talent we'll have with us. Features will live Dinah Shore, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Hal Leroy, Hopalong Hope, and a dozen more great acts to give you an hour and a half full of comedy, music, and action. And brother, I mean action. We're going to start in vertical and wind up horizontal. <laughs> but don't forget, Sunday night, 5.30 to 7, Eastern Standard Time on NBC TV for the biggest thing since Out of Duty. And folks, between now and next Sunday, let's finish America's biggest job, the Red Cross Drive. And while the pocketbook is open, let's dig out a five or a ten spot for those wonderful Easter seals. Thanks a lot, and we'll be TV and you all Sunday. Good night. <laughs> Fibber McGee and Molly, next on NBC. Roberto! 
True crime stories of the LAPD are up next with Jack Webb's Dragnet. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. For the past six months, the managers of large markets in your city have been the victims of a holdup man. You thought you had the suspect in custody. You were wrong. Your job, get him. There's only one premium quality cigarette in America available in both regular and king size, and that is Chesterfield. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. That's certainly important to every king-size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference, except that king-size Chesterfield is larger. Contains so much more of these premium quality tobaccos that you get more than a fifth longer smoke from king-size Chesterfield. Yes, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality, both regular and king-size. And either way you like them, Chesterfields are much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, March 22nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.36 a.m. when we got to 4623 Linwood. Bakery shop. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Police officers, ma'am. Oh, yes. You want to see Mr. Jenkins. He's in the back. Uh, right through that door. Thank you, ma'am. How is Mr. Jenkins? Well, he's all right. Got a bad cut on his head. The ambulance was here. Uh-huh. Do you know if there are any witnesses? I don't know. The other officers are checking it now, I guess. Mm -hmm. About how long have they been here? I'd say ten minutes. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Who is it? Police officer, sir. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Oh, what happened to the other officer? Well, he left, Mr. Jenkins. A couple of questions we'd like to ask you about this. Yeah, sure, pull up that chair there. Thanks very much. Thank you. You feel all right, sir? Yeah, I had aches a little, but I feel okay. Guy from the ambulance said I should see my own doctor. I don't know when I'm going to get time to do that. It's nothing serious, a little cut. Yes, sir. Would you tell us just what happened here? Sure, there's not much to it. Where do you want me to start? Well, what time did the man come in? Oh, I see. It must have been about 6.30 this morning. I was just frying the donuts... I heard this knock on the back door and I let him in. What did he look like, sir? Well, just like the descriptions in the paper. That's how I knew it was the black masked bandit. He had the overcoat on, the hat, and the mask on his face. Was he carrying a gun? Yeah, it looked like a 38 revolver, a long barrel. Mm -hmm. What happened then? Well, at first I couldn't figure it. You know, I'd read in the paper where he was robbing markets. I couldn't figure what he was doing in a bakery. He was alone then, huh? Yeah, at least I couldn't see anybody with him. All right, go ahead, sir. Well, he came in and sat down, told me to go ahead with what I was doing. Sit right over there in that chair. Lean back against the wall and just talked. What did he talk about, do you remember? Just not, nothing special. 
Then he asked me to hand him one of the donuts I'd finished. Said he wanted one of the chocolate ones. I gave it to him. He just leaned back and ate it. I see. I asked him what he wanted. Uh, why the gun, you know? Yes. He said he didn't want me to get any bright ideas. And he asked me how much money I had. Yeah. I told him I only had about 150 bucks, and he said that wasn't much. I said it wasn't, but it's all I had. And I asked him if he was going to rob me. What did he say to that? He said he probably would. Mm-hmm. All this time, did he keep the mask on? Yeah, he never took it off. How long was he here? Well, he got here, like I said, at 6.30. He left about 8.15, just before Vera came in. She's the one who found me. Vera? Yeah, she's the girl who takes care of the store. You probably saw her out front when you came in. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, I finished up with the donuts, and then I asked him if he'd like a drink. I said I had some brandy locked up. I asked him if he'd like a shot. Mm -hmm. He said he would. I went over to get it. I I keep it over there in that cupboard. And when I walked over, I had to walk right in front of him. Yeah. Well, you probably know it gets pretty hot in a bakery, the ovens and all. I guess he was kind of relaxed. Yeah. Well, when I walked by him, I grabbed his gun, took it right out of his hands, and he jumped up and told me to hand it over to him, said for me to give it back and I wouldn't get hurt. And I told him he had the shoe on the wrong foot that I was calling things now. Yes, sir. What'd he do then? Well, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, if it hadn't happened to me, I'd never believe it. What's that? When I took the gun away from him, he looked real surprised. That's when I told him that I was the boss, and he just stood up and started to walk toward me. I told him to stop. I pointed the gun at him, told him to stay where he was. Yeah. But he didn't stop. He kept coming right at me. I told him again, but he kept right on walking. And then I fired at him. Well, it wasn't any farther away from him than 10, maybe 15 feet. Didn't hit him, so I pulled the trigger again. Shot right at him six times. Right at him. He just kept walking at me. Now, at first, I thought the shells in the gun were blanks. And then I could see where the bullets were hidden. Well, there, you can see a couple of them in the wall. I couldn't believe my eyes. I missed him every time. What did he do right after you shot at him? When I fired the last shot, the gun clicked a couple of times. He just stopped and laughed. He said that I'd run out of bullets and that I'd better give the gun to him. Did you? Yeah, I threw it at him as hard as I could. I missed him then, too. The gun hit the floor and I could see the sparks fly, and then he picked it up and came after me. I didn't think I'd be in much trouble. He looked so little. But when he grabbed at me, I knew I'd had it. That man had hands like a vice. Mm-hmm. He grabbed my arm and hit me on the head right, right here. He knocked me out. He came to and Vera came in. The guy was gone, so was a mine. Well, where'd you keep this money? In my pocket. I had it in my wallet. I don't, I don't usually put it in the cash register until Vera gets in. I see. Now, you said that when the gun hit the floor, you saw the sparks fly from it. Is that right? Yeah. You know, uh, like when you hit a piece of flint with another rock, like the Boy Scout. Yeah. You know, like that. Did you notice that the gun seemed damaged in any way? No, I didn't have time to notice anything right after that he hit me. Uh-huh. I wonder if you'd give us a description of the man. Well, sure. Like I told the other officers, he was a little man, real old. How old would you say? Oh, maybe 50 or so, not any younger. You're pretty sure about that, are you? Yeah. About how tall? Maybe 5'2". Not any more than that. Kind of hard to tell with that big coat on. It looked like it was five or six sizes too big. It looked kind of funny at first. Then you realized who he was, and it wasn't funny anymore. Mm-hmm. I wasn't too scared of him when I first saw him, even when he came at me. But when he grabbed my arm, I knew I had trouble. Yes, sir. I still can't understand it. Six shots, and I didn't hit him once. I tell you, the guy's not human. Well, he's scoring pretty good for a ghost. <laughs> a.m. The crew from the crime lab came out and went over the bakery. Ray Pinker removed the slugs from the wall on the floor and took them back to the lab. The bandit, as usual, had worn gloves, so there was no possibility for fingerprints. A search of the neighborhood failed to turn up any new leads. None of the people in the immediate area had seen anyone answering the description of the black mask bandit. Additional supplementary bulletins were gotten out, and all of the cars in the surrounding vicinity were alerted. The stats office had made run after run on the M.O. of the bandit. The leads they gave us were all checked out. All gunsmiths were alerted in the event that the suspect's weapon had been damaged and that he might try to have it repaired. All leads were checked and rechecked. They netted us nothing. Informants were questioned and re-questioned. The plan that had been worked out for checking with the managers of the supermarkets in the city was continued. Three weeks passed. The bandit hit again. This time, a market just outside of Eagle Rock. The M.O. was the same as had been used in the previous robberies. However, in this one instance, the market didn't have a storage refrigerator, so the thief locked the manager in a back room. In locking the door, the suspect had taken off his gloves, and Leighton Prince was able to lift a partial print from the doorknob. It wasn't enough for classification, but Bergman said that if we apprehended the man, he'd be able to identify him for us. June came and went. July, August. The bandit had been operating without interference for almost a year. He'd widened his theater of operations. Reports had come in from San Francisco to Stockton, from San Diego to Pomona. In each case, the suspect seemed to know what markets were being staked out, and he stayed away from them. The legwork continued without result. Tuesday, August 19th. Frank and I checked back into the office. Man, I never see it to fail. Every time we have lunch at Sal's, I eat too much. Yeah, he puts out a good lunch, then. Too good. Want to check the book? Right. 
Anything? I'm on a call from Jerry. Informant? Yeah. Says he can't get with me tonight. He'll call in the morning. Friday? Smith? Yeah, Skipper. Yeah. Come on in here, will you? Right away. Sit down. All right. Well, what is it? You guys been on this black mask thing how long now? Well, it's going on a year, isn't it? You're no closer to him than you were when you started. Not much. You know you're tying up half the minute Metro. You got this town covered like a blanket, and you still can't turn the guy. We're doing everything we can, Skipper. I've been telling you for the last six months that I wasn't going to buy that anymore. I mean it this time. Now, just exactly what have you got on the guy? Well, I think you know it just as well as we do, Skipper. Description, M.O., even the partial print Bergman lifted from that place out in Eagle Rock. We've been over it a hundred times. There's no lead that we haven't run out and then checked over again. Nothing new on the information from Folsom? No, nothing. We've had 5,000 circulars printed. They're scattered all over the country. Doesn't look like the guy's ever done time before. The way he works, you'd think he knew exactly what we were doing. We cover the markets, he hits the bakeries. We cover the bakeries in L.A., he hits in San Diego. They cover the stores, then he hits up north. Where we are, he ain't. How about the car, the Ford? No, nothing. We got no license. You ever hear anything on the damaged gun? No, he never tried to have it fixed that we can find out about. He's gotten a hold of another gun someplace. Latest reports say he's using a revolver with a two-inch barrel. Well, where do you stand now? I don't know. We got every store from La Siena to Alameda covered, from Hollywood Boulevard south to Jefferson. Big area. Yeah, it's a lot of stores, too. There's a cruiser car or a cop in or near every large store and bakery in that area. Every police unit in the city is looking for the guy. If he hits again, we should get him. Hey, Friday? Yeah, Murph. The call just came in from Wilshire. Figure you want it. Here you go. Thanks. What is it? Yeah, we got the whole town waiting for him with open arms. Everything's set and he pulls a switch. What is it, Friday? The black mask bandit. He's going in for kidnapping now. local broadcast stated that the manager of one of the big supermarket chains in the city had been taken from his home about 2.30 in the morning. The bandit forced him to drive to the store and open the safe. The thief then bound the manager and left the premises. The manager gave us a complete description of the bandit and locals and APBs were gotten out on him. In this instance, the thief didn't use his own car. He forced the manager to drive his car to the market. The manager told us that when they'd left the house, he hadn't seen any other cars on the streets. Tuesday, August 19th, 5.20 p.m., Frank and I got in touch with Lieutenant Dick Tiernan of the Sheriff's Robbery Squad. Together with him, we worked out a plan to try to keep the homes of the managers under surveillance. In addition to this, men from the Sheriff's Department aided in canvassing the houses of the owners and managers. Each car was assigned three houses, while other cars covered three markets each. A month passed. The Black Mask Bandit hit five times, each time in areas which were not under direct surveillance. Friday, September 26, 5.20 a.m., we got a call at home that there had been another kidnapping, this time an elderly market manager and his wife. Frank and I drove out to see them. The radio unit had returned them to their home. Yes? Mr. Gunther? That's right. Police officers, Mr. Gunther. Oh, yes. Come in. You have some sort of identification? Yes, sir. Here's my ID card. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? Mr. Gunther. Come into the living room, won't you? Thank you very much, sir. Sit down. Hope you didn't mind my asking about your identification. Just that the way things have been happening, you can't be too sure. Yes, sir, we understand. Now, I wonder if you'd mind telling us what happened. Sure. Awful thing. Awful. Just can't believe that a man his age would do a thing like this. Seems that he'd know not to be so cruel. Yes, sir. Just what did happen? Well, last night, must have been about 2 or 2.30, I woke up with this flashlight shining in my eyes. Mm -hmm. First, I didn't know what it was. Just this uh, real bright light, you know. Yes, sir. Well, right away, of course, I knew there was somebody else in the room. About that time, Agnes woke up. Agnes is my wife. Yes, sir. Anyway, she woke up, wanted to know what was going on. I told her I didn't know. All this time, that light didn't move. Just stayed in one place and shone right in my eyes. Yes, sir. Then we heard this voice tell us to get out of bed. Said he wanted me to go with him. I told him to get out of the house, that I didn't want any trouble. If he wanted money, he'd find all we had in the house right on the dresser with my wallet. Mm-hmm. Could you see who the person was, sir? No, not then. Uh, the, the light and all. But I got out of bed, and then I could see a little old man with a black mask over his eyes. How could you tell his age, sir? Well, just could, that's all. Little beady eyes, and his mouth mean. Never saw a mouth like that on a young man. His voice was old, I could tell. Yes, sir. Well, he told me to get dressed, said that I should hurry up about it. Was he armed? Could you tell that? Yes, I could see it. He was holding a gun. All this time, Agnes was yelling at him to get out of the house. Uh, she's not well, you know. Yes, sir. Agnes, she has a bad heart. Uh -huh. Been to the doctor for years, takes pills and medicine. That's the big reason that I did what he said. I didn't want there to be any trouble to get Agnes excited. I understand. Well, finally I told him if he'd get out of the room and leave her alone, I'd do what he wanted. Not to give him any cause to hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. Then he did about the meanest thing he could have done. Told Agnes to get out of bed. Said for her to get up and get dressed and go with us. 
just can't understand why he'd want to do a thing like that. Just plain meanness. Yes, sir. Did your wife do what he said? Well, at first she said she wouldn't do it. Really told him off. I thought he'd maybe get mad and hit her. He is mean enough to do it. Mm-hmm. And finally, I asked her to do what he wanted. Figured that'd be the easiest way of getting him out of the place. I thought that maybe I could talk him out of taking her with us, but I couldn't. He made you leave the house then? Yeah. Told me to get the car out of the garage, and then he and Agnes get in the back seat. Made me drive down to the store. Did you notice any other cars in the area? Any cars parked near your house that weren't usually there? No. On the way to the store, though, I saw a police car. I thought about trying to attract their attention. He must have thought about it, too, though. Why did he say that? Well, he told me that if I did anything to call attention to us, he'd kill Agnes. I think he would have, too. I didn't do anything to get him upset. Yes, sir. Well, we got to the market, and he made me open the safe, and then he took the money and tied us up. I begged him not to tie Agnes. I've never done that before, Sergeant. I'm 52, and I've never begged a man for anything, but I did this time. Begged him not to kill Agnes. I knew that if he tied her up like he said he was going to, it would kill her. Pleaded with him, but it didn't do any good. Tied her up and put that tape over her mouth. One thing I can say for him, though, just one. He called the police and told them where we were. If he hadn't done that, I think we'd have both died. Agnes almost suffocated. Where's your wife now, Mr. Gunther? In the other room. Doctor's with her. He gave her a sedative. Awful thing, Sergeant. I just don't know how anyone could be that mean. No, just one reason we can think of. What's that? He's had a lot of practice. 11.30 a.m. We talked to Mrs. Gunther. She told us pretty much the same story that we'd gotten from her husband. The police car in the area was contacted, but they reported that they hadn't noticed the Gunther car. The unit that was patrolling the area around the store was contacted. They reported that they had checked the store at 3.15 a.m. At that time, there were no lights and no suspicious cars in the vicinity. The black mask bandit had been working for over a year. In that time, he'd robbed 59 stores that we knew of. His theater of operations had taken him from northern California right down to the Mexican border, from the desert to the beach. He'd stolen approximately a half a million dollars. The entire nation had received communications carrying the description of the suspect. The entire facilities of the police and sheriff's departments in Los Angeles were devoted to apprehending him. Thousands of man hours had gone into stakeouts and searches. None of them produced any results. As the case grew in importance, robbery detail began to get an average of 30 calls a day from well-meaning citizens with information. Every lead, no matter how remote, had to be checked out. This meant more hours of legwork and interrogation. Every officer in the Southland was looking for the bandit. Every car and motorcycle on the streets had his description. None of it did any good. Thursday, October 2nd, 11.05 p.m. Frank and I checked back into the office. Well, there's another one that didn't go any point. Yeah. You want to fill out the reports, I'll check the book. Yeah. Never fails, does it, Joe? What's that? Oh, something like this one comes along. Some people use it to get back at their neighbors. Take that deal tonight. Pretty silly, huh? I'd like to know who gave us that tip. There's something kind of sneaky about anonymous phone calls. Well, we'd miss a lot of breaks if we didn't get them. Yeah. You figure we're ever going to nail this guy? Who knows? I'm getting a little punchy. Every time we miss him, we get another pasting. Have you read the papers lately? Well, you got to expect that, Frank. They're probably calling it the way it looks to them. There's yeah. only one way to answer them. That's to nail the guy. I'll get it. Robbery Friday. Yeah, that's... Well, what's that? Can you speak a little louder? I can't... That's better. What? Uh-huh. When did this happen? Yeah. What's the address out there? Yeah, the street. Now, give me the number. That's right. All right, you bet. We'll take care of it. Right. Bye. Looks like something here. Market manager's son. Yeah. Says someone's just kidnapped his father. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality in both regular and king size. And we're the only one that does it. We tell you what Chesterfields are made of to give you that premium quality in both popular sizes. Our scientists select the best materials. They select for Chesterfield the world's best tobaccos, blend them just right, and they keep Chesterfields tasty and fresh with the best of moistening agents. Now here's something else that's completely modern about Chesterfield. People smoke Chesterfield and we tell you what happens, scientifically but simply. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over ten years. After eight months, the medical specialist reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. <laughs> 
I'd say that means real mildness. And finally, we ask you to try Chesterfield and prove what we say. Chesterfield is best for you. They're much milder to give you all the pleasure that the modern cigarette can give. Eleven twenty-three p.m. Frank and I checked the manager's name on the list. We got the address, and seven minutes later, we pulled up in front of the store. In the rear of the store, we could see two men. One was dressed in a bathrobe, the other in a large overcoat with a brown hat pulled down over his eyes. Parked in front of the store was a dark blue 1951 Lincoln. We checked the car and found that it bore the registration of Donald Anderson, the manager. Frank went around to the rear door of the market, and I covered the front entrance. We waited. At 11.42 p.m., the bandits started for the front door. All right, mister, police officer, hold it up there. Come on, drop the gun, give it up. Listen, cop, get out of here! Frank, cover the other side of the building. He's going for that fence, Joe. All right, come on, mister, give it up. You all right, Joe? Yeah, come on, let's get over this fence. All right. He's not over here. No, we missed him. He must have got over that wall. I'll get back to the car and notify the radio units. All right. You think you hit him? I don't know. I might have. Well, let's check the ground by the fence. You got your flashlight? Yeah, here it is. Hold it, Joe. Yeah. Here. See? By the fence. Oh, yeah. Blood stains. Quite a few of them. I'll stay here and check. Okay. I'll be right back. Watch yourself. Yeah. Unit 1K80 to control one. Unit 1K80 to control one. Control one to 1K80, go While attempting to arrest market bandit during commission of robbery, he exchanged fire with suspect. Suspect is known to be wounded. Suspect armed, use caution. Suspect seen fleeing on foot. All cars in area converge on corner Figueroa and Woodlawn. Suspect described as WMA, 50 to 55 years, 130 to 140 pounds. Block off area at Vernon to Slauson. At Vernon to Slauson. And from Figueroa to Maine. Suspect last seen going through houses at 49th and Figueroa. That's 49 and Figueroa. Roger, 1K80. Attention, all units. Attention, all units. All units in the vicinity of 49th and Figueroa. Robbery suspect wounded while attempting robbery at market. Suspect described as a WMA, 50 to 55 years, 130 to 140 pounds. Lock off area at Vernon to Slauson. Vernon to Slauson. And from Figueroa to Main Street. Suspect last seen going through houses at 49th and Figueroa. Unit 1K80 to Control 1. Unit 1K80 to Control 1. Control 1 to Unit 1K80. Go ahead. Suspect is known to be armed. Approach with caution. Use caution. Unit 1K80 to Control 1. KMA 367. All units. Robbery suspect at 49th and Figueroa. Known to be armed. Approach with caution. Repeat. Approach with caution. What do you figure, Frank? Well, he's in here someplace. Let's find him. In the next three hours, 37 police cars combed the area. Every possible hiding place was investigated. A house-to-house search was started. Citizens were asked to lock their doors and to open their homes to no one. In one of the yards, we found the hat and coat worn by the suspect, but apparently he'd made good his escape. Broadcasts were gotten out to the entire city, putting them on the alert. Additional officers were sent to the blockaded area to help with the search. Captain Didion came out from the office to direct the operations. 3.30 a.m., the area had been checked and rechecked. No sign of the suspect. Frank and I went back to our car. I don't know, Joe. The guy's got us jinxed. Seems like everything we do, he's got us beat. It doesn't make much sense, does it? We gotta turn him sometime. Yeah, we've been saying that for a year. Didion was sure in a rare mood tonight. Well, he's got trouble with his stomach again. I'm gonna have trouble with mine if this keeps up much longer. Joe, car. Yeah, take the other side of it. All right. All right, come on out of the car, mister. Come on, we know you're there. Get out. Get out of here, cop! Come on, throw that gun out here. You can't go anywhere. Give it up before you get killed. I ain't coming out. Don't you try coming after me. You haven't got a chance. I dropped that gun. All right. All right, I quit. Got no more shells. I can't fight anymore. I quit. I quit. Please don't shoot anymore. All right, throw that gun out here. Come on. All right, now get out of the car. Keep those hands up. Put them behind your head. Now, right, come on over here. Turn around. Put your hands against the car. Straight out in front of you. I'll shake you. Hey, 
You're going to call the ambulance for me? I'm hurt. Hey, can't you see I'm hurt? Ain't you going to do anything for me? It's clean, Joe. Right here. Here. Got your hands behind you. I'm going to put in a call for the ambulance. Right. You didn't have to shoot. I would have stopped if I'd known you was cops. You got trouble with your ears? No. We told you we were officers. You built this thing. We just went along with you. A lousy deal anyway. I should have stopped. I should have quit when I was ahead. If I'd have stopped, you guys would have never caught me. Never. They're on the way, Joe. Good. What's your name, mister? Jerry. Jerry Rogers. How old are you? 35. All this time, we're looking for an old man. How do you figure it, Joe? I don't know. The gray hair, big overcoat, and that mask. Witnesses didn't get too good a look at him. Yeah. You ever been arrested, Rogers? Yeah, once. Is that ambulance ever going to get here? It's coming. What'd you fall for? Huh? What were you arrested for? Drunk driving. Oh, I should have quit. I should have laid off. Yeah, it's too bad you didn't figure it that way a little sooner. Look, I don't want any morals. When's that ambulance going to get here? Don't worry about it, Rogers. Huh? You've got a lot of time. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 4th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Let me tell you again why Chesterfield is best for me and for you. Now you have scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. No adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. And remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. I'd like you to buy Chesterfields and prove that Chesterfield is best for you. Regular or king size, they're much milder to give you all the pleasure the modern cigarette can give. Gerald Stephen Rogers was tried and found guilty of 12 counts of robbery in the first degree and four counts of kidnapping. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Safety Council reminds you to make sure your car is really in shape for winter driving. Check headlights, windshield wipers, tires, and brakes. And then winterize your driving. Get the feel of the road when you start out. Keep well behind the car ahead. Instead of slamming on brakes and starting a skid, pump your brakes to slow down or stop. And always take your time in wintertime. <laughs> You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Ralph Moody, Harry Bartell, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them. Regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. It's Adventure with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator on NBC.
me, put my arms about you. I don't want to live without you. When you wore a tulip, a big yellow tulip, and I wore a big red rose. Gee, what do you do when you love somebody so much they don't even know you're around? I don't know, Joe. I guess you just keep right on loving him. Say, what hit us? Oh, it hit me a long time ago. The bells are ringing for me and my gal. The birds are singing for me and my gal. Uh, now, let's drop in. To Duffy's Tavern. Duffy's Tavern, starring Archie himself and Gardner. And Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy. Tonight, uh, Charles Coburn. Charles Coburn. Now, Duffy, don't hang up. <laughs> All right, so one week it ain't a dame. <laughs> huh? You never heard of Coburn? Duffy, I'm surprised. The, the uh, gentleman's histrionic talents have made him one of the foremost exponents of Thespis. <laughs> yes, he's a ham. <laughs> show business for years. How old is he? Well, uh, let me put it this way. He's old enough to know what it's all about, but uh, he ain't young enough to do nothing about it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A lot like Jolson. <laughs> Except if Coburn never got down on one knee, he'd never get up again. <laughs> How's business here? Well, uh, we're running ahead of yesterday. Yeah, we was closed yesterday. <laughs> well, you know something, Duffy? You know what would help business here? Uh, a good a doorman, you know, a good front man. Huh? Well, uh, when a customer comes in a place, what's the first thing he thinks about? Right. About leaving. <laughs> so, we got to have a front man to block the door, and, uh... <laughs> This Coburn is a natural for the job. <laughs> yeah. You ought to see the front the guy puts up. <laughs> His uh, duties, uh, well, we'd expect him to go up to the customers, you know, and inquire, for instance, how they like the food here. Duffy, who's going to hit a guy his age? <laughs> well, look, I'm busy now. I'll call you back. But Duffy, me and Eddie is right in the middle of some very important business. Okay. Okay, Eddie, deal out the cards. <laughs> okay, Miss Archie. Oh, this is a wonderful game, you know? Why'd you say the name of it? It's called Jim Rummy. <laughs> it's named after that famous gambler, Diamond Jim. You know? <laughs> Diamond Jim, huh? I, I thought this game was called Gin Rummy. You're thinking of Eli Whitney. <laughs> sure, he invented the cotton gym. My son is a great game. Yeah. Very educational. Yes, sir. Yeah. How much do you owe me so far? <laughs> See, now, you, you gym me four times, 3,000 points. Times it by seven is 21,000. 21,000 plus 10,000 for boxes is 32,000. 
Uh, multiply by four. It's an even dollar. Okay, give me the buck. Okay, here's the buck. Now, uh, lend me the loan and a buck back. Uh, nothing doing. That's bad luck. I ain't going to lend you no money. You won't lend me a lousy buck? That's a fine attitude. Suppose other people felt that way. Suppose Isabella hadn't lent Columbus some money. Do you realize the world would still be flat? <laughs> Eddie, I'm surprised at you. Hey, Archie, uh, this Charles Coburn who's coming down here tonight. What about him? Well, why don't you ever have anyone like Robert Taylor or a Tyrone Power to meet me? Tyrone Power? <laughs> Look, Miss Duffy, when a guy's got a Philly Mignon at home, he don't go out to eat hash. <laughs> I might further mention that to get guys like Tyrone Power down here, we'd have to induce them with a little sex appeal. <sighs> sex appeal? What is it? Nothing but sheer plain animal attraction. Animal attraction? Look, have you ever been to the burlesque? Yeah. Ever see crowds like that at the zoo? <laughs> is Mr. Coburn. What's it to you? Well, in case he happens to find me irresistible. <laughs> Look, Miss Duffy, the guy may have gray hair, but his opticals are still good. <laughs> now beat it, will you? I uh, wish to be alone. Uh, all right. <laughs> My wish has been granted. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Penny? And you look a little tired. Oh, yeah. I couldn't sleep a wink last night. Couldn't sleep, huh? Did you try counting sheep? Yep. Counted up to 864. Yeah, and still couldn't get to sleep? No, oh, the room got so stuffy, I had to get up and open the window. <laughs> How come? I made a mistake. Instead of sheep, I was counting goats. <laughs> The thing that kept me awake was a loud party going on upstairs. Well, uh, why didn't you go upstairs and tell them to shut up? Uh, well, as it turned out, I didn't have to. You see, the ceiling in my apartment ain't too strong. So? So the next thing I know, I'm dancing with a tall blonde. <laughs> you mean the party dropped in on you and uh, carried on in your apartment? Well, uh, not exactly. What do you mean, not exactly? Well, as you know, the floor in my apartment ain't too strong, neither. So you dropped in on the people downstairs? Sure. How long did this party last? Clear through to the basement. <laughs> you, you know them penthouse parties, I They go on for a long time. So, as I say, I didn't get a wink of sleep. Well, what'd you do all night? Played solitaire with me, brother. Solitaire with your brother? Two of you playing solitaire? What else could we play? We only had one deck of cards. Oh, so you played cards, yeah. huh? I didn't know you was a card player. Oh, I'm very good at it, Art. Right? Maybe we can get up a little game. Okay. All right, we'll play dealer's choice. Uh, what game do you like? Flipping them into a hat. Boy, that's a wonderful card game. Yeah, it's a better card game than it is a joke. <laughs> Flipping them into a hat. I thought that was very funny. Flipping them into a hat. Huh? Yeah, I thought so, too. Yeah. Mm, uh, look, uh, uh, how would you like to play a little rummy? A little rummy? Why not? I'll play anybody. <laughs> Jim Rummy. Oh, 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 Jim Rummy. The Rummie. new card game. Uh, how do you play it? I'll show you. You got any money? Well, I got half a buck. In that case, I think I can teach you the game. <laughs> oh, thanks, Doc. And I think you'll find that I learn very fast. Well, if you learn very fast, how come you don't know nothing? Oh, easy come, easy go. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now, card for you, card for me, card for you, card for me. Uh, Miss Archer, uh, how can you do it? It'll be a lesson, Tom Eddie. It'll teach him not to gamble. <laughs> now, back to Duffy's Tavern. 
Mm. Well, Finnegan, that's that. Okay, Arch. You owe me three bucks. Three bucks. Okay. Yeah. Hey, huh? <laughs> Thanks, Arch. Hey, you... hey. Hey, wait a minute. What? That guy that just came in. I think I've seen him in the movies. Ain't that Faye Bainter? <laughs> Finnegan, that's Charles Coburn. Hey! Coburn, may I tell you that many great stars have passed through these portholes. <laughs> but you are the portliest of them all. And furthermore, may I say that we are indeed pleased... Oh, shut up. <laughs> so this is Duffy's tavern, hmm? Mm-hmm. Where's Duffy? He's home. He's smart. <laughs> the place? Well, it's sort of broken down and decrepit, but then who am I to talk? <laughs> That's right, at least you've got a roof over your head. <laughs> By the way, uh, are you keeping busy these days? Oh, yes, my days are quite full. Pictures, radio, personal appearances, looking for work. <laughs> you been an actor? About 50 years. 50 years, almost a decade. <laughs> Look, uh, as long as you brought it up, uh, just how old a man are you? Uh, approaching 65. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me, uh, at an age like that, what do you do for amusement? <laughs> oh, I collect antique furniture. Antique furniture? Did you buy these antiques when they was new? All except the 18th century stuff. John Quincy Adam outbid me. Uh, say, say, Archie. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. <clears throat> I suppose you want an introduction? To him? to a person of my sex. Archie. Yeah? What sex is that? She's a girl. You could have fooled me. Well, we might as well get it over with. McDuffie, this is Charles Coburn. How do you do? No. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Coburn. But May can never wed December. Miss Duffy, December had no intention of asking you. <laughs> Miss Duffy, can't you see that he ain't interested in you? Oh, no. Did you see the look in his eyes? Forgive me, dear lady. I was carried away by your lovely, ravishing face. I can go along with a gag. <laughs> Mr. Coburn. Yes? Do girls go out with you? Oh, once in a while. How do they explain you to their folks? <laughs> they usually say, Mama, see what I'll have to marry if you don't let me go out with Joe? <laughs> well, well, Mr. Coburn, don't feel too bad. Remember, any girl who'd go out with you isn't worth having anyway. Miss Duffy, will you please desist your presence? Me and the gentleman here has some business to discuss. Uh, tell me, Mr. Coburn, uh, how long did you say you've been an actor? Fifty years. Fifty years, eh? Huh? Don't you think you ought to settle down to a steady job? <laughs> a steady job? Yeah. Where? Here in Duffy's Tavern. I'd rather marry Miss Duffy. The hard way, huh? Look, it happens that we have a very important job open. What kind of a job? We need a front man. A front man? Yeah, and you're just a type, you know. Prosperous looking, well-fed, well-dressed, business-like, perfect phony. <laughs> well, what do you say? But Archie, a job like that, uh, wouldn't it tie me down? 
Not too tied down. Take me. I work here, and I wasn't too tied down to do a picture for Paramount. Yes, I saw that picture. Oh, really? What'd you think of it? You should be tied down. For a man who is seeking employment, I should think you'd be a little more diplomatic. Uh, I was only fooling, Archie. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed the picture. Did you? Mm, yes. Especially Dorothy Lamore. In that sarong. Oh. How old did this guy say he was? <laughs> you like that sarong, huh? Yeah, didn't you? Uh, personally, I never gave it a second thought, huh? I was too busy with the first thought. <laughs> but what a cast we had in that picture. Remember Bing Crosby? No. He was in it. Uh, remember Betty Hutton? Yes. Remember Victor Moore? No. Remember Veronica Lake? Yes. <laughs> remember Alan Ladd? No. <laughs> remember Diana Lynn? Yes. Looks like December has moved up a couple of times. Yeah, it was a great cast. We had 34 stars in addition to me. Yes, 34 stars and one eclipse. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, hello, Duffy. Uh, no, uh, no, I ain't got him out on the sidewalk yet. Huh? Well, I figure on rainy days, we can let him stand inside, you know, next to the cash register. Well, Duffy, we can have him bonded. <laughs> Look, Duffy, there's nothing to worry about. He's the, the settled type, you know, not bright enough to steal and too old to run. <laughs> uh, incidentally, how much you think we should pay him? Duffy, he can make more money than that out of Social Security. <laughs> huh? Okay. Uh, be with you in a second, Mr. Coburn. Uh, Eddie, Duffy says we gotta test the guy's character before we hire him. Character, huh? Yeah, and I agree with him, you know. I won't have nobody around here, Eddie, unless he's honest. There's two things we gotta have. Character and honesty. Now, we gotta test the guy. How? We'll clip him in a poker game. <laughs> Sure way to test out a guy's character, you know, to play him poker. What was he with? Then he's fired. We can't have guys around here without character. <laughs> now look, fellas. Yeah. Uh, uh, leave us not scare this guy off by mentioning poker right away, you know. I'll lead him up to it gradually, you know, subtle like. Uh, subtle like, huh? Yeah. Uh, oh, Mr. Coburn. Uh, yes. Uh, speaking of baseball, uh, them St. Louis Browns is the best baseball team in St. Louis, don't you think so? No, I like the cards. Speaking of cards... <laughs> how uh, would you like to indulge in a nice sociable game of, say, uh, Jim Rummy? Well, frankly, I don't know much about cards. A pigeon. <laughs> uh, you say you don't know much about cards? No. No, about uh, six years ago, I did play a game called uh, poker. Poker, huh? Uh, what kind of a game is that? Well, it's been so long ago, I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, why don't we play again? Maybe it'd come back to us, huh? All right. Uh, if you'll promise to be patient with a greenhorn. <laughs> I'm even greener than you. No, I'm much greener than you. No, I'm a lot greener than you. <laughs> you are the two greenest actors I ever seen. <laughs> I'll get the cards. Fellas, we got a real sucker. I don't know a thing about poker. The poker! Oh, boy! Poker! Do you play poker? No. <laughs> No, no, I don't, but I got dumb luck. If you got any kind of luck at all, that's the kind. <laughs> now, Benny, all you got to remember in yeah. poker is one thing. Yeah. See, don't go into a pot unless you got four of a kind. Uh, four of a kind, eh? That's right. Yeah. Don't go in unless you got four of a kind. Well, okay, I got it. Well, Mr. Coburn, uh, what shall we play first? Say, uh, one and two? All right, a hundred and two hundred. Shall we compromise? All right. Two cents and four cents. All right, now uh, let's 
let's start the game. Now, go ahead and deal out the cards. Uh, by the way, you don't know how to deal, don't you? Well, I used to be able to. Now, let me see. Hmm. Three missing. <laughs> Coincidence, I happen to have a deck of cards right here in my pocket. Oh, really? In your pocket? Uh, how long did you say it was since you played? Six years. This is an old coat. <laughs> mm. I wonder if I'll be able to remember how to play this uh, poker. Yeah, I wonder if I'll remember too. Uh, how are we going to play? Straight poker. Jacks are better, nothing wild. <laughs> I got a queer feeling that ain't such an old coat. <laughs> well, let's look at him now. Let's see here, what have I got? Hmm. 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 I'll open it. I bet uh, four cents. Wait, no, I don't. Leave it there. That's down or dead. <laughs> Uh, are you staying, Eddie? No, oh, I'm dropping out. Uh, me too. Me too. Uh, you win the pot, Mr. Coburn. Oh, do I win? Yep, take the money. Well, this is great fun. <laughs> Beginner's luck, I guess. Yeah, what'd you have? A pair of bullets. I mean, uh, two ones. <laughs> And what did you drop out with? Oh, nothing. Three kings. <laughs> you dropped out with three kings. Well, you, you told me to only go in with four of a kind. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, yeah, won't do that. Just wait till you get four of a kind. Sure. <laughs> well, here's your cards, gentlemen. Hmm. 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 Oh, boy! I opened it! <laughs> I think I'll drop out. <laughs> and me too. Well, I think I'll stay. Brave boy. <laughs> okay, how many cards are you drawn? None. I, uh, I think I'll stand pat. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll stand pat too. <laughs> hey, very shrewd poker, Finnegan. <laughs> Here's my bet. I raise you. I raise you. I said it fight. <laughs> This is a democracy. Oh. Uh, but uh, you can re-raise them. Oh, okay. okay. And the I raise, and a B raise, and a D I raise, and I re-raise you again. I double it. Okay, I'll drop out. <laughs> If you got what I think you got. Don't worry, Arch. I got him. <laughs> got him, huh? Yeah. Good enough for me. Mr. Coburn, we raise you two. Four. Eight. Sixteen. Thirty-two. Sixty-four. Give me a pencil. <laughs> Queen, King, Ace. A straight? That's all? <laughs> Finnegan. Yeah. <laughs> Show your cards. There you are, Rod. Let's see. <laughs> Ten, four, two, seven. Jack. Finnegan, where's the four of a kind? There they are, four spades. <laughs> Gentlemen, I thank you very much. Good night. Good night, Mr. Coburn. Uh, hey, wait just a second. Uh, I think this ace belongs to you. It just fell out of your cup. Oh, did it? <laughs> well, you may keep it. I've got a million of them. <laughs> you next 
next week. It's time to leave Duffy's Tavern for now, but be sure to be with us again next time for another hilarious get-together at everybody's favorite tavern. He's lost, he's alone, and he's three million light years from home. In spring 2002, only in theaters, I'm keeping you. Steven Spielberg's masterpiece ah. will come to life room, room. for a whole new generation. <laughs> Experience the mystery. Wait, what is it? Scary. The wonder. What's happening? The call. E.T. Phone home. That started it all. With never before seen footage, enhanced special effects, and an all new digitally remastered soundtrack. The extraordinary 20th anniversary edition. The Extraterrestrial. I'll be right here. Only in theaters, March 2002. Now it's time to spend a day with Jack Benny's favorite crooner. It's a day in the life of Dennis Day. Coming up next. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Day. in your eyes and the smell of your smile. Dennis Day is brought to you by Palm Olive Soap and Colgate Dental Cream. Palm Olive Soap, your beauty hope, and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth. The Dennis Day Show with Barbara Eiler, B. Benadera, Dink Trout, George Dooning in the orchestra, and yours truly, Vern Smith, is written by Frank Galen and stars our popular young singer in A Day in the Life of Dennis Day. Here's Dennis to sing A Fellow with an Umbrella. I'm just a fella, a fella with an umbrella, looking for a girl who saved her love for a rainy day. I'm just a fella, a fella with an umbrella. Glad to see the skies of blue have turned into skies of gray. Raindrops have brought us together, and that's what I long to see. Maybe the break in the weather will prove to be a break for me. I'll be the fella. The fella with an umbrella If you'll be the girl who saved her love for a rainy day Raindrops have brought us together And that's what I long to see Maybe the break in the weather Will prove to be a break for me So I'll be the fella The fella with an umbrella if you'll be the girl who saved her for a rainy day. 
And now, here is a very important announcement. Palm Olive Soap is giving away prizes worth $67,000. A grand prize of $25,000 in one lump sum, or $100 a month for life. And that's not all. There are thousands of prizes in Palm Olive's big treasure chest contest. 1949 Ford Sedan. Westinghouse Laundromat. From Silver Fox Scarves. Toastmaster Toasters. Yes, 2,336 prizes in all. And it's easy to enter. Complete the last line of this jingle. A fresher, brighter-looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get palm olive soap today. De da de da de da de da. Write your last line on a plain sheet of paper, or get an official entry blank from your dealer, which gives you the easy rules. Include your own and dealer's name and address, and mail with the black bands from one regular and one bath size cake of palm olive soap to Palm Olive, Box 92, New York 8, New York. And now here's the jingle once more. A fresher, brighter-looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get palm olive soap today. De da de da de da de da. Mail your entry blank with the black bands from Palm Olive Soap to Palm Olive, Box ninety two, New York eight, New York. Enter early. Enter often. Get palm olive soap for a lovelier complexion. Remember, doctors prove palm olive's beauty results. <laughs> To our dear friend, Mr. Anderson, a more brutal evening than one spent at the Weaverville Town Hall listening to a visiting soprano gargle her way through a concert is difficult to imagine. Yet it's exactly this ordeal he faces tonight, for Mrs. Anderson considers the affair a cultural must. Naturally, he'd give his eye teeth to be absent, but in view of his wife's feelings in the matter, a refusal might entail the loss of some of his front ones as well. So we find him now pouring out his woes into the sympathetic ear of our young hero, Dennis Day. Oh, now it can't be that bad, Mr. Anderson. Oh, it's worse, my boy. Imagine sitting there all night while some woman yowls herself blue in the face. Well, refuse to go. You're a man. You wear the pants in the family, don't you? Oh, sure. I wear the pants all right. Only Poopsie keeps cutting the suspenders. Oh, in other words, she says you have to go, huh? Oh, no. No, all she said was whether I go to this concert or not was a matter of my own volition. Volition? It's from the Latin. means either go or get carried. <laughs> oh, I see. I don't know how much longer I can stand this treatment, Dennis. Someday I've got to assert myself with my wife. Someday I've got to assume my proper place in this marriage before it's too late. How long have you been married now? Twenty-five years. <laughs> yeah, you better hurry or the honeymoon will be over. <laughs> I'm going to. Dennis, my mind is made up. I'm not going to that concert. I'm finally going to tell Poopsie off. Gosh, do you mean it? Certainly. Isn't anything better than slavery? Well, I don't know. Personally, I'd rather tote that veil and keep breathing. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. We're going to rehearse my speech to her right now, Dennis. Now, you make believe that you're Poopsie, and you've just walked into the room. Okay, how do you want her? As usual or smiling? As usual. <laughs> All right, here we go. Well, Herbert, are you ready to go to the concert? Shut up! <laughs> what? I asked you whether you were ready to go to the concert. Stop flapping your big trap. <gasps> I'm not going to any concert, tonight or any other night. Understand, kiddo? And if you don't like it, you can lump it. Want to bet which one she does? <laughs> well, I'd just like to see her try it. Those are going to be my exact words, Dennis. I'm going to tell her plenty. I'm going to... Well, Herbert, are you ready to go to the concert? Yes, Poopsie. <laughs> well, you can take off that tuxedo because you're not going. Not going? Gosh, maybe you're scared of my mental telepathy. It's simply that Mrs. Van Nostrand just got back in town today and couldn't get a ticket for the concert, so I gave her Herbert's. Oh, my... You mean I'm to be deprived of hearing Madame Slobotnik sing 112 folk songs in the original Lithuanian, accompanying herself on the glockenspiel? It can't be helped. You know what a feather it'll be in my cap to be seen with Mrs. Van Nostrand, the acknowledged social leader of the whole town. Oh, you bet. Well, don't mind me. I'll stay home alone tonight. <laughs> Don't be so happy about it. I've hidden your binoculars. And besides, that blonde who's out there. Oh. 
Now, come along upstairs and help me get dressed. Yes, dear. And this time, take off your shoes. Last time you laced up my corset, I had the imprint of your heel on my back for a week. <laughs> At your service, love. Oh, hi, Mildred. My, you look very nice. Oh, thank you, Daddy. Well, how do you think of me, Dennis? Boy, is that a dress. Hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo! <laughs> My new strap was formal, and judging from the look in your eye, you kind of like it. Yeah, I was just thinking, if you'd tell me how you keep it up, I could throw in my garters. <laughs> Silly. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, yes, Mrs. Van Austin. Oh, my goodness, your nurse? Oh, golly. Yes, of course, Mrs. Van Austin. Yes, I will. Goodbye. Oh, gosh. Mildred, what seems to... Was that the phone, Mildred? Yes, Mother, and I'm afraid it's bad news. Mrs. Van Ostrin's nurse just quit, and she can't get anyone to stay with little Gerald, so You I... mean she can't go to the concert? But she's got to. I've told everyone in town I'd be with her. But, Mother, if she can't find anyone to take Wait care of... Wait a minute. Dennis. <laughs> oh, no, not me. That Gerald is the worst little brat in town. Dennis, I want Mrs. Van Nostrand at that concert. Is that clear? Are you kidding? I wouldn't stay with her son for a million dollars. Dennis Day. You think 50 cents an hour would be too much? <laughs> now, you understand, Mr. Day. My Gerald is not an ordinary child. And I'm extremely careful about seeing that he's in the right hands. That is the reason for this interview. Yes, ma'am. Now, just exactly what do you know about sitting? Oh, there's nothing to it. I just squat and then lose altitude till I make contact. <laughs> Mr. Day, we are not discussing your physical triumphs. We're not? No. Now tell me once and for all, what do you know about growing boys? Well, frankly, I've never grown any. What? I mean, I never had any of my own, but my mother and father did. Yes. And I imagine they pause every now and then to curse each other about it. I beg pardon? Mr. Day, do you really think I'd trust a child like my Gerald with someone like you? But gosh, Mrs. Van Ostrom, A high-strung, nervous youngster like my Gerald, who's already tried to run away from home twice. He has? Yes. Not that I can understand why. I've always spent a great deal of time with him. Could that be a clue? <laughs> Never mind. The point is, I certainly don't want you taking care of him, and that is final. But gee, Mrs. Anderson will kill me if you don't go to that... Oh, wait a minute, I've got an idea. Suppose I call Mr. Anderson and have him come over. The two of us could sit with Gerald. Mr. Anderson? Well, I... I do want to hear that concert. All right, call him. I guess Mr. Anderson can handle the boy. Oh, sure. Little Gerald may have a few pounds on him, but Herbie's pretty fast on his feet. <laughs> Come on, Gerald. Let's finish your homework before Mr. Anderson gets back with the ice cream. Now, once more, what is the largest city in Australia? Why don't you jump in the lake? Gerald, you must never answer a question with a question. Ah, oh, put that book away. I had enough of this junk. Gerald, that's no attitude. You've got to do your homework, son. You don't want to grow up and be a big dumbbell, do you? What's the matter? You hate the life you lead? <laughs> never mind. You want to amount to something, don't you? Not me. I'm going to be an actor. An actor? Sure. That's the greatest life in the world. Every time my mother leaves me alone, I try to running away. But the sinners are always too smart for... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? You know something? You're right about getting an education. You, I better get the rest of my books and study real hard. Yeah, now you're talking. Uh, they're in this closet. Would you get them for me? You bet. Hey, where are they? I don't see them. Uh, back a little further. That's it. Okay, wise guy. Gerald, hey, you locked me in. Come on, sucker. I'm taking the next train to Hollywood. Gerald, wait. Come back. Gerald, Gerald, wait. Dennis, are you sure he came down here at the station? You see him anywhere? No, but I... Oh, wait a minute. There he is. Huh? See? On the other side of that iron gate. Oh, my gosh. We can't even get our hands on him. How can we stop him from getting on that train? Come on. I have an idea. Maybe we can talk him out of it. Just follow any lead I throw. Okay. 
Uh, hello, Gerald. You mean goodbye, sucker. My train leaves in five minutes. Okay. If you want to go to a sad, unhappy, uneducated life, that's your lookout. What do you mean, uneducated? Who are you saying ain't got no education? You. Don't you know you can't be an actor unless you know how to speak English? Okay, so I'll go on the radio. That Jimmy Durant does, does okay without the English language. Uh, Gerald, I'm glad you mentioned him. You think Jimmy Durant is a happy man. I happen to know that behind that gay, carefree nose beats a broken heart. Yeah? Now how would you know? Well, I'm going to tell you a secret I've never mentioned in public before. My real name is Jimmy Durante, Gerald. What? You're nuts. You don't believe it, huh, kiddo? Okay, I'll tell you a story. I'm driving down Sunset Boulevard one day in my moron colored convertible with the white sidewall tires. <laughs> I'm dressed in me usual Hollywood fashion, to wit. Me violet beret, me orange-colored sweatshirt, open enough to show a glimpse of me heliotrope waistcoat, me deck, <laughs> me deck to me fuchsia slacks with chartreuse open sneakers. All of a sudden, a motorcycle gendarme flags me to the coib. I says, what's the matter? I was only going 50 miles an hour. And he says, I know. I just wanted to hear you talk. I was I mortified. And Gerald, what did I have to talk about? Did I know the biggest city in Australia? No. Did I not a square of hypotenuse? I don't even know what they eat. <laughs> don't grow up like me. A miserable, uneducated millionaire, Gerald. It's ignominious. So what? Just because you are? But they are, Gerald. Even the greatest of them. Men like Sir Harry Lauder, a success on every continent. He was just as sad. Sir Harry Lauder? Who's he? Oh, he was before your time, Gerald. Way back in the beginning of show business, when they didn't even know whether Phil Spitalny's orchestra would be a boy or a girl. <laughs> but I know all about him, because, you see, Sir Harry Lauder was just one of my stage names. What? He was you, too? Ah, hi, laddie. That's how it was. Aye, and what a hit I was, too, when my kilts and my tart and my tam, back when the century was new. Aye, the music comes back to me new. If you'll close your ears, maybe you can hear it, too, just the way I used to sing. I've seen lots of bonny lassies on my travels wide, but my hair to center new on bonny Kate McBride. And although I'm no a fella that would throw a word away, I'm surprised sometimes myself at all I've got to say. Roman in the gloaming on the bunny banks of Clyde. Roman in the gloaming with my lassie by my side. When the sun has gone to rest, that's the time that we love best. Oh, it's lovely Roman in the glow, and man, I'm telling you. Last night after strolling, we got in at half past nine. And sitting at the kitchen fire, I asked her to be mine. When she promised I got up and I danced the heel and fling. I've just been to the jewelers and I bought her a bunny wee ring. Oh, Roman in the gloaming on the bunny banks of Clyde. Roman in the gloaming with my lassie by my side. When the sun has gone to rest, that's the time that we love best. Oh, it's lovely Roman in the gloaming. Roman in the gloaming on the bunny banks of Clyde. Roman in the gloaming we my lassie by my side. When the sun has gone to rest, that's the time that we love best. Oh, it's lovely Roman in the gloaming. Ah, aye, laddie, that's the way I used to warble. When, but when I get home at night to my 150-room hoose, 
And my 1,200 servants, my head butler used to say to me, Blimey, good evening, you belly bloomin' lordship, sir. <laughs> Greetings, Tiffin, old man. Arkin it as happy as ever you are, this bra brick moonlicht nick to nick, ah, I see. yes, your lordship, much happier than you. Aye. For you see, you didn't concentrate on your education when you were little Gerald's age. Aye. And now, in spite of your great wealth, you don't know the biggest city in blinking old Australia. Aye. Aye, aye, aye. Right so far. You see what I mean, Gerald? Oh, who cares about an old Scotchman? You just show me a big success on the American stage, my, my boy. Now, don't tell me you're all three of them. Oh. <laughs> no, that'd be silly. I'm only one. What? Sure. And my friend here, Mr. Anderson, is another. You hear us sing and you think we're happy. But are we? Listen closely and see if you can't detect a sad note beneath it all. Famous trumpet man from out Chicago way. He had a boogie style that no one else would play. He was the top man of his craft. But then his number came up and he was gone with the draft. He's in the army now, a blowing rapidly. He's a boogie woogie doo, the boy is hot when he beats. A toot, a toot, a toot, a toot, he blows it eight to the bar. In boogie rhythm, he can't blow a note unless a bass and guitar is playing with him. He makes the company jump, 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 jump,
kissing. You miss me, honey. When you go away, I feel so lonely. Just for you only. For you know, honey, you've had your way. And when you leave me, I know it will grieve me. You're miss. So you see, Gerald, nobody on the stage is happy. In spite of their yachts and rubies and palaces, they're all miserable. Gee, honest? Sure. You've got to have an education if you want to amount to something in this world. Yeah, maybe you're right. Here's my railroad ticket, pal. Oh, good golly, is that a load off my mind. Oh, wait a minute, Dennis. Uh, wh- where are you going? To turn the boys' ticket in? What? Swimming pools, yachts, diamonds, furs, Cadillacs? <laughs> I'm taking the next train to Hollywood. <laughs> Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. No other toothpaste does a better job of cleaning teeth than Colgate Dental Cream. For Colgate Dental Cream has a safe polishing agent that cleans your teeth both gently and thoroughly. Brings out their natural sparkle and beauty. You can actually see and feel the difference. And scientific tests prove that Colgate Dental Cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. Yes, actual scientific tests prove conclusively that in 7 out of 10 cases... Colgate's instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. Colgate Dental Cream is famous for its wonderful wake-up flavor, too. Nationwide tests of leading toothpastes prove that Colgate's is preferred for flavor over every other brand tested. Yes, preferred over every other brand tested. And no wonder, for Colgate Dental Cream is the result of constant effort to produce the finest toothpaste in the world today. For cleaning teeth, for flavor, for sweetening breath. So see if you don't agree with the millions who have made Colgate Dental Cream America's favorite toothpaste. Try Colgate Dental Cream to bring out the natural sparkle and beauty of your teeth for a wake-up flavor you'll thoroughly enjoy. And always use Colgate Dental Cream after you eat and before every date to clean your breath while you clean your teeth. You're not a one-legged girl, are you? Huh? Oh. Well, I got in just the end of that one, I guess, didn't I? Huh? Ready? On your wheels? Let's go. New York, London, Paris, Vienna, 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 New York, London, Paris, Vienna. hasn't been any gossip about John and this woman. If there has, I haven't heard it. And I ran away because I was afraid of doing something foolish. Because I loved my husband. Wasn't I naive? Give me those letters, Larry. I want those letters. Judith Wilson, you've been on trial in this court for your life. All these weeks I've been your friend. I've labored and I've struggled to try to send you out of here a free woman. I believe in your innocence, and I believe in you. 
But you betrayed my friendship and you betrayed my trust. You lied to me and you lied to this court. Now I want you to tell the truth. I want to know what really happened between the time you came up those stairs and the time the grocery boy found you. Shall I tell? She killed no! Man. How about we check in with Bibber McGree and Molly next? That sounds good to me. The Johnson Wax Program with Bibber McGee and Molly. Makers of Johnson's Wax, Johnson's Car New, and Johnson's Self Polishing Glow Coat present Bibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. an interesting letter from a woman who proposed a use for Johnson's Wax, which she thought might belong in our Department of Unusual Uses. It had to do with protecting and improving the looks of porch floors and woodwork now that spring is here and porches are coming into use again in so many parts of the country. Well, this use for Johnson's Wax really isn't unusual, but it's a good idea, especially now that homes throughout the land are getting their spring house cleaning. Clean your porch floors now, and then spread on a coat or two of Johnson's paste or liquid wax. Wax the woodwork, too. You'll be giving the finish, whether paint or varnish, honest-to-goodness protection against dirt and the rains that blow through your porch screens. And you'll make future cleaning easy, because the extra dirt and dust that accumulates on porches is easy to wipe off Johnson waxed floors and woodwork. One thing about being an average citizen, it's the exciting things that happen to balance the dull things that makes you average. Like what is happening right now to Fibber McGee and Molly. Hey, Molly, Molly. Something awful has happened. Now, take it easy, McGee. Well, you is. Whatever it is, in 20 or 30 years, you'll look back at it and laugh. Yeah. I'll be looking back at it through the bars of a jail. That's where I'll be looking back at it through the... <laughs> My gosh, I'm in an awful mess, Molly. Oh, McGee, you get into more stews than a restaurant oyster. <laughs> All right, tell Mother. Well, look, I stole a car. You what? Well, I didn't exactly steal it, exactly. I just borrowed now, it. Now, wait a minute, dearie. This isn't like you. Well... I've known you to sneak a peek at the discard playing gin rummy and give yourself a slight edge in your income tax, but I've never known you to steal. Wasn't exactly stealing. You see, I had to get downtown in a hurry, see? What for? Well, they got a new punch board at the cigar store, and the first prize is a swell big ashtray showing Roosevelt and Churchill shaking hands, and it says underneath, put it there. <laughs> And I know I could have won it if I'd have gotten it. Now, never mind that. 
Whose car was it? Old Lady Uppington's. Oh, dear. She told me I could borrow it sometime in an emergency, and this was an emergency. On account of you don't often see a swell ashtray like that with two Yeah, people. but uh, what's all the excitement? You brought the car back, didn't you? No. Why not? Because somebody stole it from in front of the cigar store. They st- Oh, heavenly days, you are in a mess, dearie. Well... Did you report it to the police? Sure I did, over the phone. And they said, what's the license number? And I says, I don't know. And they says, who are you? And I didn't want to embarrass Uppy, so I says, I was Morton J. Muffin of Kokomo, Indiana. <laughs> and I described the car to him and hung up quick. And then I run home. Well, then why didn't you give your right name? I couldn't think of it. <laughs> well, there's only one thing for you to do, Diddy. Call Abigail and explain the whole thing. Oh, I was afraid you'd say that. She'll pin my ears back so far back I can hear the Battle of Hastings. <laughs> Nevertheless, you have to do it. I'm sure she'll be reasonable. Reasonable, my clavicle. That old rhino has got a tongue sharp enough to shave with. She'll be about as reasonable as a hornet in a hairnet. But hand me the phone. Here. Thanks. Hello, operator. Give me Maine, 7926143279. Thanks. She ain't home, Molly. The operator rang and rang and nobody answered. You didn't give her much time. You're afraid she would answer. Uh-oh, it's the cops. They traced me. They tracked me down. They dragged out the thrownet. Oh, it's throw out the dragnet, and don't get so excited. I peeked out, and it's a woman. Oh, well, thank goodness. Whatever she's selling, I'll buy a dozen. We'll be buying Abigail's automobile for the next hundred years, so don't get liberal. Come in. Mr. McGee. You betcha, sis. What magazines are you selling? <laughs> You're a little old to be working your way through college, but a gray-haired co-ed is better than a platinum dumbbell, I always say. <laughs> So I'll be glad to subscribe to whatever Mr. McGee, <laughs> I am a bailiff. Well, that's great, sis. It's a fine thing when... Be... You're a what? She's a bailiff, McGee. A bailiff. Meaning the police want you. Mm. Serve your papers, dearie. This isn't official, Mrs. McGee. Oh. But they would like to have Mr. McGee drop in at the police station as soon as convenient. Thank you. Boy, this looks bad. You see how polite she was? They would like to have me drop in at the police station. <laughs> hmm. And when I do, they'll wham the junior out of me with a rubber hose. Well, after all, they could have sent a squad car after you. They're giving you the benefit of the doubt. Oh, yeah. Those guys wouldn't give you the happiest off an old corpus. <laughs> I'll bet they want me to make a break for it so when I come running out, they can shoot me down like a dog. Don't be so gangbusterish. You haven't committed any crime. Is that so? I gave the cops the wrong name, didn't you I? You weren't under oath. Oh, wasn't I? You should have heard them. <laughs> well, come on, McGee. Huh? Where? To the police station. Huh? Might as well get it over with. Oh, no, you don't. I ain't walking into no trap. I got to get me some character references. I got to get a lawyer. Do you know any lawyers? Sure I do. A friend of mine in the Elks. Old Oliver Pross. We call him Nolly Pross. <laughs> come on, let's go see All him. All right, I'll run up and put my face on. I'll be right down. We'll get going. <sighs> Ah, oh, there's a good kid, sticking by me through thick and thin. I'll bet if they send me to prison... Ah, oh, they can't send me to prison for borrowing a car. Oh, no, boy, they can throw the book at you for that. <laughs> well, I didn't steal it. Yeah, but can you prove you didn't steal it? I don't have to prove it. All I done was to... Fi- oh, my gosh, they got me. Well, I'll go quietly. Car stealing is bad enough without beating up a couple of cops. Come in. <laughs> Hmm. What's you sticking your hands out for? Oh, I, I thought I was going to be... Oh, hi, sis. <laughs> I'm glad to see you. <laughs> see, are you? I sure am. Why? Huh? Hmm? Why what? Why are you glad to see me? Do you hardly ever almost never are? Well, it's, it's just sheer relief, sis, old sis. <laughs> I was expecting some very unpleasant visitors. <laughs> While you're nothing to be cast away on a desert island with, you're a darn sight better than a couple of harness bulls. <laughs> See, are you getting some harness bulls, mister? On the contrary, sis. On the contrary. Mm-hmm. Look, sis, I, I guess you better run along now. I, I don't want to be on spa hospital, on, in hospital. That is, I, I don't want to be an old nasty, but, well, you, I, I, I got to be alone. I want to be alone with my thoughts. Oh, look, mister. Yeah? We've been friends a long time, haven't we? Well, certainly seems like a long time. <laughs> got to admit that. You got something on your mind, I know. Huh? Some secret sorrow, gnawing at your heart like an evil serpent. <laughs> huh? I know you don't like to burden others with your sorrows, 
You don't like to lean the weight of your sorrows upon others' shoulders. You're the strong, silent type. <laughs> Who, me? What good is a friend if not to share your sorrows? Hmm. To lighten your burden as we struggle down life's road together. <laughs> Why don't you open your heart and pour out your trouble to a woman? (laughs) A woman whose understanding heart will help you bear your lonely load. Come on, what's the matter? Hmm. Well, gee, sis. (laughs) Well, that's awful nice. Yeah, that's from a radio program I heard last night. It's called A Bleeding Heart. Well, that's a mighty pretty hunk of sentiment, sis. I... Yeah, but it's a lot of malarkey. Huh? Yeah. If anybody gave me that baloney when I was in a jam, I'd flap and sell it. Well, that's a fine idea. Oh, I think... no, you don't. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> See, Nolly, old man, I didn't really steal the car. I had permission to use it. Now, where do I stand with the cops now? Yes, uh, Mr. Cross, we've got to say the right thing at the police station, yeah. you know. Well, as I see it, the crime, if it was a crime, and there will be extenuating circumstances to it. The fact that you had permission to use the vehicle and that you reported the theft, even though you used a fictitious name, <laughs> though the case, <laughs> the case of Crampton versus Janovic, Nebraska, 1907... Court held that subsequent actions of defendant were, per se, incompatible with motivation of original act, and therefore, under the law, was cited by Justice Handeshag, Virginia Statute, 1911-1912, bona fide malfeasance was indicated by a cause of sine qua non. You see what I mean? In words of one syllable, no. Me either, Nolly. You gonna handle my case or not? My friend, you're hotter than a dime store frying pan, and I wouldn't touch this case with the mass of the Mayflower. Is that clear? It is. And thank you, Mr. Pross, for your trouble. And if there's anything we can ever do for you, just ask us. Yeah, and we'll sock you right in the puss. <laughs> Come on, Molly. Well, he was a big help. You got any more big-hearted friends that will rush to your defense, dearie? Hey, I gotta do something quick. What I need is some character witnesses. Might be smart to leave your character out of this, sweetheart. <laughs> if Mr. Pross was too scared to handle the case, you must be halfway to the hot seat right now. Oh, that's silly. I haven't done anything. Gee whiz, they can't treat me just well, like Well, hello there, kids. What you doing in this building? Oh, we had to consult a lawyer, Mr. Oldtimer. <laughs> oh, kids. Don't do it. Don't do it. Huh? Patch up your troubles and make the best of it. Look, daughter, maybe Johnny here is kind of impulsive and is always putting his best foot in his mouth. <laughs> so what? And Johnny... What are you talking about? Oh, you two kids seen a lawyer when you've been so happy together. Why, Jiminy, don't you know that marriage is a wonderful thing and nobody... Say, ever... who's talking about marriage? We had to see a lawyer about stealing uh, somebody stealing a car. Yeah. Oh, I see. Thought for a minute you and Johnny were... Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea either. How you ever managed to get along day after day with that little squirt bragging and shooting off his bazoo? Why, it's a shame. 
You get trot back in there, daughter, and file papers. Oh, cut it out. I got no time for kidding, old timer. Look, how'd you like to be a character witness? For who? For McGee. <laughs> Johnny, I'd do it just for the fun of it. <laughs> I've seen a lot of characters in my day, but by ginger, you taught them all. <laughs> Wait till I talk to him. Is he a character, I'll say? No, Why? no, no, no. All I need is somebody to vouch for me with the cops. Tell him I'm a good citizen. Yeah. Mm. Tell him he wouldn't steal. Mm. Tell him I'm upright and honest. Oh. Tell him he's straightforward. And truthful. No, no, wait a minute, Johnny. Don't reach. Mm. <laughs> anyway, I can't make it today. You'll have to get somebody else. I see. I always heard that a man's best friends were dogs, and they're certainly acting like it. Okay, old-timer, but don't ever ask me any favors. No, no, kids, don't be like that. I'd do it if I could. I'd go with you in a minute, except... Except what? Except that in a minute I got an appointment with another feller. Yeah. Well, good luck, Johnny. Remember, if they hang you, you got a legal right to a chicken dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that old vinegar lip. Well, it just goes to show you, dearie. Yeah. Friendship is just relative. What do you mean? I mean you can only depend on your relatives for friendship. Uh, this don't mean anything. Nobody's turned me down except an old group that don't know his left foot from a hot rock and a two-bit lawyer that only passed the bar because nobody'd buy him a drink. <laughs> I'll find somebody to help me. Well, I hope so. Your circle of friends is narrowing down so it looks like a wheel off a roller skate. Yeah. Who can you get? Well, now, let me see. Who could I get? Hey, how about Billy Mills? Nah, he's sore at me. What for? Well, I showed him a song I wrote, which the name of it was, My Sister's Got a Date with a Bombardier, So Take a Run Around the Block, Buster. <laughs> Billy said it, was lo- said, it st- said it was no good. <laughs> I says, what do you know about music? And he said, why don't I grow up? And I says, after seeing what it did to him, I didn't want to. And he said, I'd be a corny comedian if I was a comedian. And one word led to another. And well, the... hello there, folks. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Just the guy I wanted to see, Junior. What's on your mind, pal? To give you the benefit of a widespread doubt. Well, he's got trouble, Mr. Wilcox. No kidding, Junior. I'm in a hot spot. I'm practically a fidgety from judgment right now. Yeah? <laughs> well, elucidate, chum. Right, huh? Explain it to him, dearie. Oh, well, look, Junior... I'll take the case hyper hypermedically. Now, suppose you borrowed somebody's car, see? Yes. And maybe you marked it, uh, parked it someplace with the motor running. And while you were in a cigar store working on a punch board to win a swell big ashtray that, believe me, I really need. <laughs> and while you were in there, somebody copped the jalopy. You mean to tell me you borrowed somebody's car and then somebody stole it? Whose car was it? Abigail Uppington. Oh, brother. Why, pal, I wouldn't be in your shoes for all the T-bones in Texas. <laughs> She doesn't think any more of that limousine than I do of my right eye. That's my good eye, too. I know, I know. It's a pretty fancy car, all right. Why, I say everything she owns is fancy. She even uses monogram mothballs. <laughs> well, what do I do? What do I do? I got a notice to appear at the police station. You want my advice? Oh, indeed we do, Mr. Wilcox. What do you think I've been telling you all this for? Just to ruin your mascara? <laughs> Well, what you need, my friend, is a couple of good character witnesses. Ha-ha, now we're getting somewhere. Ah, I knew I could depend on you, Junior. Where would a guy be without his friends? Well, there's nothing like a good character witness. The more, the better. Take Johnson's Wax, for instance. Ah, friendship is a beautiful thing. Why, there are thousands of witnesses to the high character of Johnson's Wax. Friendship. And they'd all testify to its time and labor-saving character, to its dependability and quality. Friendship. What a grand old word. Why, when a product has character and quality like Johnson's Wax, it never has to worry about friends to recommend it. Friendship. They all know that Johnson's Wax is the finest thing in the world to protect and preserve floors and furniture and woodwork and enameled surfaces against dust, dampness. Friendship. (laughs) Ah, let me sit by the side of the road in a house and be friendly. (laughs) Say, can you go to the police station with us right now, Mr. Wilcox? Who, me? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I have a very important appointment. Sorry, pal, but you'll find somebody, though. So long, now. How do you do it, dearie? Do what? Inspire such unselfish devotion and loyalty in your friends. They all leap to your aid like a bunch of cast iron deer. Yeah. Like a fleet of ships deserting a sinking raft. Stop it now. You can't talk to you about you like that. 
Well, I'm glad I got one friend, even if it is only my wife. And hey, I know who will vouch for me. Doc Gamble. His office is right down the hall here. That's a wonderful idea, McGee. And I paid his bill only yesterday. Fine. Come on. Hello, McGee. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, Doctor. Hi, Doc. Now, look. Take it snappy, McGee. i got to go out on a call. Mrs. Toops' little boy just swallowed a nickel. Well, maybe he'll get the wrong number and get it back. <laughs> now, look, Doc. McGee's in a jam, Doctor. What's abnormal about that? First time I see him when he's not in trouble, I'll go see a doctor. <laughs> but look, Doc, i got to go to the police station and clear myself, see? They've dragged out the throw net. Thrown out the drag net. <laughs> now, they're after me. And I need a couple of character witnesses, see? How about it, Doc? Will you witness my character? Take off your shirt, McGee. <laughs> <laughs> there you go again. Take off your shirt. Let's go swimming sometime, Doc. I gotta take my shirt off every time I see you anyway. Why does he have to take off his shirt to get you as a character witness, Doctor? Oh, it has nothing to do with that, Mrs. McGee. I want to listen to his heart. He's too excited. I am not excited. I just got a police from the call, and if I don't throw him in jail, they'll show up. I mean, they think I'm crime of a guilty, and I gotta prove down there, and I'll go I'm not. Not right now. <laughs> oh, no. He's not excited. McGee, if you don't learn to calm down and take things easier, you're going to fall right on your face, which will probably improve it. Ah, forget my face, will you? It would make me very happy. Look, Doctor, this is really serious. McGee's got to have somebody to tell the police that he's a reputable citizen. Yeah, come on, Doc. Gee whiz. If a guy can't depend on his family physician, who can a guy depend on? Well, I'm sorry, McGee, but look at this list. Huh? I've got to see a small boy about removing a nickel. Huh? I've got to see a man about getting his thumb out of a bowling ball. <laughs> I've got to see a woman airplane spotter who thinks she sees a stork coming. <laughs> I have to visit a young man who wants some advice about getting married and won't take it when I give it to him. I've got to waste a perfectly good afternoon seeing a dozen assorted darn fools about imaginary ailments... And now you come along and want me to go with you to the police and tell them you're good to your mother. Tell them yourself. I'm busy. Good day. McGee. Huh? Take off your shirt. Huh? I want to cry in it. <laughs> King's men sing, coming in on a wing and a prayer. One of our planes was missing, two hours overdue. One of our planes was missing, with all its gallant crew. The radio sets were humming, we waited for a word. Then a voice broke through the humming, and this is what we heard. McGee. Come on, let's get it over with. Wait a minute, I want to get my story straight in my mind. So you see, Captain, I am perfectly innocent. 
I had permission to use the car, and the only reason I didn't give my right name when I called up was I fell in a coal hole and everything went black. And that's why... Okay, Molly, I got it. Come on. Hi, officer. Can I speak to you a minute? Well, why not? Why not? I'm a public servant, and with servants so hard to get, the public doesn't deserve me. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, No, What is it, No, What is it? Well, he wants to explain about a stolen car, Captain. Not a captain I am, a Kushler. I'm only a sergeant. Due entirely to politics. <laughs> Come, come now. What is it? What is it? What is it? Look, Sarge, I'm Fibber McGee, 79 Wistful Vista. Wait a minute now. Clancy. Yes, Sarge. Uh, take this down in longhand. I can take it down in shorthand. I said take it down in longhand, you Omadon. With longhand, one of us can read it. <laughs> now go ahead, my bio. Uh, let me tell this, McGee. Okay. Look, Captain. Sergeant. Well, <laughs> you ought to be a captain. And who knows it better than me unless it's you, McCushler? Well, get on with it, my morning. Well, in the first place... Be I... quiet, you. Go on, lady. <laughs> well, my husband here borrowed the lady's automobile. Clancy, sir. Take your feet off the desk. This woman is a lady. Uh, mm, yes, sir. <laughs> Go ahead now, Alana. Well, it all started when I... I do Okay. <laughs> Look, my husband borrowed a car from a friend, with permission, of course. I see. I follow her. And he parked it downtown, and whilst he was in a store, somebody stole it. I understand the person was He reported it to the police. I see, and I know who, who, who was the legal owner of the said vehicle now? Mrs. Abigail Uppington. Uppington, is it? Aha, uh-huh. Clancy. Yes, sir. Bring in the thief we caught driving the stolen vehicle. Yes, sir. Are those tickets for the police picnic I see on the desk there, Sergeant? <laughs> McGee, buy a ticket from the sergeant. Huh? Why should I buy the... Oh, 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 oh yeah. <laughs> How much are they, Sarge? A buck a copy, me boy, oh. And you'll understand you're under no compulsion to buy a single one of them, a toilet house. You'll be uh, wanting ten, no doubt. <clears throat> twelve. Twelve? Yes, yeah, twelve. Well, you better make it fifteen. Here you are, Sarge, fifteen bucks. Well, thank you very much. You're a fine public third of the and you are. The Isle of Here she is, Doc. She was driving the stolen car when Fitzpatrick and Goldberg picked her up. Why, this is an outrage. I demand to see a lawyer immediately. Abigail. Abigail. Oh, oh, Mr. McGee, will you tell this? It's public detriment. Exactly who I am. Well, uh, this is Mrs. Uppington, Captain. Uh, the owner of the car my husband borrowed. <gasps> Your husband borrowed that? Oh, so it was Mr. McGee who took my car and left it outside a cigar store with a motor running. Yeah, but look, Uppy, you told me I could take it sometime in an emergency, and there was a swell big ashtray with Roosevelt and Churchill shaking hands. Fancy. And, uh, <laughs> that goes the lady's arm. What's the matter with you? Don't you recognize the rights of a citizen in a taxpayer? No, apologize. The lady, the apologies of the police department. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. And now, Mr. Well, McGee. You see, Abigail, Mr. McGee was merely only trying to get it. Quiet! 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 Oh. Driving me out of my mind. Lady, you can go. I'm sorry for the mistake. Thank you. I realize that you were only doing your duty, officer. But when my legal advisor gets through with this man here, this Mr. McGee, he will be lucky to own the shoestring he started on. <laughs> Well, I guess that's all cleared up. Well, much obliged, Sarge. Yes, thank you very much. But uh, what I want to know is, uh, how did you ever trace my husband? Yeah, I gave the name of Morton Muffin when I reported the car stolen. Well, if you want to know the proof, we didn't trace him. Yeah, but a bailiff came to my door and said to me... He's been going to all the doors, asking people to drop in and buy tickets to the police picnic. Oh. Oh. (laughs) Well, we've done that, too, so everything's taken care of. Come on, McGee. Now, so long, Sergeant. Thanks for... Not so fast, you. Not so fast. Clancy, sir. Uh, Hold this man for driving without a license. Huh? Parking in all parking zone. Uh, leaving his motor running way past. No. And giving a false name to the police. No. Lock him up!
mention Johnson's belt polishing glow coat on this program, nearly every one of you will immediately think of your linoleum floors. And that's not merely because I have told you many times that glow coat is self-polishing, needs no rubbing or buffing, and besides saving you hours of work, also saves your linoleum by making it last longer. It's really because so many of you by now have tried glow coat and found these things out for yourselves. You know how easy glow coat is to apply, how quickly you can wipe up spilled things from a glow coated floor. It's a great convenience to have Johnson's self-polishing glow coat on your shelf in times like these, when you want to take extra good care of your floor surfaces and still save time to devote to essential war activities. Hey, Molly, what'd you tell that cop to let me out of jail? Gee, he shook hands with me and everything. <laughs> you know, it was a funny thing about that, McGee. Huh? We found we were distant relatives. Oh. Sure. His mother was an O'Brien, and, you know, that was my maiden name. It was not. Your maiden name was Driscoll. Well, if you can give the wrong name to get into jail, I guess I can do the same to get you out. <laughs> Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> The character of the old-timer heard on this program was played by Bill Thompson. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This man insult you? No, he hasn't brains enough. Gee, why is it a girl can trim every guy she meets from Frisco to New York, and along comes one guy who kicks her in the pants and she loves it? Why, you fish oh, 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 You silly murderer! Oh. Gunner, when you're here like this, it's roses. You know, I sort of kid myself that you're here for keeps. You're a nice kid, precious. Sweetest in the world. But don't pull that forever and ever stuff on me. No need to worry about that now. Easy, fucker, easy. Pull me up fast. My gloves are slippery. Well, oh, you mustn't fall, Gunner. I want you to fall. Gunner, Gunner! I'm up to get hold of my hands, Gunner. Sweet, Gunner! This is my room. Now get out before I throw you out. Get out! <laughs> I sure hope Jack Benny doesn't mind that Fred Allen is our next show. The Texaco Star Theater. <laughs> More than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast welcome you to an hour of mirth and melody with our star comedian, Fred Allen, Kenny Baker, and Portland Hoffa. Our guest, Mr. Norman Gray, the electric shaver tester, the Martins and Al Goodman's orchestra. It's Texaco time.
lucky thing. He got caught in the rain and found us stuck on the doorstep. On number 10, mother by name, and wasn't it a lucky thing? The man came out to explain that we were just the right people. For number 10, mother by name, he told us we could move right in if we would sign the lease. But when we said the fire and bread, he said he was all told to just sign the peace. So if you're in the neighborhood and you get caught in the rain, you'll find us waiting to greet you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you that Wednesday night merrymaker. Come on, come on, make it fast. That tickler of America's funny bone. We've got a long show. Everybody's favorite. Uh, Just a minute, Mr. Wallington. All right, come in. Pardon me, brother, I gotta test this mic. One, two, three, woof, woof. Hello, Max. One, two, three, woof, woof. Now, Hello, just, Max. Just a minute, just a minute, mister. We're on the air. Don't be too sure, bud. <laughs> That's what I'm here to find out. Oh. One, two, three, woof, woof. Hello, Max. Hey, what is this? Who, uh, who are you? Look, pal, I happen to be assistant chief technician of this network. Oh, so? So I got to make sure you're on the air, don't I? If you're not on the air, it looks bad for the network. Well, I... So uh... I'm checking if you're on the air. One, two, three, woof, woof. Hello, Max. Look, look, tell me one thing, will you? How can you tell by woof woofing and yelling hello, Max, if I am on the air? Why, it's simple. Out in Jersey on the 16th floor of our transmitter tower sits Max. And who is Max? Max is only the chief technician of the whole network, that's all. Oh. Yeah, Max is sitting in front of a radio. If he hears me, you're on the air. Well, how can you tell if Max hears you? Max will ring up and tell me. Oh, I... Then you go right ahead. One, two, three, woof, woof. Hello, Max. Say, Fred, while we're waiting for Max's call, do you mind if I finish introducing you? I've got to get away. Now, go ahead, Jimmy. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is. Hold it. That's for me. (laughs) Hello, Max. Oh, you didn't, huh? Okay, I'll try again. Huh? What, the last race? Yeah, it was Little Caporis by four legs. (laughs) No, I don't know what he paid. So long, Max. That was Max? Yeah, he didn't hear me. Oh. Three, four, four. Hello, Max. Now, just a minute, please. My knowledge of radio mechanics may be limited, but there must be another way of finding out whether or not we are on the air. Can't we just call up Jack Benny's writers? <laughs> Look, brother, you're on the air when Max says you are. Oh, and until then... It's one, two, three, four, four. Hello, Max. Look, Chow, now, two minutes ago, three vice presidents gave me their personal signals. Four technicians threw in switches. Five lights went on saying we're on the air. But, pal, we're not getting nowhere. It's too hot in here to argue. It's too cold outside to pick it. So? So? One, two, three, four, four. Hello, Max. Hi, fellas. What's going on? What isn't going on, Kenny? Woof, woof. Hello, Max. Woof, woof. Who's this guy with the dog talk? Oh, he's a big technician. He's trying to find out if we're on the air. Oh, one, two, three, woof, woof. Hello, Max. Oh, I'll get it. Hello, Max. Oh, you still can't hear, huh? Has he got his radio plugged in? Quiet, Stope. <laughs> no, not you, Max. <laughs> Some jerk here just asked if you got your radio plugged in. Oh. Well, plug it in, Max. <laughs> Now, pardon me, pardon me, Edison. Can't you just call up... (laughs) Can't you just call up somebody outside who has a radio and ask them if they can hear us? Listen, Dope, Max is a graduate of five technical institutes. Uh? Fifteen years, Max has been studying frequency modulation. Uh Twelve diplomas Max has got for majoring in short waves. So what? So you want to take a layman's word against Max's. (laughs) I'm laughing. But now, wait a minute. Please. One, two, three, four, four. Oh, this is it. Hello, Max. Oh, you still can't hear, huh? Well, look, maybe an N52FDX shorted in the VIM condenser, huh? Has he got his radio turned on? Look, buddy. <laughs> hey, Max, that lunk here just said... Hey, Max, you know that little dial under the window of your radio? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the window with the numbers of the stations on it. Well, on one side of the dial it says off, and on the other side it says on. Now, to which side is it pointing? Oh. Well, turn it to on. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Max. Hey, Max, what are you yelling about? Stop being so jumpy. 
When you turn the dial, a light always goes on in the window. <laughs> sure. Okay, here I go again. Gee, I don't... Poor Max. The responsibility of the job is ruining his nerves. One, two, three, woof, woof. Hello, Max. Thank heavens Marconi didn't live to see this. <laughs> this is it for dope. Hello, Max. You heard it? Great work, Max. See you later. Well? You're on the air. <laughs> Wallington. And here he is, Fred Allen, in person. Well, that was... Oh, that was... Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's too bad to have you applaud, uh, applaud so frequently there. I was going to use that other reception, make it do for this, but of course, if you're in the mood. And now, before anybody else can say, one, two, three, woof, woof, hello, Max, we turn to the brief, to a brief resume of the latest news of the week. The Texaco News presents a few brisk highlights from the world of news. Bear Mountain, New York, a peculiar animal, a member of the deer family, is added to the zoological collection at Trailside Museum in Bear Mountain Park. Unusual quadruped found grazing at roadside baffles zoo curator and New York mammal authorities who have been asked to identify this ruminant freak. Texaco News interviews Ranger, who found the forest monstrosity, to get the species lowdown for all America. Presenting then, Mr. Buford Hike. Just what is your job, Buford? Uh, I'm a forest ranger ranging out at Bear Mountain. Oh, I see. Well, what about this unusual animal you caught up there, Buford? Never seen a critter like it. Uh, you don't say. Can you describe it for us? No living man can describe that nature's mess. Well, you can give us an idea. What was it like? Well, sir, from a distance, it looked like a jumbo mouse. A jumbo mouse? Yeah, it was huh? albino colored with dirty brown spots on it. Uh-huh. Looked like somebody had shot at it with a water pistol full of peanut butter and missed. <laughs> it was from a distance. Well, how did it look close to? Well, the head was that of a stunted otter. A stunted otter? Yep. Huh? Out of the forehead hung two caribou ears. Yeah. It had a short beaver neck with no Adam's apple. The body, the body was a cross between a big mongoose and a bandicoot. Well, how about the, how about the legs? The gall darn thing had three antelope legs, and the fourth leg was a puma paw. The fourth leg, really? And hanging down in the back was no tail. Hanging in the back. <laughs> what, uh... What did you do when you uh, had caught it, Buford? Well, I took it straight off to the zoo and set it down in front of the curator. And what was the curator's reaction? He took one look at the thing, jumped up, and said, The man who caught that's a liar. Louisville, Illinois, wife of Clay County farmer, presents proud father with twins weighing 22 pounds. Case called unique in authenticated medical annals arouses nationwide interest. Texaco News interviews neighbor of the happy mother to check on the giant twins. Presenting Mrs. Wilkie Snipe. You know about the twins, Mrs. Snipe? Yep, they sure are bulky babies, all right. You've actually seen them? I was there when the stork come. And the twins weighed 22 pounds? Yep, the stork had four eagles helping him. <laughs> and a sparrow. A sparrow? Uh, the sparrow was carrying the safety pins. Oh, I... <laughs> Beaumont, Texas. Innovation in boat launching technique proves great success at local shipyards. New cargo boat, the Cape Lookout, is launched with bananas instead of customary ship grease. Texaco News grills maritime authority to learn if the banana is to revolutionize all future launchings. Presenting Captain Squall. Heave ho, mate. Well, you can drop your anchor there any place, Captain. I made it will. I just missed your foot. You're lucky, aren't you? Well, tell me, Captain, do you think the banana will replace the outmoded uh, grease at ship launchings? Lost my boon. If the banana ain't put the skids under grease, for good. Well, how did bananas work out when you launched the Cape Lookout at Beaumont last week? Well, sir, heave to, and I'll tell you. Fine, I shall. We took 7,000 pounds of ripe, juicy bananas. I see. We squished them up and... Spread this goo all over the hull. Yeah? As soon as the boat was bananaed, well gooed from proud astern, I gave the signal. And? The 400 men who was holding the boat let go. That's all, brother. The banana? <laughs> the, the banana is making a big difference in Beaumont shipyards, I imagine. Yes, yeah, sir. When you see a man in Beaumont with a banana today... Yes? Nobody knows if he's going out to lunch or out to launch. <laughs> 
New York City, that's all, brother. New York City, New York, the latest smash hit show to open on Broadway is Morse Hart's musical play starring Miss Gertrude Lawrence called Lady in the Dark. Critics strain at their adjectives praising show and individual performances, and showmen predict Lady in the Dark will run a year. Texaco News brings you a digest version of this new hit show, Lady in the Dark. Lady in the Dark. Oh, Mr. Bascom, really? <laughs> Gentlemen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Baker comes from out of the nowhere into your ear, and the title of Kenny's song is based on a remark Gilbert made the first time he met Sullivan. Gilbert said, we could make such beautiful music together. <laughs> that good enough to get a sled? What do you mean, a sled? Dennis Day's going to get a sled. Jack Bernie's going to give him one. Oh, I don't believe that. All right, look at this letter I just got from Dennis. Read what it says right down there at the bottom. Mr. Benny likes my singing so much, he is going to give me a present. He has promised me that the next time it snows in Hollywood, he, he will get an old grapefruit crate and build me a sled. Boy, is that generosity. All right, Kenny, I refuse to be outdone. If it snows in Hollywood, and if Mr. Benny builds Dennis a grapefruit crate sled, I personally will buy you the largest size flexible flyer that's made. Gee, a flexible flyer. Uh -huh. That's a whole lot better than a grapefruit crate. Oh, yes, Kenny. On this program, we appreciate the importance of flexibility, and that's because we have Larry Elliott to point it out to us. Do you mind pointing again, Larry? Now, people who drive a car north of the freezing line, and that takes in most of the country this time of year, are called upon for driving skill that's flexible enough to match snow, ice, and uncertain weather conditions. And that sort of driving demands flexible power from a gasoline, too. The kind of surging, constant, yet flexible power supplied by Sky Chief. 
Texaco's different premium gasoline. Yes, that's what you really want for winter driving. Then you know you're in control. Whether you're crawling through traffic at four miles or cruising the highway at 40, that feeling of Sky Chief power underfoot adds to your confidence. It takes hold quickly, gets you rolling fast. Your car responds to your every demand quietly and smoothly. Fly the highways with Sky Chief, your Texaco dealer's premium gasoline for those who want the best. Maestro Goodman and his ensemble have just played Dark Eyes from Mr. Goodman's optical condition of the same name. And now, ladies and... Mr. Allen! Oh, hello, Portland. Good. Can we use your microphone a minute? We? Yes. There's a lady outside, and she's all unstrung. Really? Uh-huh. Well, string her and bring her in. <laughs> you can come in, Miss. Thank you. Uh, what is it you want, madam? I have got to get to a microphone. It is urgent. Urgent? I have a message that will turn radio into a hive of futility. Well, I do. My message will cause every swing band in radio to give itself up. No kidding. My message will force every radio tenor to quit. And you want to use my microphone for this devastating announcement? If I may. All right. I shall present you. Ladies and gentlemen, stand by for a very important message. Go ahead, madam. I have just had a henna rinse. That is all? That is all. You say every swing band will give itself up, every radio tenor will have to quit because you have had a henna rinse? Who are you, lady? I was formerly Jeannie with the light brown hair. <laughs> now, look. Look for... <laughs> Standing right next to me, and I didn't recognize her. I should, have, I should have at least placed her by ear, if by not by eye. Now look, Portland. The next time you come in here, I suggest that you emulate the bee. The bee? Yes. When the bee goes any place, he leaves his wax outside. Now you keep bringing these wax in here. What's the wax? Well, ask your mother. She raised enough of them. You know, there are more wax in your family than there are in a spanking. Do you know how many... Oh, I had another line there, didn't I? <laughs> you, mean, you won't go ahead, huh? You are, do, you, uh, do, you, uh, do you know how many wax there are in a spanking? Nobody knows. You can't see to count them. Why can't you? Because your back is always turned. Uh... <laughs> 
Goodbye, Portland. <laughs> Am I going? Yes, you are. But before you go, introduce our guest, Major Bowes, Amateur of the Month. But Major Bowes Week is next week. Oh, this isn't Major Bowes Week, is it? That's right. Well, that's right. Well, who is our guest tonight? He's the most shaved man in the world. The most shaved man? Yes. He shaves 20 times a day, and yet he's never completely shaved. Well, who is this hirsute phenomenon, Portland? He's the head electric shaver tester for the Schick Shaver Company, Mr. Norman Gray. Well, good evening, Mr. Gray. Good evening, Fred. Now, Portland tells me, Mr. Gray, that you, from the neck up, are the official proving ground for the Schick Shaver Company. That's right, Fred. Uh, and your job demands that you keep shaving all day long? Yes, Fred. I test three different sorts of electric shavers. The present Schick model, experimental new models, and the models that our competitors are putting out. Well, I guess you're pretty happy after testing a competitor shaver... If you can rush into the front office with part of your jowl gone and shout, hooray, at gougers, <laughs> unquote. But uh, tell me, Mr. Gray, I don't remember seeing the electric shaver invented in Edison the Boy or Edison the Man. Did uh, Don Amici work it out in some other picture? <laughs> no, Fred. Colonel Schick invented the electric shaver back in 1930. Well, how come? Did he have a heavy beard and a lot of old kilowatts he didn't know what to do with? No. Colonel Schick was up in Alaska with the U.S. Army. It was too cold to shave with soap and water, so the colonel thought a dry shave would solve the problem. He worked on the idea and finally brought out the first electric shaver. Proving once again that necessity is the, uh, the, uh, you know, of the, what's this? Well, what is the, uh, what is the principle of the chop tractor, Mr. Gray? It's quite simple, Fred. The electric shaver consists of two slotted sheets of steel. One fixed and one moving. Well, how is the potential goatee guillotine? As the shaver moves along the face, the hairs are guided into tiny slots where they are sheared off by the inside shearing head that moves back and forth. Well, that accounts for the subdued humming, the obligato most shavers give out with each once over lightly. Yes, it's caused by the speed of the machine. The inside shearing head makes more than 14,000 cutting motions a minute. 14,000? Well, that's almost as fast as my scenes were cut out of a certain moving picture. <laughs> by, uh, by a certain semi-bald comedian who broke into the studio and cut by candlelight at midnight. <laughs> but excuse me, Mr. Gray, in a discussion that concerns hair, this party's name, of course, is entirely out of place. I understand, Fred. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Now tell me, how long has your face been giving its all to these chin landscapers? I've been doing this work for six years. Well, why has your face been singled out for testing? Are you just uh, razogenic? Have your bristles got that uh, old AC and DC appeal? <laughs> no. My job is testing shavers, Fred. I have to use somebody's face, and my face is the handiest. Uh-huh. Well, suppose you have a busy day and use up your own face completely. You have it shaved as smooth as a seal's hip. Now, how do you... <laughs> I'm speaking from memory. I haven't seal, uh, seen a seal for years, honestly. Sir. But now, now, you've shaved your face smooth. Now, how do you get some whiskers in a hurry? You send out an SOS for Paul Muni, or uh, whom do you get? There are 12 assistant engineers whose faces I use occasionally. Oh, they always have a little fuzz on tap, huh? <laughs> yes, uh, these men are all instructed to come to work unshaven. Fred. But tell me, how many shavers do you test in a day? I may have to shave 20 times during the day. Gosh, I don't know how you do it. Unless you come to work with a long face, of course. <laughs> that isn't necessary, Fred. I never shave my entire face at one time. I only use a small square patch for each test. In other words, you are shaving constantly from morning to night, and yet you are never completely shaved. That's right. Well, yours is the only life I know of where it's uh, a case of hair today and hair tomorrow, too, Mr. Gray. <laughs> But about your 12 fur-bearing assistants, do you, do you use their faces every day or only when your own chin fodder is getting low? I use them all the time, Fred. My face is useless for some experiments. Why is that? Well, all beards and all skins aren't alike. And we must be sure that our shavers are suited to all beards. 
I have the faces I work on classified into many types. Well, would you say uh, my face fitted uh, into any of your categories? Don't look at it all at once. It'll undo you. <laughs> <laughs> Just take a side slant, Mr. <laughs> Would you say that my face fitted into any of your categories, Mr. Gray? Yes. At a glance, I would say your skin is the sensitive type. Really? Well, it may look sensitive, but after nine years in radio, Mr. Gray, I have the skin of a $2 suitcase. <laughs> Well, it's been nice of you to stop by this evening and tell us how we can keep chic and span and to give us the lowdown on your almost unique occupation. I guess you and Mickey Rooney are the only ones who can boast of similar careers. I don't see the connection, Fred. Well, Mickey Rooney also makes a good living, Mr. Gray. And like you, Mickey is nothing but a perennial shaver. Wow. Good night, Fred. <laughs> good night and thank you. It's been all good. Ladies and gentlemen, the Martins rehearse a song they're preparing for all folks who are receiving their income tax blanks these days. The Martin song is Cheer Up. Anybody here seen anything of a locomotive? <laughs> a large locomotive with clouds of smoke simply swishing out. <laughs> a locomotive? Well, what do you want? Well, I am Rembrandt Van Twerp, the artist. Yeah. You see, I've been commissioned to paint a picture of a locomotive roaring along with smoke, beautiful smoke, <laughs> just pouring from its stack. Well, can't you borrow a locomotive from one of the railroad companies? Well, I've tried them all. They only have those diesels and electric locomotives. I've got to find a locomotive with smoke coming out. Well, I'm sure uh, we... I don't think we have one. I'm sure we haven't one around here, but I am positive, uh, Rembrandt, that if anybody, anybody listening in... Uh, has such a locomotive, they'll be very happy to lend it to you. Just as anyone who has an automobile will gladly lend an ear to Jimmy Wallington. It's a thrilling sight to see a locomotive roaring along the tracks with its smoke trailing in the air. But when you're driving behind a car with a smoky exhaust, that smoke can mean trouble. For when a car smokes, the chances are it's due to excessive engine wear. Then a costly repair job is the only sure cure. 
So before your car becomes a smoker, help safeguard your engine against these three sources of wear that so often make cars smoke. Wear due to heat, wear due to cold, and wear due to oil impurities. Change now to insulated Haviland to help avoid the grinding wear of cold starts. For this motor oil flows freely at low temperatures. It stands up too under extreme engine heat, which can break down ordinary oils and accelerate wear. Insulated Haviland is also distilled. Carbon-forming impurities are removed. Remember, your car was never designed to smoke. Change now to Insulated Haviland at your Texaco dealer. Help reduce excessive wear in your motor. Mexico Star Theater continues immediately after a short pause for your station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York. That was Keep an Eye on Your Heart, played by <laughs> one rabid music lover. He started to applaud Mr. Goodman, but I put him down there. Mr. Goodman and... <laughs> gosh, the actors don't know what they're doing. They're applauding each other here. <laughs> that was Keep an Eye on Your Heart, if possible. I don't know how you do it, but it says here, played by Mr. Goodman and his gas pump philharmonic. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Mr. Allen! Uh, who is it? It is I, Goodman, excusing the interruption. Well, what, uh, what's on your mind, maestro? Forty cents from you I'd like to collect. Well, I don't owe you forty cents. Forty cents to Kenny Baker I am lending, against his salary and my good judgment. Well, I am not advancing any more money out of Kenny's salary to anyone. Now, you go find Mr. Baker and collect from him direct. To collect forty cents, I should rent a bloodhound? Uh, I don't care if you hire a retriever. I should get a Sam Bernard, maybe? Uh, I don't... You'll knock a poor little dog down leaning on it like that. <laughs> get a Sam Bernard? I don't care if you get a singing Sam. You shouldn't have given Kenny the money in the first place. I have a good mind not to let him in. Well, all right. Come in. Is this a Texaco Star Theater? Yes. I got two pounds of sugar here for the star. Well, I didn't know... A order. fellow by the name of Baker. Oh, of course, of course. For a second, I forgot my place. Uh, Ching number two, boy. You'll, uh, I tell you, son, you'll probably find the star, Mr. Baker, the star backstage. Thanks. Come in. I'm from the AMP with the COD. Uh, <laughs> now, if you're talking in code, mister... I got four unsqueezed oranges here for Kenny Baker, COD 15 cents. Well, just follow that other boy, the, and the sooner the better. He delivering something to Baker, too? Yes, sugar. Thanks, honey. Uh, <laughs> well, now I've been called everything, I guess. <laughs> Mr. Goodman, I'm afraid that's where your 40 cents is gone. Sugar and oranges. Who paid for the honey? The... <laughs> the honey was on me. I wonder what Kenny's doing with sugar and oranges. Mr. Allen! Oh, yes, Portland. Have you got a ball of twine? No, I haven't. And I always have a ball of twine with me, too. I, I have buck teeth, and I use it for dental floss. But just... <laughs> Just tonight. Say, say, what do you want with twine? Well, I've got to hang up this sign. What sign? It's for Kenny's orange juice stand. What does it say? If Mr. Allen's jokes are dry, Kenny's orange juice you should try. Uh, there was a pip in the title there, wasn't there? You tipped your tongue up on it. Well, what is this? Does Kenny think he's going to sell orange juice in here while the program's going on? Hey, Porty. Yes, Kenny? Did you hang up my sign? Well, I haven't any string. Where do you think you're going to hang that sign, Kenny? Well, Mr. Goodman is always standing with his back to the audience. If I can rent his back, I can hang it there. Watch this. Goodman's back is getting a commercial. <laughs> Never mind that. Kenny, 
You can't sell orange juice during the program. Why not? I'm all set. I've got the sugar and four oranges. Four oranges? There are 1,300 people here in the studio. Now, suppose they all want juice. Don't worry, F.A. I've got a formula. Oh, I'll answer it. Hello. What? Gosh. Who is it, Portland? The water department. They say there's a leak here. A leak? There's 150 gallons of water missing. It's the wrong number. Hang up, Porty. Kenny, something tells me you know about this H2O. What's H2O got to do with water? Portland, tell the water department that we have discovered the leak. All right. Tell them it was caused by a little drip. (laughs) Now, listen, listen, Neptune Baker... Where did you get this formula? Four oranges and 150 gallons of water. But that's all a tank at hold, F.A. What tank? That big one backstage. You know, the one they used to use for sound effects in a showboat program. Well, I thought Captain Henry was living in there waiting for a sponsor. <laughs> you used that one. Well, Kenny, you can't sell that over-diluted uh, bilge for orange juice. You think I use too much water? No, you're just one orange short, that's all. (laughs) Okay, I'll fix it. Mr. Analick, throw in a tangerine. Kenny, who is out there? That's Mr. Analick, my partner. Yes, Mr. Analick is sitting on the edge of the tank, stirring the orange juice with a ladle. That's no ladle, that's my fife. Mr. Goodman, please. Why didn't you put the Sam Bernard in there? Now, that's where you... <laughs> Kenny, how did this fellow Analick put you up to this mock orange juice business? Mr. Analick is an expert on water. What was that splash? Gosh, it's Mr. Analick. He fell in the tank. In the orange juice? Ah, it's okay. He's wearing water wings. But... <laughs> but your orange juice will taste of Analick. Foxy Kenny. A new flavor he's inventing. <laughs> Portland, will you go help Mr. Analick out, please? Sure, Kenny. Kenny, how did you get mixed up with this liquid lumpkin, Analick? Well, I met Mr. Analick at the battery. We were looking out at the ocean. Mr. Analick was skinning an orange. Yeah? He pointed out at the water and said, With this orange and that water, we can make a fortune. And then what happened? Then Mr. Analick asked me how much money I had. And you told him? I said I knew where there was 40 cents. From then on... From then on, I, Goodman, was a marked man. Now, you keep out of this, Maestro. Kenny, you'd better get rid of this Analick. Well, everything's all right, Kenny. Did you get Mr. Analick out of the tank, Porty? Uh-huh. He's back on the job, dripping but stirring. What, uh, <laughs> What took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Analick was diving for his cigar. Well... <laughs> But the minute Analick is dry, he's getting out of Please, here. Please, F.A., Mr. Analick is very sensitive. I don't care if Mr. Analick... Mr. Analick is in again. And it's your fault, F.A. Oh, I'd better help him out again. What is Analick doing again? <laughs> Trying to commit citrus suicide? <laughs> Kenny, you will never sell a glass of that stuff after what people have just heard. But Mr. Analick says if we get one stand started, we can float alone. Analick already is floating alone. (laughs) In the orange juice. How do you know? He he didn't get a laugh with... (laughs) with two sentences, so he breaks the sentences up and gets laughed. No, no, I mean float alone in the bank. Oh, The bank, he says. My brother-in-law used to work in a bank. What happened? What always happened? Again, they caught him. (laughs) I should have known. Mr. Analick is out again, Kenny. How are things going? Oh, fine. Mr. Analick is wheeling the tank outside to chill the orange juice. Oh, boy, we're ready for business. Mr. Goodman, I have great news for you. I'll settle for 30 cents. Because you loaned me the money to get started at only 8%, I'm going to show you my appreciation. I'll sell, settle for 20 cents. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do for Mr. Goodman, Kenny? 
I'm going to let Mr. Goodman drink the first glass of Baker Adley's orange juice free of charge. I'll settle for a bromo seltzer. I'll be right back. Look, if you drink that orange juice, when he talks with a dialect, he speaks straight, you see. That's what I <laughs> Look, if Maestro... If you drink that orange juice, Maestro, you will settle for the Mayo Clinic. It can't be so bad, Mr. Goodman. After all, it has four oranges and sugar. And 150 gallons of water. <laughs> and analog. Delicious. <laughs> I'm going to put a stop to this thing. Effie, hey, hey, have you got an ice pick? Uh, what, what happened out there? The orange juice froze. <laughs> well, let Mr. Analic worry about it. He is worrying. He's frozen in it. <laughs> What? Up to his neck. Is Mr. Anlick in solid? Not with me, he isn't. And now that your assets are frozen, Kenny, you're out of business. You'd better forget the whole thing. Well, all right, F.A. Here's your 40 cents back again, Mr. Goodman. Kenny, where did you get that 40 cents? From four kids outside. I'm charging them 10 cents apiece to play hockey on the orange juice. <laughs> did Mr. Anlick okay the deal? He's too busy. The kids are using his head for a puck. <laughs> For the first time in his life, Analik is using his head. <laughs> now, wait a minute. You can't say that about my ex-partner. Mr. Analik's dearer to me than my own brother. Gee, Kenny, your own brother? My own brother. That's for me. Come in. Hello, Joe. Hello, Kenny. Joe, are you dearer to me than Mr. Analik? No. So long, Joe. So long, Kenny. Uh, that was your own brother. That's funny. What's funny? I haven't got a brother. Well, this is a fine time to bring it up. Now, go ahead and sing your song. Oh, I just remembered, Mr. Allen. What? I've got a sister. Oh, now, look, Kenny. I should have said Mr. Anlick is dearer to me than my own sister. Your own sister? My own sister. Come in. Hello, Mabel. Hello. Mabel, are you as dear to me as Mr. Anlick? No. So long, Mabel. So long. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Kenny Baker's own sister. And now, Kenny... But, Mr. Allen, my sister is a blonde. Mr. Goodman, will you please stop the Her music? name isn't Mabel. It's Yvonne. Mr. Goodman, will you start your hurdy-gurdy outfit, please? <laughs> Near Paris, where life is gay and free, a bright and airy dance you will always see. I'm French as French can be, and it is plain to see. I love romance and glee, and they're always free. Girls wink and dance like toys, throwing kisses to the boys. Ride and whirl just like coquettes, they are free from all regrets. As for the happy crowd, they all sing fa la la, dancing, whirling all night long, they sing this happy song. Come in, my friends, and see our dancing in Paris. La 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 la. For life is gay, so sing and dance. La la la. La 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 la. Come in, my friends, and see our dancing in Paris. La la la.
come in my friends and see Our dancing in Paris La 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 Oh life is gay so sing and dance La 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 Come in my friends and see Our dancing in Paris La 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 For oh, life is gay so sing and dance La 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 Just completed a Neapolitan medley. And now our special quiz program, ladies and gentlemen, Fake It or Believe It. And here's our first contestant, this young lady right here. What is your name, miss? Petonia Sludge. Uh, <laughs> and uh, your occupation, Miss Sludge? I work in a freak show. I'm two of the legs of the four-legged girl. Uh, well, all right, Miss Sludge. Uh, <laughs> uh, here is your first question. What word of three letters stands for a sluggish, lifeless element? Three letters, and it stands for a sluggish, lifeless element. Uh-uh. No cueing from the audience, please. <laughs> now, let's have one of that. Uh, come, come, Miss Sludge. What is the word? A sluggish, lifeless element in uh, three letters. I got it. Fine. What is it? Man. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, Miss Sludge, the word is dud. D-U-D, dud. What's a dud? Well, for further details, I refer you to Dr. James Wallington, M.D., Master of Duds. Duds cause a lot of trouble at this time of the year, don't they, Dr. Wallington? Indeed they do, Dr. Allen. Now is the time of the year when duds, the sluggish, lifeless elements in gasoline, get in their deadliest work. Duds slow up your motor's response in any weather. But when it's cold... When your engine depends on just a few ounces of chilled gasoline in your carburetor, those duds can hold up starting action, can put a serious extra burden on your battery. Now, with Texaco Fire Chief, you can be sure you're not getting duds. They're out, completely removed by an important step in Texaco refining. That's what's behind those speedy Fire Chief starts. It's smooth pickup and fast warm-up. For in Fire Chief, you get only the lively, responsive elements in gasoline. The ones that vaporize quickly, fire evenly, and give full economical power. Try a Texaco dealer and fire chief. There's not a dud in a tank full. And now the Texaco workshop players. Tonight they take cognizance of the recent cold snap that gripped the country. While severe snowstorms harassed the east and middle west, Southern areas gloated over tropical weather it was enjoying. Uh, Southern area gloated over... I had too much south in there. I felt the place heat up there. Southern area gloated... uh, Thank you. Three men from Dixie. Thank you very much. Well, (laughs) severe... No, you can't read it. I defy anybody to read it. While severe snowstorms harassed the east and middle west, southern area gloated over tropical weather it was enjoying. Flashes from the swanky winter resorts all told the same story. Miami and Beach enjoying banner season. Mrs. Biddle Diddle has open house. Palm Beach enjoying banner season. Mrs. Biddle Diddle Biddle has open house. Bermuda enjoys banner season. Mrs. Biddle Diddle Diddle Biddle has open house. (laughs) And so for the benefit of the plain folks who haven't a biddle to their names, no biddle name... For you, for you in the colder vicinities who are unable to flee Jack Frost and take to a warmer climb, tonight we present a stay-at-home's cruise. Lean back in your lumpy Morris chairs, folks. Forget the wintry wind and the nippy nonce. Join us on an imaginary jaunt to the gayest winter resort of them all, colorful tropical Havana. Music, Alfredo. <laughs> Havana, glamorous city of palm trees, coconuts, and eternal sunshine. As our boat, the SS Perfidia, glides into the picturesque harbor, a lady tourist turns to the captain and says, Is this the harbor, Captain? Sea, si, lady, sea. Si. It's the sea, Merwin. I told you. <laughs> As the SS Perfidia docks, and we stop at the customs shed, we find that most of the natives here speak Spanish. 
Many tourists have difficulty with this foreign tongue. We watch the couple of head of us as they prepare for the usual customs inspection. Open up the bags, Harvey. Here comes the inspector. Uh, okay, Bueller. Dispense me, senor. Americano? America. Oh, yeah. We're Americans from New York. The Bronx. Don't be so specific, Bueller. We're from New York. <laughs> si, senor. Se hace siempre el camino de tobacco? Huh? I guess he means our luggage, Harvey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everything's here, bud. Uh, se hace siempre el camino de tobacco. Ah, uh, Camino de Tobacco, Camino de Tobacco. Oh, tobacco. Si. He means are we sneaking in any tobacco? Tobacco, si, senor. No, no, I ain't got none. I don't smoke. I'm a coffee drinker. Se hace siempre el Camino de Tobacco. That's what he said before, Harvey. This bum's got a one crack mind. <laughs> se hace siempre el Camino de Tobacco. Oh, he's getting mad, Harvey. Look, fella, we ain't got no tobacco. Who said tobacco? Hey, hey, let go of my wind pressure, you know. Lucia, Camino de Tobacco. Camino de Tobacco. Thank heavens, here's a cop, Harvey. Si, yeah. senora, what is the trouble? <laughs> what? It's this customs guy, that's what. He's men- menacing us in Spanish. Camino de Tobacco, Tobacco. Yeah, yeah, he thinks we're smuggling tobacco. I will I really find out the trouble. Te quiero usted decir? Americanos, Bronx. Si hace siempre el camino de tobacco. Ah, si, si. The custom man, he see you are from New York. He ask a simple question. About uh, bringing in tobacco? No, no. He say, in New York, is tobacco road still running? <laughs> From the customs house, we proceed to the Prado, a main thoroughfare of Havana. The Prado is a gathering place for tourists. English-speaking guides tug at our mess jackets, inviting us to take their tours. One guide grasps us firmly by the nub of our trousers. And so then we decide to sample his jaunt. The tour is just to... The tour is just about to leave. Now, okay, folks, the tour is just starting. Keep your eyes peeled and your Kodak's cocked, folks. I'll tell this native chauffeur to, uh, to give it the gas. Miguel. Si, senor. Pronto, El Texico. Si, senor. Now, we're off, folks. And to your left, you see Havana's waterfront. Deep sea fishing is the second largest industry in Cuba. What's the first? Digging bait. <laughs> That sailboat yonder is a fishing party. Don't they use hooks and lines, guys? No, lady. The natives use only their native pipes. Listen. Hey, hey, those are pitch pipes, ain't they? That's right. What kind of fish can they catch with pitch pipes? Tuna, lady. <laughs> Here on your... uh, look, guide. What are those native boys diving for? They're diving for money, bud. But they keep coming up with those slips of white paper. Things is tough. They're diving for (laughs) I.O.U. Now, over on your right, you see them beautiful trees. At this time of year, you can even hear the trees whispering in the breeze. Listen. March 7th. April 1st. June 14th. What kind of trees are those, guy? Them are date palms making their dates, mister. (laughs) This is their making season. Now, straight ahead in that river, folks, is one of Havana's famous hat-making plants. Twenty natives are busy making straw hats. I say, where is everybody? All I can see is the river. See, where did you get on, mister? (laughs) (laughs) The natives weave them Panama hats right in the river, brother. They're all busy right now, working underwater. I'll greet them. Hi, boys. <laughs> and now, folks, in concluding with our tour, we come to the Capitol building in the heart of Havana, modeled after the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. The door of the Capitol is open. You can hear the Parliament in session. I make motion, eight billion centimos, ancient oro. I second the motion, eight billion centimos, ancient oro. The bill is carry eight billion centimos, ancient oro. Eight billion? Are they voting on a project, guide? No, lady, eight billion centimos is 15 cents. <laughs> what is that, ancient oro? Old gold. Parliament is sending out for cigarettes. <laughs> Back from our sightseeing tour, we join a small party about to take a trip through one of Havana's famous sugar plantations. 
As we enter the grounds, we hear the native sugar billies singing as they work in the fields. We stop to listen to the sugar billies. Hand me down my sugar cane. Oh, hand me down my sugar cane. You can keep your sorghum, keep your beet, keep your glucose, though it's sweet. Just hand me down my sugar. Oh, 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 hand me down my sugar. We hand the sugar billies down their sugar cane to shut them up and turn to gaze in sticky awe at the great refining plant. We spend a pleasant hour watching the sugar granulators granulating and the sugar lumpers lumping. <laughs> and we leave the plantation just as the sugar auctioneer mounts his stand to start calling his popular sugar auctioneer's chant. Sweet sugar! <laughs> Sold it saccharine. And so, leaving the sugar plantation with sweet memories, we plod our weary way back to town. As the fiery tropical sun plops into the placid briny slop, we scurry to the cattle boat that waits to bring us back over the bulloway sea. Standing on the gangplank with our porter, we turn for a fond last look at the waving date trees. But near at hand, we notice two waving palms. And a voice from above these palms cries out, Cheap skato americano, no tip old porter, old dog gone. And with the red cap fuming in the sunset, we say, Buenas, watch this, and funnel trunk manana to dear old Havana. <laughs> And now for Mr. Larry Elliott, a message of great importance to the music lovers of this entire Western Hemisphere. This Saturday afternoon, two of the most popular gems of the opera world, Pagliacci and Cavalleria Rusticana, will both be broadcast in the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. In the cast, you will hear two young American-born winners of the Sherwin-Williams Metropolitan Auditions of the Air, Anna Kaskis and Leonard Warren. Pagliacci and Cavalleria Rusticana will be the ninth Metropolitan Opera Saturday matinee Sponsored by the Texas Company, over another network of 211 stations reaching the entire Western Hemisphere. During intermissions, there will be the Opera Question Forum with Milton Cross and a curtain talk on our American way of living by Mrs. Sadie Orr Dunbar, President of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight. And don't forget, join the all-American fight against infantile paralysis. Support the President's birthday celebration in your community. Give a dime or a dollar, but give. This is Fred Allen saying good night for the more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Eventually the babies grow up and meet other babies. And they fall in love, and get married and have babies, and so on and on. I don't know how to explain, but a wedding, a church wedding. Well, it's, it's what every girl dreams of. A bridal dress, the orange blossoms, the music. It's something lovely to remember all the rest of her life. And something for us to remember, too. At my I, wedding and my friends. I don't understand. What did you mean by No, no one has to do anything. When the time comes, I'll do everything. I mean everything. I can oh, I wouldn't go to a wedding now. I'll be a baby. Now, look. I don't care what you do. 
money. What over way? Now look here, young man. If you insist upon a church wedding, you can count me out. I wash my hands of the whole affair. <laughs> Now it is time to go back to Dodge City with gun smoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Cigar, Miss Kitty? You know I don't smoke in public, Chester. Oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Dillon? Uh, thanks, Chester. Yeah, I believe I will. You know, for a Cowtown restaurant, this place serves the toughest steak I ever ate. Oh, <laughs> well, you should have had the calf fries, Kitty. Oh, next time, I certainly will. Hey, that reminds me. When are we going fishing, Mr. Dillon? You said last... Gun smoke. <laughs> Sure. Do you want to go, Kitty? Oh, thanks, Matt, but there's a new girl at the Texas Trail. I told her I'd help her make a dress today. I'm late now. Huh? Well, I'll have to drop by the office first, Chester. All right. Uh, if you want any help eating those fish, let me know. You know how to cook catfish? You bet I do. We'll be around then. Hey, Mr. Dillon, look at those men down there by the jail. Huh? Now, what's so curious about a wagon load of buffalo hides, I wonder? Yeah, maybe they got a white one. If they have, I want it. See you later, Matt. Chester? Go Goodbye, on, Miss Kitty. This your wagon, mister? No. Gatlos. I skin for him. Well, what are you doing here? What's the crowd for? Just curious. The other Skinner got hurt, and we brought him into the dock. Oh? What happens? He hurt bad? Bad enough. Gatliff didn't see any sense in bringing him into town at all. Me and the cook, we made him, though. Oh? Huh? Here's Gatliff now. Uh, Chester, go up to docks. Maybe you can help, huh? All right, sir. How is he? Doc will take care of everything, Toby. Never mind that. How is he? Dead. Now, let's drive these hides on down the shed. I want to get them sold and pick up our supplies. Come on. Uh, just a minute, Catliff. Some other time, Marshal. I'm busy. So am I. But you come into my office anyway. I want to talk to you. Call this busy, bothering people? That's my office right over there. You and the cook will get them hides unloaded, Toby. I'll be right along. Yeah. Now, what do you want, Marshal? You and you around here, Gatliff? Any log in it? It depends. What happened to your Skinner? Billy? He hurt himself, that's all. He's dead, isn't he? Yeah, he's dead. Look, Gatliff, anything you don't want to tell me, I can ask Doc about. Well, there's nothing to tell, Marshal. He got hurt and he died, that's all. When did he get hurt? Last night. And why didn't you bring him in last night? 
Uh, them other fellas that cooked and told me they figured he was done for any wind didn't want to bother, I guess. Is that so? You're the boss, aren't you? Sure, I am. But you know how men are when they get out in camp, Marshal. You don't want to push them too far. They get touchy, kind of. What happened to him, Godliff? How'd he get hurt? I don't rightly know, Marshal. He was alone in camp, and when we got there, he'd gone and burnt himself. Burned? Burned with what? Hot lead, Marshal. Spilt it all over him. Oh, you mean lead for bullets, huh? That's it. Cooking up lead in a fry pan. That was one of Billy's chores, to make my bullets. He always was a mite clumsy. He sure messed himself up this time. There must have been a lot of lead. Fifty, sixty pound, I reckon. Oh, there you are, Mr. Gatliff. Doc Adams is looking for you. What does he want? Well, sir, that man of yours, Doc's all through with him. He says you can bury him now. Oh, no. I ain't paying for no burial. He's just a skinner I hired. Don't even know his last name. You're his boss, aren't you? You brought him in. And that's all I'm going to do for him. I ain't paying you a dollar. Not a dollar. Nobody's asking you to pay me. But you can't just leave the man in Doc's office. Somebody's got to bury him. He's just a bum who worked for me. He's not my father. Oh, all the stingy things Hold it, Chester. All right, Gadliff. We'll take care of him. You can go now. He caused me trouble enough. I don't want to hear any more about him ever. Well... That's about the most unfeeling man I ever did come across. What about that scanner, Chester? Tell me. Oh, I swear it was terrible, Mr. Dillon. He was burned all over his head and his face and across his chest. Doc said he don't know how that fellow lived as long as he did. Could he talk? Oh, Doc told me he couldn't say a word. Well, how do you suppose it happened? Why, hot lead. Had a whole pan full of it from what I hear. Yeah. Fifty or sixty pounds of it. That much? Well, I can believe it. I can't. What man's going to pick up 60 pounds of molten lead and spill it in his own face? That's the most stupid story I ever heard. Well, say, now, I hadn't thought of that. Mr. Dillon, you're right. Of course, there's another way it could have happened. What's that? Somebody could have pushed his face down into it. Oh, my goodness. Who? I don't know. Gatliff or maybe Toby. You know where Toby went? Well, no, I don't. But him and the cook probably went over to the Oliver Ganser to drink up their wages. Yeah. All right. Uh, go do something about burying that man, Chester, will you? I'll be back later. All right, sir. I'll tend to it. Where's the cook, Toby? Oh, hello, Marshal. Cook, he went to get him some boots while he still had the money. Yeah. Come on over to a table. I'll buy you a drink. You will? Well, I mean, sure, sure, Marshal, sure. Uh, Sam, set out a bottle of rye and another glass with Yes, sir. Come on. a friend, Billy. He's no friend of mine, but he died a bad death. I'll drink to him. <coughs> Tell me something, Toby. Hmm? How did he and Gatliff get on? You see Gatliff's eyes, Marshal? Yeah, I did. He's got powder specks shot into them. They look like turkey eggs. Yeah? You don't get on with a man like that. Yeah. Well, why do you work for him, then? Marshal, I get 25 cents a hide, and I can skin over 20 buffalo a day. But I work for hunters who couldn't kill enough to keep up with me. Gat looks a good hunter, and that's the only reason at all I work for him. But if he's such a good hunter, how come I've never seen him in Dodge before? The man's greedy, Marshal. He's downright wicked about money. He figures he can save time and make more money by selling his hides to buyer's agents on the prairie. Yeah. He gets less out there, but he can kill and sell more that way. That Gatliff never stops killing buffalo. He came in with a load of hides today. Just because we made him come in with Billy. And another thing, we've been out four months, Marshal. He must owe Billy seven, 
Oh, eight hundred dollars. Oh? Yeah. Most hunters would have split that with the crew, but <laughs> not Gatliff. He liked to took my head off when I mentioned hey, it. Hey, want another drink? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh tell me about the accident, huh? Well, Billy was melting lead in the fry pan in the way I figured he must have uh, tripped somehow, fallen smack into it, and when we rode in we found him rolling around on the ground. That's all I know. When who rode in? Uh, me and the cook. <clears throat> the cook skins on days Billy's making bullets. Now, where was Gatliff? No, oh, he went in just ahead of us. How long ahead of you? Not long, maybe about 20 minutes. Then he found Billy first, is that it? Yeah, so he did. Hey, I hadn't thought of that before, Marshal. So that's why you've been asking so many questions. Well, I wasn't sure, Toby, but I expect you're telling the truth. The cook backed up your story. Sure, I'm telling the truth. That's what happened, all right. You know, Gatliff killed him. He murdered him. Any idea why he would? Well, sure I do. There's only one thing Gatliff wants, and that's money. He killed Billy just so you wouldn't have to pay him his wages due. Yeah, maybe. Why don't you arrest him, Marshal? Yeah, there's no real evidence, Toby, not at all. And it's bad for the law if I arrest a man and later he goes free. Unless he's innocent, of course. He ain't innocent. Uh, how come this didn't occur to you before, Toby? Why, well, I don't know, Marshal. I sure don't. You going back out on the prairie with him? Oh, I ain't afraid of him. I'll be sleeping with one eye open from now on. It'd be a pleasure to kill him after what he'd done. Self-defense, of course, Marshal. Yeah. But if you let on you're suspicious, he'll sure try to kill you. <laughs> Not me. He can do his killing on somebody else. The cook, maybe? No, I ain't even going to tell the cook. Yeah. You'll be leaving in the morning, I suppose. About dawn, I reckon, soon as Gatliff hires a new skinner. Now, the bottle's yours, Toby. Oh? And, uh, good luck. Well, I sure do. Thank you, Marshal. Later in the day, Chester and a couple of other men buried Billy out on the hill. As Toby said, he died a bad death. And it was made worse by the men who'd done it to him, going scot-free. But I figured anybody as greedy as Gatliff would someday overplay his hand. And I hoped I'd be there when he did. The next morning, Chester told me he'd heard that they'd left Dodge. That afternoon, we went off fishing. When we got back, Kitty cooked up our catch for supper. And she did a real good job of it. Yeah, ah, that was fine, Miss Kitty. Just fine. Any time, Chester. You catch them and I'll cook them. <laughs> Say, do you know how to make antelope stew? I've made it. And sardo biscuits? Of course. Oh, my goodness. Chester. You sound like you're about to propose. Oh, my gracious. No, Mr. Dillon, my. Why, Chester, I always kind of hoped. Well, oh, I, I, I didn't mean... Well, that is... I mean... <laughs> well, mercy, I... Well, who, who'd marry me, anyway? <laughs> you ever ask anyone to, Chester? Well, yes, ma'am, once I did. Well, what'd she say? She said she would. She said, yeah. Oh, what happened? Marshal Dillon here. Yeah, come on in, mister. Uh, they sent me after you, Marshal. Nestor camp across the river. Oh, what's the trouble? Man got knifed over there. Killed. Oh, was it just a fight or what? Well, they don't know who knifed him, Marshal. Uh, come on, Chester. Sure. Thanks for the supper, Kitty. Sure, ma'am. <laughs> In the back, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. But nobody saw it happen. No, sir. Looks like somebody got clean away with murder. Well, hello there. Marshal Dillon? That's right. What can I do for you, son? That man that's dead. Oh, what about him? 
Well, well, go ahead. You can tell me. I saw him get stabbed, Marshal. You did? Well, where were you? I was looking for berries uh, over there. I heard him arguing, and I sneaked up just after he'd done it. They were all alone. Who was the man, son? Did you know him? No, sir, but, but he was big and kind of dirty looking. He had a buckskin shirt. Uh, anything else you remember? He had funny eyes, Marshal. They had spots in them. This gat look, Chester. Yeah, I declare it sounds like him, sure enough. Uh, son, how come you didn't tell anybody about what you saw? I was afraid to, till you came, Marshal. Why, it's all right. But, uh, in case I want to find you later sometime, what's your name? Yorkie Kelly. All right, I won't forget that, Yorkie. And thanks for telling me about this. Oh, sure, Marshal, any time. Well, I hope there won't be a next time, Yorkie. Goodbye. So long, Marshal. Goodbye. Hmm? I guess it was Gatlin, all right. Yeah. Seems like a dangerous sort of man to be running loose. Now I got him now, Chester. As soon as I find him. I hope so, Mr. Dillon. I certainly do hope so. Turn with the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night, Frank Lovejoy stars in the remarkable talent of Egbert Haw on CBS Radio's Theater of Stars. Also tomorrow night, hear Lionel Barrymore on your Hall of Fame Playhouse. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Since Gadliff would figure nobody had seen him, it wasn't likely that he'd run. And anyway, there wasn't much sense in trying to track him down in the dark. So Chester and I didn't start out until the next morning. Ordinarily, a man would ride into the prairie and disappear. But with Gadliff, it was a little different. At least we knew he'd be somewhere around Buffalo. It was late afternoon before we reached good hunting grounds. And almost dark when we spotted the first hunter's camp. We just gonna ride right up to him, Mr. Dillon? Now, this isn't Gatliff. He had mules. This man's got horses. Yeah, that's right. Now, keep your eyes open just the same, Chester. Oh, yes, sir. Get down, stranger. Uh, thank you. Supper will be ready. Cook, throw some more tongue in that stew pot. Don't like buffalo tongue. You'll go mighty hungry in this camp. Oh, thanks, mister. Hey, you're a lawman. Matt Dillon, I'm a U.S. Marshal. My name's Tom Mercer. How are you? Uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. How'd you do? Mr. Mercer. Come over by the wagon and sit down. Supper will take a little longer now. Anyway, my skinners won't be in for a while yet. Well, how you doing, Mr. Mercer? Oh, fair, Marshal, fair. Had a stand of about a hundred today. Killed every one of them but a couple of old bulls. Uh -huh. That's why the boys are out so late. Have you been here long? About a month. Move on in a couple of weeks. I don't know, Marshal. I think this whole southern herd is going to be clean wiped out for long. Next year, I'm going to Dakota. Too many hunters, maybe, huh? That's just it. That's it, exactly. Uh, have you seen any in the last day or two, Mr. Mercer? Uh, just who you're looking for, Marshal? man named Gatliff. Yeah. Uh, Big man, with speckled eyes. What's he done? You know him? No, no, I don't. Nobody's come near us in over a week. Uh, you're not much help, <laughs> except for that stew the cook's making. Oh, you like that? We're having dried apples too. Oh. I might near get eat a buffalo raw, the entire beast. You must be part Indian. Well, no, sir. I've seen one of them eat a whole liver raw. Got propped up against a tree and ate every bit of it and then went sound asleep right there in the sun. He was sure some sight. Where'd you ever get that close to an Indian? Oh, Indians ain't always bad. Take last fall, about 20 of them rode right down into our camp. We thought we was done for sure, but you know what happened? They were looking for meat, that's all. We let them take what they wanted, they rode away. 
Just as peaceful like as a man could ask. Yeah, they're going to get real hungry when the herd's gone. That's so, Marshal. That is surely so. That's what makes them mad. Don't you think that's reason enough? A fella told me a couple of weeks ago he run into a bunch west of here. He was looking for scalps, all right, but good buffalo man with his old sharps 50 can pick off Indians at 1,500 yards. They're no match for him at all. Not unless they stalk him. Oh, they've done that, sure. Hey, here come the Skinners. Let's go get outside some of that stew. Uh, Paula, don't you ever feed this man, Marshal? <laughs> Only when he works, Mr. Mercer. Oh, now, Mr. Dillon. We spent the night in Tom Mercer's camp. And at dawn, just after breakfast, we said goodbye and rode on west. There was a lot of country out there, and all we could do was ride through it till we ran into him. In the next two days, we met plenty of hunters, but we didn't find Gatliff. About noon of the third day, we cut the trail of a wagon train and figured that it'd be that of a hide buyer's agent who'd come into the field to do business on the spot. And an hour or two later, we saw him. A long string of ox-drawn wagons piled high with buffalo hides. And there was a man on horseback leading the train. We rode up to him. Well, there. Well, that's quite a load you got, mister. Ten pounds so far. But what are you doing way out here, Marshal? I'm looking for a hunter named Gatliff. You know him? Sure I do. Just picked up a load from his wreck early this morning. Is he in trouble? Yeah, he sure is. Where is he? Straight south here a couple of miles. Can't tell you exactly. He moves around a lot. Well, that's close enough for us. Thanks a lot, mister. Sure, Marshal. I never did like him anyway. There's an empty rick over yonder. That must be it. Yeah, but he's moved his camp. Not far if it was just this morning. Chester, what's that out there? Where? Oh, that looks like a man. Come on. Hey. Oh, oh. Well, Mr. Dillon, it's that Skinner of his. Get some water, Chester. Yes, sir. Toby. Toby, can you hear me? He's been shot. Yes, sir. Here's the water. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Toby? Huh? It's Marshal Dillon. Give me, give, me, give me a drink. Here you are. Uh, he, he shot me, Marshal. Oh, what happened? Where's the rest of the crew? They run off. He took his wagon and the horses. He went kind of crazy when he found out. That's why he shot me. You know where he is now? No, I don't know, Marshal. He shot me and then he said he was going hunting. He's going loco. He's going loco. Now, now, now take it easy, Toby. Take it easy. You'll be all right. I could hear him shooting at Sharps a long time. And then he stopped. Huh. Where was he? Which way? Off. Behind me there. I, uh, I could hear him. Chester, you stay with him. I'm going after Gatliff. All right, sir. Off in the direction Toby had indicated, there lay a large, isolated hollow surrounded by low ridges. When I reached it, I dismounted, and I crawled up to where I could look down into it. There was no sign of Gatliff, but lying on the prairie floor were the bodies of countless fresh-killed buffalo. It was a strange sight. The old bulls, the cows... The little calves lying there, black in the prairie grass. I got up and stood, looking at it for a long time. 
And then suddenly, out in the middle, I thought I saw a slight movement. And a second later, there came the familiar boom of a Sharps 50. And I dropped behind a ridge and waited. And then Chester rode up. Have you found him, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I thought I'd better come along. You, you see... Toby's dead, is that it? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Gatliff's down there in the middle of the hollow. But we can't get anywhere near him as long as he's got that Sharps rifle. He's killed a small herd of buffalo in there, and now he's lying out in the center of them. Well, that's the darndest thing I ever heard of, Mr. Dillon. He must have gone crazy, just like Toby said. Yeah. What's he shooting at now? Mr. Dillon, the way he's facing them shots. Yeah, that's the signal for help, Chester. Come on. Hey, maybe this is a trap. Uh, be ready to take cover behind one of these animals. It might be. Sounds like he's been hurt. Yeah. Keep your head up. There he is. Behind that big bull. Yeah, I see him. Well, Mr. Dillon, he... He's all... There have been horses in here. Indians. Oh, my goodness. Come on. Effort, Chester. He's dead now. Mr. Dillon, that's awful. Yeah. Come on, let's get out of here. I don't know how the Indians caught Gatliff. He'd gone a little mad, and maybe that made it easy for him. But they finally got themselves a buffalo hunter. And into their unbelievably savage torture of him had gone all the hatred and desperation of a race being slowly starved and driven from their homeland. And then they'd put him there surrounded by his own bloody slaughter. And they'd gone off with a gesture of contempt, leaving his rifle and his ammunition by his side. And having seen what they did to him, I'll never know how he managed to fire even one of those shots. For all of his evil, Gatliff had died harder than any man I'd ever seen. Chester and I rode back to Dodge. And it was never mentioned between us again. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, John Daner, Harry Bartell, Richard Beals, and William Euler. Parley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Monday night on CBS Radio, hear the concluded suspense production of Shakespeare's tragic drama, Othello, starring Richard Widmark, Elliot Lewis, and Kathy Lewis. Also Monday night, don't miss the Lux Radio Theater's charming excursion into fantasy, The Bishop's Wife, starring Carrie... Mr. Dillon, the way he's facing them shots... Yeah, that's the signal for help. Monday evenings on the CBS Radio Network.
brain. It's gone. That's not all. The entire spinal cord is missing. What? It's incredible. It's as if some mental vampire were at work. Does it come from another country or another world? This terrifying menace that G2 must destroy before it's too late. The image is fading, sir. There it goes again. Same trouble. How can they stop this invisible force whose only warning is a weird, blood-chilling sound? <laughs> Only two people still alive can help this agent find the answers. The girl who could be a spy, and the scientist who could be the destroyer of the entire human race. We're facing a new form of life that nobody understands. I believe it feeds on the radiation from your atomic plants, and that it's evil. To stop them. There's only one way to shut down your atomic plant. If I can get through, I can blow up the control room. Our next guest will give you the laughs. Just don't ask him to lend you money. It's Jack Benny coming up next. J-E-L-L-O! -L oh! The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Hooray for Hollywood. <laughs> Do you get a sort of a tingling in your toes at this time of the year? A longing to get out and watch things grow? Well, here's one swell way to save time indoors so that you can get outdoors. Serve Jell-O for dessert and serve it often. For Jell-O is amazingly quick and easy to prepare, one of the simplest desserts you can make. It dissolves instantly and sets quickly. Why, well, you can pop it into your refrigerator before you go out in the morning and have a grand dessert ready for lunch or dinner. And Jell-O is always attractive. Always delicious. It's crammed with extra rich flavor, lots and lots of it. As tempting and refreshing as the real ripe fruit itself. Every time you serve it, it's a brand new treat. A dessert the family always welcomes. And when you buy, just be sure to get genuine Jell-O. Look for those big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O, and Jell-O spells a treat. That was Hooray for Hollywood, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this being Mother's Day, we bring you that little old lady, Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you. Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And before going any further, I wish mothers everywhere a happy holiday. You know, Don, I thought that was cute, you're calling me a little old lady, although I didn't quite get the inference. Well, Jack, I meant that as a compliment. Oh. You're always so neat and meticulous. Every little detail must be perfect. Everything you do must be just so. In other words, Don, I'm a fuss budget. Exactly. <laughs> Don, I may run my finger across the piano keys to see if they're dusty. And I may spank my cat for joining a lonesome club. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a fuss budget. Am I, Mary? Not much. What about that sign you got on the front door of your house? What sign? Please take shower before entering. <laughs> Mary, that's Rochester's fault. It should be by my swimming pool. Anyway, that still doesn't justify Don's introduction. I'm not an old lady. Go on. I saw you crossing Hollywood Boulevard yesterday, and a Boy Scout was helping you. <laughs> well, it was the rush hour. <laughs> You know, Phil, Hollywood Boulevard is a pretty busy street. It's quite dangerous crossing it. Well, why don't you wait for the lights? If he could see the lights, he wouldn't need a Boy Scout. <laughs> Never mind. I think the Boy Scout movement is a great institution. In fact, I used to be one myself. 
I belong to the Panther Patrol in Waukegan. Oh, so you were a Boy Scout, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, Jack, when I was a kid, I belonged to the Beaver Patrol in Denver. No kidding. Say, Phil, were you ever a Boy Scout? No, I went right from the cradle into the Elks. <laughs> I believe you. You know, Phil, <laughs> you haven't got near the sentiment that Don has, or I have, or the rest of the gang. Oh, I don't know. Well, I'll bet you didn't even send a present today to your sweet old mother down in Tennessee. He did too, Jack. I was in the store with him when he bought it. You're darn right. Well, that's a surprise. What'd he get for his mother, Mary? A brand new corn cob pipe. <laughs> hmm. She'll love it. Well, I guess they're all the rage in the hills. You know? <laughs> Say, Phil, do your folks still live in Possum Junction? No, they moved to Grub Hollow for the feuding season. <laughs> oh, it's lovely there then with the shotguns all in bloom and the mountain dew behind every stump. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, cut it out, Jack. You're making me homesick. I'm sorry, Phil. Anyway, I'm very happy that you remembered your mother today. Say, Jack, you know, I sent my mother a present, too. A lovely bottle of perfume. Perfume, huh? Yeah, it's called L'Amour Toujours Ocean Park. <laughs> oh. Phil says it's great stuff. Phil, what's he got to do with it? His guitar player makes it. <laughs> Oh, he does. <laughs> you know, Phil, you've got the only musicians in the world that could go into some other business tomorrow, and I wish they would. <laughs> <laughs> well, fellas, let's get down to work. We've got a long play to do tonight, and I think we better get Hello, going. Hello, Jack. What are you talking about? Well, what do you think I'd be talking about, Kenny, today of all days? Your new picture. I was <laughs> I was not. I'm surprised at you, Kenny. Don't you know what day this is? Oh, why don't you give him a hint, Jack? This is a tough one. Tough one? Why, everybody should know who we're dedicating this day to, especially a young fellow like him. Kenny, who made you wash behind your ears when you were a kid? Nobody. I had curls. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Look, Kenny, it's somebody's day today. Now, who do you go to when you're in trouble and everybody else has failed you? Who do you go to? Oh, I know, Mervyn Leroy. <laughs> well, I give up. Try and give that kid a hint. Well, maybe I can help you, Jack. Now, Kenny, when you want a real tempting and delicious dessert, who goes to the kitchen and prepares a dish of jello for you? My mother, Mrs. J. Hotchkiss Baker. Hooray! <laughs> So you see, ladies and gentlemen, Jell-O has not only helped Kenny find out what day this is, but it is also economical, easy to make, and comes in six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Uh, thanks, Don, for helping me out. And incidentally, that was as smooth a bit of wool as has been pulled over these old eyes in many a moon. <laughs> and now, folks, Kenny Baker will sing. What are you going to sing, Kenny? For my mother, which I prepared especially for this occasion. Go ahead. Hey, wait a minute. If you had a song prepared for your mother, how could you walk in here not knowing what day this is? I didn't walk, I skipped in. <laughs> oh, that explains it. Sing, Kenny. <laughs> I see the light of heaven in your eyes, mother dear. The brightness of the sun in your smile, mother dear. I feel the magic of God's hand in all you do for me. His masterpiece of mystery. I'm thankful for the tenderness and care I have known. I'm thankful to that God and you chose me for your own. Each night I say a prayer for you, I know he will hear. May
That was For My Mother, sung by Kenny Baker. That was a beautiful number, Kenny, and a sweet thought. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as we announced last week, for our feature attraction tonight and our bid for the Academy Award, <laughs> we bring you our version of Mr. Pandro S. Berman's great RKO Super Spectacle, a drama based on that immortal classic, an inspiring masterpiece dedicated to that brave and fearless hero, Gunga Dean. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Berman. Now, <laughs> uh, this story is about a boy called Gunga Dean who went through life wearing nothing but a loincloth. Say, Jack, what's a loincloth? A loincloth, Kenny, is a sarong with an inferiority complex. <laughs> now, our play opens in the thriving little town of East Cobra, India, which is just three wiggles and a hiss from Calcutta. <laughs> I will play the part of Gunga Dean, that heroic young Hindu lad, that heroic young Hindu lad who saved his regiment. Phil, I wish you'd tell your piano player to stop using that electric razor while I'm talking. <laughs> it's very annoying. Well, he needs a shave. Oh, he does. Well, he, why doesn't he shave at home? He hasn't been home in three weeks. <laughs> Anyway, I will be that heroic lad who served his regiment at the cost of his life. My in laws in town. Phil, I'm announcing our play. <laughs> now, this will go on. Hey, Jack, am I going to be in it? Yes, Mary, you're going to be the entire spirit and mood of our story. You will interpret the action of the play as it goes on by reciting that famous poem by Rudyard Kipling. What poem? Oh, Mary, you remember. You're a better man than I am. Who is that? Anybody. <laughs> it is not. It's Gunga Dean. And you're going to recite it for us. Gee, then I better start writing it. You don't have to write it. It's already written. Kipling wrote it. Wrote what? Hold tight and go back to sleep. <laughs> So in our play tonight, folks, we will take you to India, the land of mystery and enchantment, where moonlight spreads its silvery glow over the Ganges, where in solitary splendor stands the incomparable Taj Mahal. <laughs> what was that? The piano player just talked himself into a shampoo. <laughs> Phil, Phil, why don't you boys clean up on their own time? Well, they're busy, Jack. Don't forget, we had a rehearse before the program. Rehearse? Oh, yes, I saw your boys here this morning. And, Phil, it would be a grand idea if they rehearsed with their instruments. I think your theory of shadow boxing in music is entirely wrong. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, yes, the time of our drama is the year 1900 or thereabouts. Oh, uh, Jack, have you got a part for me in this play? Well, Don, I didn't know just what to do with you. We need animals, but you're, you're too small for an elephant and too big for a mongoose. It's quite a problem. Gee, I, I'd love to be in it. Couldn't I be a hippopotamus? Well, Don, you're hippie enough, and you certainly have a large potamus. <laughs> Oh, uh, we'll find, uh, we'll find something for you. Now, the scene of our drama is the home of Mrs. Dean, where she lives with her three sons, Dizzy, Daffy, and Gunga. <laughs> the Dean family. What's the matter with Sar? Sar? Yes, Sar Dean. <laughs> Harris scores again. <laughs> oh, Phil, luck. <laughs> Isn't that awful, Sar Dean? Phil, the next time you pull an ad lib like that, I'm going to put maple syrup in your hair curlers. <laughs> what a gag. Listen, Jack, I pull that kind of stuff all the time at the Wilshire Bowl. I know. That's why they took off the cover charge. <laughs> Mary, did you ever go to the bowl and hear Phil pull those gags of his? Yeah, the waiters all wear earmuffs. Well, I don't blame them. The customers ought to wear earmuffs, too. And now, folks... Is it cold in there? Oh, quiet. <laughs> Now, our play, Gunga Dean, will go on immediately after a selection by the orchestra. 
Hey, Phil, play something apropos, you know, something that'll put us in the right spirit for India. Okay, how about uh, Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakoff? <laughs> Phil, just play Tiger Rag. I'm in no mood to gamble. <laughs> Look who wants to play Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov. Well, he certainly surprised me. Surprised you? I didn't even play it. No, but he pronounced it. It was quite a feat. I bet he doesn't even know the first eight bars of it. I don't, eh? Get this, Jackson. Scheherazade, Scheherazade, Zada, Zada, Zing, Zing, Zing. 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 <laughs> There you are. Did you hear that, Mary? I didn't think he knew it. No. <laughs> Let's forget it. Anyway, Phil, go ahead with whatever you're going to play. Okay. Hold it a minute. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Rochester, we're just starting our play, so call me back later. I won't be here later. Oh, what's the matter now? Is it Carmichael again? Boss, I don't mind making your bed and pressing your pants, but when you expect me to teach that polar bear to roller skate, I quit. <laughs> Well, you gotta teach him to skate. I'm going to be off the air this summer, and that's part of our vaudeville act. <laughs> Benny and Carmichael, humor on wheels. <laughs> now, look, Rochester, it's very simple. The first step with Carmichael is to strap the skates on him. Uh-huh. The second step is to give him a little push. Uh-huh. And the third step... Is to get out of town before it's too late. <laughs> Oh, Rochester, what's the matter with you? Carmichael is very good at tricks. You taught him to bring in the mail, didn't you? Yeah, but this morning he brought in the mailman. <laughs> the mailman? I refuse to believe it. Well, you see the newsreel. <laughs> well, I'll apologize to Mr. Jensen when I see him. I'll be home right after the broadcast, Rochester. So long. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss, I forgot to tell you, Carmichael's been after the goldfish again. I caught him this morning with his paws in the bowl. And he was after the goldfish? He wasn't waiting for a manicure. <laughs> well, don't worry about it. He was just playing with the fish. He won't eat them. I don't know about that. He had a napkin around his neck. <laughs> All right, now don't bother me anymore, Rochester. We got an important sketch to do. Meanwhile, try and get along with Carmichael. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'm gonna get myself a good lawyer and bump that animal off. <laughs> oh, hang up. More trouble getting my act ready. I'll teach that bear to roller skate or my name ain't Tony Pasquale. Pay fair. Tiger Rag, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado... That was not Tiger Rag. That was Hindustan. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll leave it to our studio audience. <laughs> They've all gone home. Hmm. I told the man to lock the door. Well, anyway, 
Here we go with our sensational and thrilling melodrama, Gunga Dean. The locale, as I said before, is the little town of East Cobra, India. Curtain music. Take it, Mary. Now, in India's sunny clime, where I used to spend my time, I knew a Hindu boy called Gunga Dean. His figure was appalling. He had arches that had fallen, and a face that looked just like a soup tureen. Hmm. It was Dean, Dean, Dean. Take it, Jack, and see you keep it clean. I will. Scene one, the home of Mrs. Dean. My goodness, it's seven o'clock already. Why doesn't that boy get up? Oh, Gunga! Gunga! Yes, Ma, what are you wonga? <laughs> Come downstairs and eat your breakfast. Now hurry. I'm coming. <laughs> Darn that crocodile. I'm always stumbling over him. Go away, Fido. Say, Ma, how do you like my new loincloth? Now, Gunga, who ever heard of wearing suspenders with a loincloth? Well, I don't trust my fraternity pin. <laughs> you know me. Well, you can't wear them. People will laugh at you when you entertain in the marketplace today. Let them laugh. I'm tired of being a Hindu faker anyway. Walking on hot coals is all right, but there's no future in it. Never mind, my son. Being a magician is a very good trade. Oh, yeah? Look what happened to Papa. He climbed up a rope one day. That's the last anybody ever saw of him. <laughs> I didn't mind that so much, but there was a blonde with him. That's Papa, all right. Well, I guess I'll eat my breakfast. Oh, there's the phone. Hello? Hello, Gunga. Rasta Mayan Bohat Kush Leo Rana. Geldi Acha Boob Cam Carol Wally? Shukareka. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> That. Papa, you want some more rope? <laughs> I'll bring it to him later. Now sit down, son, and eat your ground glass before it gets cold. Ground glass again. Every morning for breakfast, it's ground glass. Why can't I swallow a sword once in a while? You're too bent over. Well, I could straighten up for a nice, juicy sword. Oh, stop complaining. What's the matter with you anyway? You might as well know it, Ma. I'm not going to be a magician any longer. I'm going to join the Army. The Army? Yes, I enlisted yesterday in the Bengal Lancers. <gasps> Why, Gunga, how can you get in the Army? You've got flat feet and your chest is a little floy floy too. <laughs> well, I don't have to be strong. I'm going to be a bugler. I bought a horn the other day. Listen to this. There, how's that? Hadassah Booga. It's a good thing you said that in Hindu. <laughs> well, if you want to know something, Ma, I played my bugle on Major Gandhi's amateur hour last night. Well, how did you make out, Gunga? He got the gonga. You're not in this. Oh. Well, Ma, I'm leaving now. I'm off to join the regiment. And someday you're going to be proud of me. So long, Ma. So long, Gunga. So Gunga left his mommy and went to join the army, a servant of Her Majesty the Queen. Now we find him in the Lancers without his coat and pantsers and his bright new bugle slowly turning green. Burns me up. I got a guarantee with it. It was green, green, green. You're in the army now, you jelly bean. Hmm. Scene two, the barracks of the 7th Bengal Lancers. <laughs> Seventh Lancers, Captain Harris speaking. Hello, Harris. This is Major Wilson. What's on your mind, Mage? Ah, look here, Harris. Every day the native bandits are out killing and plundering, and you're not doing a thing about it. You got to put a stop to this immediately, or I'll send you back to Grub Hollow. Well, tell me, Mage, where'll I find them bandits? Well, uh, somebody may be listening, so I'll give it to you in code now. Take this guy. Okay. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry. Big red letters. Orange, lemon. Six delicious on the box. Lime. Have you got that? Yeah. Then carry on. Goodbye. Hey, Dean! Dean! Yes, Captain Harris? Stop jamming and come in here. 
Okay. I want to see you too, Private Baker. Aye, aye, sir. And don't say aye, aye. You're not in the Navy, you know. Well, then why am I wearing your sailor suit? Because you're just gobs of fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gun, gun. Well, I can't help it. Corn is catching. <laughs> Why'd you send for us, Captain? Now, listen, boys. The maids just gave me a buzz, and he was hotter than a torch. He said them bandits are jiving again. Jiving? Yeah, and they've been cutting a rug once too often. Well, gee, Cap, can't we get him in the groove? Nah, they're half, bud. <laughs> but if we can get him on the downbeat, they'll take it on the lamb, and we'll be right back on the beam. Hmm. I don't even understand that, and I'm a Hindu. <laughs> what are you getting at, Captain? Just this, Gunga. I want you and Baker to cross the desert, go up in the mountains, and see if you can locate the hideout of the bandits. Yes, yes sir. sir. And remember, fellas, if you succeed, I'll give you a medal. Just like the one I'm wearing right here. Oh, boy! Fine metal, Gene Autry Fan Club. <laughs> well, all right, Captain, we'll go now. Come on, Baker, we gotta cross that desert. Okay, you take the high road and I'll take the bus. <laughs> we gotta travel together and on foot. Follow me, Baker, and we'll find the hideout of those bandits or perish in the attempt. So long, Captain. So long, suckers. Hmm, fine encouragement. So Gunga left with Baker. Gosh, how their feet will ache her on that hot and burning sand so far away. I bet you that their bunions will be crying just like onions before they reach the bandits' hideaway. Oh, I'll make it. For it's Dean, 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 with buzzards flying high above your beam. With your courage and your daring and that smile you're always wearing, you're a better man than I am, Bobby Breen. <laughs> What? It was Breen, Breen, Breen. That's enough. Scene three, the desert, five days later. <laughs> uh, uh, five days in this infernal desert. Five days without water. Uh, five long, blistering days. It's pretty hot at night, too. <laughs> I can't stand it, Baker. I'm going crazy. Crazy, I tell you. I'm going mad. Me, too. <laughs> uh, water. Water. Here, have some of my potato chips. <laughs> I don't want any potato chips. My throat is parched. I want water. Water, I tell you, water. I don't think I can go on much longer. Hey, Gunga, our troubles are over. Look at that sign. Where? Right there. Palm Springs, 9,000 miles. <laughs> we'll never make it. Oh, this heat. This relentless burning heat. Will it never end? I can't walk, Baker. Each step is torture. Water. Water. I don't think I can go on much longer. You said that already. <laughs> I know. What are we going to do, Baker? What are we going to do? Oh, wait. Look. Look up ahead. There's an osis. That's Oasis. <laughs> but you're right. Come on, let's make one last desperate effort to get there. Okay. Drink. Drink, drink. That's what I want. Lemonade. Get your ice cold lemonade here. <laughs> ice cold lemonade. Did you hear that, Baker? Oh, boy. Get your ice cold lemonade. I'll have a glass, buddy. How much is it? Nothing. I'm a mirage. It's <laughs> mm. the first mirage I ever saw with a door. <laughs> Let's stagger on, Baker. <laughs> Look. Look at those buzzards circling overhead. They're waiting for us, Baker. They're waiting for us, I tell you. Yes, but they'll never get us. Come on, Gunga, keep your chin up. Remember, we're Bengal Lancers. I'll try. I'll try. If I don't go crazy first. <laughs> you see, Baker, I'm going mad. Me too. <laughs> Don't enjoy it so much. <laughs> hey, look, what's that coming towards us? Where? Right there. Why, it's a polar bear, and he's on roller skates. Looks like Carmichael. I knew I was going crazy. I'm delirious. Delirious. It's another mirage. Mirage nothing, boss. 
He's got me down to a loincloth, too. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Take it, Mary. So we leave them on the desert till next week on Sunday night. Will they reach their destination? Will they die without a fight? Well, tune in next Sunday evening, and you'll find out, I hope, that Gunga is a hero and that Baker is a dope. That's right. So it's dope, dope, dope. Never mind. Play, Phil. A couple of weeks ago, I made a confession. I told you that I never used to be very fond of salads. That is, until Jello salads changed my mind. Well, since then, we've had a number of requests for more salad ideas, so tonight we're bringing you another new one, pineapple date salad. And you can just take my word for it, it's swell. Here's the way to make it. Dissolve one package of lemon jello in one pint of hot water, chill until slightly thickened, and then fold in one cup of diced canned pineapple and one cup of quartered dates. Mold until firm, then serve on crisp lettuce with creamy golden mayonnaise. It's a grand combination. Rich dates, tangy pineapple, and that real, true extra rich fruit flavor of lemon jello that's just perfect for salads. You can serve your pineapple date salad as a two-in-one course, salad and dessert, and the whole family will enjoy it. So ask your grocer tomorrow for lemon jello and try this delicious new recipe. This is the National Broadcasting Company. very moment, the entire world awaits the countdown that will send the first living person hurtling into the unexplored mysteries of the universe. Three, two, one, drop. Y-13, commence your turn immediately. No, sir, I'm going straight up. First man into space. Can science prepare him for what no man has ever experienced before? Will the hypnotic effects of weightlessness or dreadanoxia lure him beyond all human control? I wanted to be the first man into space. Is this the end? Lifeless man and his machine orbiting the Earth forever? Or what if he is the first man to return from space? Every man who challenges the unknown risks far more than science knows or conjectures. What will unpredictable cosmic forces do to the human body? What thing of unknown terror may return to walk the earth? One of the all-time great directors, Cecil B. DeMille, hosts Lux Radio Theater, up next. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson in The Letter. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know which is more exciting to a producer, a play by Somerset Maugham or a performance by Betty Davis. But we have both in the Lux Radio Theater tonight. And the pulse of this producer is beating double time. For Miss Davis again proves her genius in one of Mr. Maugham's most powerful dramas, The Letter. And you'll hear more than one star performance. For with Miss Davis, we have Herbert Marshall and James Stevenson, who share honors with her in Warner Brothers' film production of this play. The Letter is the story of a beautiful woman fighting the heat and privations of a jungle back country who tears to shreds the lives of two men. It's a great part for a great actress. And we had no trouble in persuading Betty Davis to return from an Eastern vacation to play it at this microphone. The result of her gracious gesture is the kind of bill that would mean standing room only in any ordinary theater. But, of course, this theater always has enough seats to go around, all the way around, the whole country. That's one reason it's a national theater. Tonight's performance comes to you with the best wishes of Lux Flakes. And just as you have made this theater 
a weekly custom in so many American homes. You've made Lux Flakes a daily custom in your homes, too. And that adds up to an all-American rating for both plays and product. And now get ready for a dramatic experience you'll never forget. The curtain rises on the letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie Crosby, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and James Stevenson as Howard Joyce with Sen Young as the lawyer's assistant. Just north of Singapore, on the Malay Peninsula, lie the great rubber plantations, kingdoms of commerce worked by native labor, ruled by a handful of white men. In the main bungalow on one of these plantations, a light burns dimly through shaded windows. The night is hot and humid. The soft breeze, heavy with the scent of flowers. A clouded moon hangs low in the sky, filtering slowly through the trees, making patterns of shimmering silver on the ground. There is deep silence. Suddenly, the door of the bungalow is flung open. I hear that man. That is Mr. Hammond. Is he dead? I, I I think him dead. You shoot him, Miss Crosby? Do you know where the new district officer lives? Yes, Missy. Send someone for him at once. Say there's been an accident and Mr. Hammond's dead. Yes, Missy. And get word to my husband. He's out somewhere on the number four plantation. Yes, Missy. I try. <laughs> Crosby? Huh? I'm John Withers, the new district officer. Where's Mrs. Crosby? She locked herself in the room. She wouldn't see me until you came. Excuse me. Leslie, let me in. Leslie, darling, it's Robert. Leslie, what's happened? Didn't they tell you? They said Hammond was killed. Is he... Is he still out there? I had your head boy remove the body to a shed. Leslie, what happened? Tell me. He tried to... to make love to me, and I shot him. Leslie. Oh, Robert, I'm so glad you've come. Well, darling, Hold me tight. I'm so frightened. There's nothing to be frightened about. (laughs) It'll be all right. There, now, that's better. I'll... I'll try not to do that again. Mr. Withers, I, I hope you'll understand. I didn't want to see anyone until my husband came. Of course I understand, Mrs. Crosby. Howard, come in. I got your message in Singapore. Howard, how nice of you to come. Well, naturally, I'd want to be here if I can help. Oh, you will help, then? Of course I will, in every way I can. You're a dear. Mr. Withers, this is Mr. Howard Joyce, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? How's Dorothy, Howard? Oh, she's very well and anxious to see you. Has her sister arrived from England? Adele? Yes. Charming girl. She came last week. Oh. Oh. Here. Here, you better be resting. I do feel dreadfully faint. Come and lie down, darling. I'll get you a drink. I'm sorry to be so tiresome. Nonsense, you're being very brave. She's bearing up wonderfully, Mr. Joyce. Yes. Yes, she is. Um, how long have you been here? About an hour. One of the Crosby houseboys came to fetch me. Was Hammond dead? Oh, yes. He was just riddled with bullets. What? Here's the revolver. All six chambers are empty. Here, you two. You better have a drink yourselves. Thanks, but I'm afraid I shouldn't. I'm, I'm on sort of a duty, you know. I'll have one, Bob. Well, you feeling any better, Leslie? Oh, much better, thanks. Mrs. Crosby, I know it seems brutal, but I'm afraid it's my duty to um, ask you some questions. I think that can wait, Mr. Withers, until my oh, wife... Oh, it's all right, Robert, really. I feel perfectly well now. Then suppose you tell us exactly what happened, Leslie. I'll try. And take your time, Mrs. Crosby. Remember, we're all friends here. You've been so patient. Well, as you know, Robert was spending the night at Number 4 Plantation. Why never mind being alone? A planter's wife gets used to that. My dear... I had dinner rather late, and I started working on my lace. I don't know how long I'd been working when suddenly I heard footsteps outside, and someone came up on the veranda and said, Good evening, can I come in? Well, I was startled because I hadn't heard a car drive up. Who is it, I asked. Jeff Hammond. Oh, of course, I said, come in and have a drink. Were you surprised to see him? Well, I was rather. He hadn't been in the house for ages, had he, Robert? 
three months at least. I told him Robert was over at the number four plantation getting out a, a shipment or something. Wasn't that it, darling? What did he say to that? He said, oh, I'm sorry. I felt rather lonely tonight, so I thought I'd just come over and see how you were getting on. Well, I put on my spectacles again and went on with my work. We chatted about one thing and another. He asked me if Robert had heard that a tiger had been seen on the road two or three days ago. He said he thought he'd try to get it over the weekend. Oh, yes, I know about that. Don't you remember I spoke to you about it yesterday? Did you? Oh, yes, I believe you did. Well, we went on chatting until... Well, suddenly he said something rather silly. What? It's hardly worth repeating. He paid me a little compliment. I think perhaps you'd better tell us exactly what he said. He said, you've got very pretty eyes. It's too bad to hide them under those ugly spectacles. Has he ever said anything of the sort to you before? Oh, no, never, and I thought it impertinent. I don't wonder. And did you answer him? Yes, I said, I don't care a row of beans what you think about me. But he only laughed and said, I'm going to tell you all the same. I think you're the prettiest thing I've ever seen. Leslie. Let her finish, Bob. In that case, I said, I can only think you half with it. He laughed again and moved his chair up closer. But, Mrs. Crosby, I wonder you didn't throw him out there and then. Well, I didn't want to make a fuss. I, I think a woman makes a perfect fool of herself if she makes a scene every time a man pays her a compliment. When did you first suspect that Hammond was serious? The next thing he said. He looked at me straight in the face and he said, Don't you know that I'm awfully in love with you? Swine. Were you surprised? Of course I was surprised. Well, we'd known him for seven years, Rob, but he's never paid me the smallest attention. I didn't suppose he even knew what color my eyes were. We hadn't seen very much of him the last few years. Yes, yes. Go on, Leslie. Well, he helped himself to another whiskey and soda. I began to wonder if he'd been drinking before. I wouldn't drink any more if I were you, I said. He emptied his glass and asked me in a funny, abrupt way, Do you think I'm talking to you like this because I'm drunk? I said, that's the most obvious explanation, isn't it? Oh, it's awful having to tell you all this. I'm so ashamed. I wish there were some way we could spare you, Mrs. Crosby. Leslie, it's for your own good that we know the facts, all you can remember of them. Very well. I'll tell you the rest. I got up from my chair. I was standing in front of the table, about here. He rose and stood in front of me. I held out my hand. Good night, I said. But he just stood and looked at me, and his eyes were all funny. I'm not going, he said. Well, then I began to lose my temper. You poor fool, don't you know I've never loved anyone but Robert? And even if I didn't love Robert, you're the last man I should care for. He answered, Robert's away. Well, that was the last straw. I wasn't frightened, just angry. If you don't go away this minute, I told him, I'll call the boys and have you thrown out. I walked past him to call the boys from the veranda, and he took hold of my arm and swung me back. But I screamed as loud as I could. He flung his arms about me and began to kiss me. I struggled to tear myself away from him. Oh, he seemed like a madman. He kept talking and talking and saying he loved me and he loved me. And... Oh, it's horrible. I can't go on. I'm sorry, Leslie, but we'll have to know the rest. Well, he lifted me in his arms. I... I struggled to get free, but he was too strong for me. He started to carry me, and then, well, he stumbled on those steps. And I got away from him. Suddenly, I remembered Robert's revolver in the drawer of that chest. He got up and ran after me, but I reached it before he caught me. Oh, it was all instinctive. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I'd fired. I heard a report and saw him lurch toward the door. I followed him out to the veranda. He staggered across the porch, grabbed the railing, and slipped through his hands as he fell down the steps. I don't remember anything more. Just the reports, one after another. Until there was a funny little click and the revolver was empty. And suddenly I looked down and saw him lying there. Lying in the moonlight. It was only then that I knew what I'd done. My poor darling. Mrs. Crosby, may I say that I think you behaved magnificently? I'm terribly sorry that we had to put you to the ordeal of telling us all this. You are all very kind. It's quite obvious the man only got what he deserved. Withers, if you'll come with me, I'd like to see the body. Yes, I'll take you to the shed. We'll only be a few minutes. My poor child. Oh, Robert. What have I done? You've done what any woman would have done in your place. Only nine-tenths on it wouldn't have had the courage. And yet I'd give almost anything if I could bring him back to life. 
It's so horrible to think that I killed him. Leslie. Why, there isn't a man or a woman in the colony who won't be proud to know you. Darling, we have been happy, haven't we? You've been the best wife a man could have. I'm grateful for all the time we've been together. Don't say it that way, darling. It sounds so... so in the past. Nonsense. We've got most of our lives ahead of us. Oh, if only there was something I could do to help you right now. You can love me. That's all I need. I've always loved you. Yes, but now. Leslie, darling, if I could love you anymore, I would now. Robert. Indulgent towards my cooking, gentlemen. I can't vouch for it. Well, I can and will. Funny. The head boy running off tonight. Yes, it is odd. Well, he couldn't have done better than this, my dear. It's delicious. It certainly is. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we should start to Singapore as soon as we've finished. Right away. Why, it's still dark, Howard. It'll be 8 o'clock by the time we get there. We'll ring the Attorney General and find out when we can see him. I think that's the first thing to do, don't you, with us? Uh, yes, yes, I think that's the best thing to do. Would I have to be... Arrested? Well, you see, Mrs. Crosby, as a matter of fact, I... I think you're by way of being under arrest now. It's purely a matter of form, Mrs. Crosby. Shall I be imprisoned? That's up to the Attorney General. It's possible that after you've told him your story, he'll be able to accept bail. He's a very good fellow. I'm sure he'll do everything he can. How do you mean, be able to accept bail? Well, my dear, it depends on what the charge is. What? What do you mean by that? I think it's not unlikely that he'll say that only one charge is possible. And in that case, well, I'm afraid an application for bail would be useless. What charge? Murder. Leslie. Oh, I'm quite all right. More coffee, darling. No, no. As a matter of fact, if we're going to leave, I'd better put a few things together. It won't be long. Uh, let me do it, Robert. Don't bother, dear. Oh, Leslie. Yes? There's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, what is it, Howard? When I was looking at Hammond's body... Oh. Yes? It seemed to me that some of the shots must have been fired after he was lying on the ground. I'm afraid it sounds very cold-blooded. But I was so terrified. I didn't know what I was doing. Everything was confused and blurred. Well, there, Leslie, I shouldn't have brought it up tonight. Put it out of your mind. she saying? Mr. Crosby, to see you, sir. Oh, ask him to come in. Mr. Crosby. Thanks. Hello, Bob. Howard. How is she? Sit down, Bob. Have you seen her? If I can be of any assistance, sir, I shall remain within call. Not at the moment, Ong, thanks. Ong's been of great help on the case. He finds out everything. The perfect confidential clerk. I tried to catch you at the house. I had to see you, Howard. Well, you needn't hesitate about coming to the office, Bob. You know you're always welcome. How is... Everything? Everything's fine. In fact, Leslie's much better than you. She hasn't turned a hair. She's worth ten of me. I don't mind confessing. I'm all in. It's the first time we've been separated for more than a day since we were married. Oh, you mustn't let yourself go to pieces, Bob. I've tried to work, but it's no good. The estate can go to blazes for all I care. I hate the house and every tree on the place. Then why not stay in town with us? Dorothy's for it, and so am I. Thanks. I think I will. I won't be so lonely. Oh, you better get some sleep and after your plant is closed before you see Leslie. You don't want her to have to cheer you up. She's a plucky woman. It's monstrous they should have kept her in that filthy prison all this time. They had no choice. Anyway, it's only a week now before the trial. The whole thing's a farce. Why subject her to the ordeal of a trial? Of course she admitted killing a man in a civilized community. A trial's inevitable. She shot him as she would have shot a mad dog. You don't have to convince me, Bob. It's curious that Hammond was able to keep his life so hidden... That gambling house he owned, and especially the Eurasian woman. Could she be one of the witnesses? I shan't call her. I'll just produce evidence that Hammond was married to her. He managed to keep that marriage a secret, too. Oh, I know you're busy, Howard. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, nonsense. Now stop worrying about the trial. That's your lawyer's job. Thanks, old man. I'll see you up at the house. Yes? Mr. Joyce. Well, on. If you are not too busy, sir, 
Might I trouble you for a few words in private conversation? No trouble at all, Arm. It has to do with the case of the Crown versus Crosby. Yes? A friend has brought me information, sir, that there is in existence a letter from the defendant to the unfortunate victim of the tragedy. Well, that's not surprising. In the course of seven years, I've no doubt Mrs. Crosby often had occasion to write to Mr. Hammond. But the letter, sir, was written on the day of the late Mr. Hammond's death. Well? You will no doubt recall that Mrs. Crosby has stated that until the fatal night, she had had no communication with the deceased for several weeks. In my opinion, this letter indicates that her statement is not, in every respect, accurate. Have you seen the letter? I have with me a copy, sir. The original is in possession of a woman who happens to be the widow of Mr. Hammond, deceased. May I read it? Oh, certainly, sir. Of course, as I said, this is but a copy in my handwriting. You can understand it, sir? Perfectly. Ong, it's inconceivable that Mrs. Crosby should have written such a letter. May I suggest, sir, that it would be well to make sure, since my friend is of the opinion that the letter might be of some interest to the prosecutor. I'm obliged to, Ong. I'll give the matter my consideration. Very good, sir. Do you wish me to communicate that to my friend? Might be well if you kept in touch with him. Yes, sir. It might be very well. You may stay in the visiting room as long as you want, Mrs. Crosby. The warden's orders. That's very nice of him. Thank you. Howard, how good of you to come. I wasn't expecting you today. Good morning, Leslie. You're looking very well. Thank you, Howard. Well, the trial is only five days off now. I know. Each morning when I awake, I say to myself, one less. Just like I used to at school with the holidays coming. Leslie. Oh, don't feel sorry for me, Howard. Time has really passed quite quickly. I've read a great deal and worked on my lace. And... But I'll... I'll confess something to you, Howard. I'm not looking forward to testifying in court. Mm, Leslie... One of the things that's impressed me is that each time you told your story, you've told it in exactly the same words. You've never varied a hair's breadth. And what does that suggest to your legal mind? Well, it suggests either that you have an extraordinary memory or... Or? Or that you're telling the plain, unvarnished truth. I'm afraid I have a very poor memory. I suppose I'm right in thinking that you had no communication with Hammond for several weeks before the catastrophe? Oh, quite. I'm positive of that. Let's see, the last time we met was at a tennis party at the McFarren's. I don't think I said more than two words to him. And you hadn't written to him? Oh, no. Well, one time you've been on fairly intimate terms with him. How did it happen that you stopped asking him to anything? Well, we hadn't anything much in common. and He was very popular, you know. Had a good many calls on his time. And, well, there didn't seem to be any need to shower him with invitations. Are you quite certain that was all? Well, I may as well tell you. We heard about his... Um, his wife. And once... Just by chance, I actually saw her. Oh? You never mentioned that? What was she like? Horrible. Covered with gold chains and bangles and bracelets. And a face like a mask. And it was after you knew about her that you stopped having anything to do with Hammond? Yes. Leslie, I think I should tell you that there is in existence a letter in your handwriting from you to Jeff Hammond. Oh, well, I've often sent him little notes to ask him something or other. This letter asks him to come and see you because Robert was going to be away. Oh, but that's impossible. I never did anything of the kind. You'd better read it for yourself. This is not my handwriting. I know. It's said to be an exact copy of one written on the day of Hammond's death. Well, Leslie? What does it mean? That's for you to say, Leslie. I didn't write it. I swear I didn't write it. If the original is in your handwriting, be no use denying it. It could be a forgery. It's difficult to prove that. It would be easy to prove it was genuine. Well, well, it's not dated. It might have been written years ago. Oh, if you'll give me a little time, I'll try to remember. Leslie, the prosecution could cross-examine your house, boys. They would soon find out whether someone took a letter to Hammond on the day of his death. I swear to you that I did not write this letter. Very well. And there's nothing more to talk about. I'll be going. Howard. Howard, wait a minute. I, um... I, I did write it, but I was afraid to mention it. I thought none of you would believe my story if I admitted that he'd come there at my invitation. Go on. You see, I, I was preparing a surprise for Robert's birthday. I knew he wanted a new gun, and I'm so dreadfully stupid about sporting things. 
I thought I'd talk to Jeff about it and get him to order it for me. Perhaps you've forgotten what's in the letter. Will you have another look at it? No, I don't want to. Then let me read it to you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I'm desperate, and if you don't come, I won't answer for the consequences. Don't drive up to the door. Leslie, I shall have to talk to you very plainly. I told Bob today that I was certain of your acquittal. And I didn't say that just to cheer him up. I don't believe the jury would have retired at all. But this letter alters the case completely. I won't tell you what I personally thought when I read the letter. The duty of counsel is to defend his client, not to convict her, even in his own mind. I don't want you to tell me anything but what is needed to save your neck. Oh. They can prove that Hammond came to your house at your urgent invitation. I don't know what else they can prove. But if the jury comes to the conclusion that you didn't kill Hammond in self-defense... Oh, no. They... They'll... They'll... Leslie! Matron! Matron, quickly! Yes, sir? Call nurse. Mrs. Crosby's ill. Mr. DeMille will return in just a moment with our stars, Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson for Act Two of the letter. Well, Sally here looks as if she wanted to say something first. What is it, Sally? I just want to look into the future for a moment, Mr. Rurick. Yes? What do you see there, Sally? Good news. A hundred years from now, there won't be any spring house cleaning. Hmm, you don't say. Why not? Because everything in the house will be waterproof. You just hose down a room, and presto, it's clean. Hmm, very simple indeed. But it won't help women who are doing their spring house cleaning right now. Oh, but I know something that'll make things awfully easy for them. So do I. New Quick Lux Flakes. Right. And I've heard loads of women say they've never seen anything like it. They love the way it bursts into suds at the touch of water. Yes, and it's amazing how rich those suds are, too. All fine, pure soap. No harmful alkali of any kind. And new quick lux goes so far. Yes, and it gives more suds, ounce for ounce, than any of ten other soaps tested. And that's true even in hard water. It's thrifty. It's so safe, too. There's nothing to hurt any color or fabric that's safe in water alone. It's wonderful how nice curtains and blankets and bedspreads look after a dip in new quick lux. And that goes for dozens of other things, too. Everything safe in water alone. Ladies, now that you're busy with your spring house cleaning... Get the fast, easy help New Quick Lux gives. Ask your grocer for a thrifty big box of New Quick Lux Flakes tomorrow. It comes in the same familiar package at no extra cost. And here's more news. Right now, thousands of grocers are featuring New Quick Lux Flakes in their spring house cleaning sales. It's a grand time to stock up. Use New Quick Lux for all your soap and water tasks. To help keep your things new looking longer... To save your hands. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Two of the letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie Crosby, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and James Stevenson as Howard Joyce. In that split fraction of a moment, before her mind slipped into the blackness, Leslie Crosby realized that the letter she had written to Jeff Hammond was damning evidence, enough to hang her. Now, a few minutes later, in the first aid room of the prison hospital, she leans wearily back in her chair, her eyes half closed. I'm afraid I've made rather a mess of things. I'm sorry. For Robert, not for me. You've distrusted me from the beginning, Howard. That's neither here nor there, Leslie. Who's got the letter now? The Eurasian woman who was Hammond's wife. Oh. Howard, are you going to let me be hanged? What do you mean by that, Leslie? You could get hold of the letter. Do you think it's so easy to do away with unwelcome evidence? But surely nothing would have been said to you if, if the owner wasn't quite prepared to sell it. 
That's quite true. But I'm not prepared to buy it. Oh, but it wouldn't be your money. Robert has saved some. I wasn't thinking of the money. I don't know if you'll understand this, Leslie, but I've always thought of myself as an honest man. You're asking me to do something which is no better than suborning a witness. Do you mean to say you can save me and you won't? What harm have I ever done you? You can't be so cruel. I want to do my best for you, Leslie, but a lawyer has a duty to his profession and to himself. I can't do what you ask. Oh, poor Robert. He doesn't deserve it. He's never hurt anyone in his life. He's so kind and simple and good, and he trusts me so. I mean everything to him, everything in the world. And this will ruin his life. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You despise me. You think he's well rid of me if they do hang me? I don't despise you. It isn't important what I feel about you, do you understand? I'm going to do what I can. Bob will want to know what the money's for. Will it be a very large sum? I imagine this woman has a pretty shrewd idea of the letter's value. You won't have to show Robert the letter, will you? I'll do everything possible to prevent him from seeing it. He'll be an important witness, and he should be as firmly convinced of your innocence as he is now. And after the trial? I'm going to try and save your life. Oh, if Robert loses his trust in me, he loses everything. It's strange that a man can live with a woman for ten years and not know the first thing about her. friend could be induced to part with the letter? I believe so, sir. But my friend has not got the letter. The woman has it. She did not know its value until my friend told her. What value did he put on it? Ten thousand dollars, sir. Only ten thousand? <laughs> Why not fifty or a hundred? For the reason, sir, that Mr. Crosby has in the bank of the British Malaya Company a savings account in the amount of only ten thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. $10,000 is a good deal of money, Ong. Yes, it is a good deal of money. Well, I'll speak to Mr. Crosby. Have the woman come to my office. I was about to mention, sir, she made two conditions. She insists that the money shall be brought to her. I can take you to the house whenever you are ready, sir. What's the other condition? That Mrs. Crosby shall bring it to her personally. You must be mad. Good heavens, man. Do you suppose Mrs. Crosby can just walk out of a prison cell whenever she feels like it? My friend thinks... You could arrange to have her stay at your house until the trial. I believe the judge will permit it if you are responsible for her, sir. Ong Chi Seng. Yes, sir. What are you getting out of this? Two thousand dollars, sir. And the satisfaction of being of service to you and our client. down, Howard. I've taken the liberty of ordering for you. Oh, thanks. Well, you're looking more cheerful, Bob. I feel better since this morning. I guess you finally convinced me we've nothing to worry about. Well, as a matter of fact, Bob, something's come up. Uh, oh, it's nothing very much, but I thought I'd better have a talk with you about it. Yeah? Uh, it seems that Leslie wrote a letter to Hammond asking him to come to the bungalow on the night he was killed. Why, that's impossible. You heard her say she'd had no communication with him for weeks before it happened. Nevertheless, she did write the letter. She... She wanted his advice on something she was buying you for your birthday. Your birthday was about then, wasn't it? Yes, end of April. In the excitement, she forgot the letter at the time and then later was afraid to say she'd made a mistake. But that's not like Leslie. She isn't afraid of anything. Well, this was a pretty serious mistake and she realized it. Who has the letter? Hammond's widow and she threatens to turn it over to the prosecution. Well, what if she does? Leslie can explain it in court just to explain it to you. <laughs> yes, but don't you see... It might alter things a good deal in the minds of the jury if Hammond came to your house by invitation. Well, what's to be done about it? I think we must get hold of that letter. I want you to authorize me to buy it. I'll do whatever you think is right. Buy the letter. I'll pay you back whatever it costs. Good. Now I'll put the matter out of your mind. Oh, uh, by the way, Leslie will be at the house tonight. I arrange to have her release pending trial. Tell me that's the same lace I saw you walking on at the McFarrens. How can you go so fast? Well, I haven't had anything else much to do this past month. What's it going to be? It's too fine for a tablecloth, surely. It's a coverlet for our bed. Oh, uh, uh, Dorothy, Leslie and I have some work to do this evening. Look here, Bob, why don't you take the girls to a picture? Well, 
Well, it won't take all evening, will it, Robin? Well, there's a lot to go over. No use you three hanging around. You'd much better see a good film. Yes, darling, go ahead. It'll take your mind off tomorrow. I want you to. All right, then. I'll bring the car around. Come on, Adele. I can see the legal mind is anxious to get rid of us. <laughs> Night, Leslie. Good night. Where do we have to go? Chinese Quarter. Some sort of a shop, I believe. Well, I always wanted to see the Chinese Quarter. I hear it's a bit creepy. Of course, I'd have chosen other circumstances for a visit. Be flippant about your own crimes if you want to, but don't be flippant about mine. Oh, I'm sorry, Howard. I didn't mean to be flippant. Really, I didn't. Maybe it's my own sense of guilt, but I have an unpleasant feeling that I'll have to pay the piper for what I'm doing tonight. I'm jeopardizing my whole career, and I have to rely on your discretion. Whatever else I am, I'm not ungrateful. Oh, forget what I said. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? Oh, a few years ago. How did you happen to take it up? Well, I wanted something to do, and it appealed to me. But it must take enormous concentration and patience. I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? Is that a legal question? You're not an ordinary client, Leslie. You've been watching me, Howard. I've felt it all evening, trying to read my thoughts. I'm trying to understand you. Why? Because I'm so... so evil. That's it, isn't it? Some time ago, I saw a volcano erupt. An island south of here, Guadi. It had been dormant for years, and then suddenly the crest blew off. It was terrifying and beautiful. Fire turned the sea and sky crimson, and three villages melted into ashes. It's time we were starting. Aung Chi Seng will be waiting for us. Come in. Please come in. This is the shop of my friend. If you will wait here, I will return in just a moment. Let's not be too long about it, Ong. I will speak to the lady at once, sir. Well, they seem to have a little of everything to sell here. Most of these shops do. That looks like good jade. And this dagger. See the workmanship and the ivory handle. Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes. One against himself. Will you follow me, please? The lady will see you now. She. You said she'd be here. She is coming, sir. Well, what's she standing there for? Ask her if she has the letter. Yes, sir. Nay go Feng Sun. I shima. Feng Sun. You ka chuck her the young mo. Go sun the com hole. You ka chuck her the young mo. Mrs. Crosby, I regret, but the veil that you wear over your head, Mrs. Hammond requests that you remove it. Of course. Yuka Fongole. Mrs. Crosby, Mrs. Herman has a further request. She wishes you to walk over to her. Now, look here. Tell her this oh, is enough. Oh, it's all right, Howard. I don't mind. May you need Fong Sun. Uttai! Sapei Kala! What does she say? Mrs. Hammond. You may have the letter if you will pick it up at her feet. Thank you. Gentlemen of the jury... Have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. The prisoner will please rise and look upon the jury. You find the prisoner at the bar, Leslie Crosby, guilty or not guilty? We find the defendant not guilty. And from that day on, I made a solemn vow that I wouldn't make another cocktail until Leslie was acquitted. So if these aren't up to my usual high standard, remember, I'm out of practice. 
Crosby, darling, they're wonderful. Never been better. Robert Crosby, right now you wouldn't know what you were drinking. I guess that's right. I can't taste or think or feel. All I can do is keep saying to myself over and over, Leslie's safe. Darling. Well, anyone planning to bathe, shower, or sponge before dinner should be getting at it. A shower for me. I've laid out some things for you, Leslie. Thank you. Darling, I'm going to tidy myself up a bit. No, d- don't go, Leslie. Why well, shan't be a minute? There's something I particularly want to talk to you about. And, Howard, I want to see you, too. I want your legal opinion. Oh, you do? What's up? Well, I want to get Leslie away from here as quickly as possible. I think a bit of a holiday do you both good. No, no, I mean for good. But how could we? You can't very well throw up your job. But I've got something in view that's much better. It's in Sumatra. We'd be away from everybody, and the only people around us would be Dutch. We'd start a new life. The only thing is that you'd be awfully lonely, darling, at the start. Oh, I wouldn't mind that. I'd like to go, Robert. I don't want to stay here. That settles it, then. I'll go straight ahead and we can fix things up at once. Is the money as good as here? Well, I hope it'll be better. At all events, I'll be working for myself and not for a company in London. What do you mean? Why should I go on sweating my life out for other people? This plantation belongs to a Malacca Chinese planter who's in financial difficulties, and he's willing to let it go for $30,000. If you can get the money the day after tomorrow. How on earth are you going to raise $30,000? Well, I've saved about ten, and the bank is willing to let me have the balance on mortgage. Uh, Robert, darling, I... Well, I shouldn't like you to take such a risk on my account. I'll be perfectly all right here. Really, I shall. Nonsense, darling. You just said you wanted to go. Oh, no, but I'm not sure it wouldn't be a mistake to run away. Everyone's been so kind, and they'll all help to make it easy for us. I think the thing to do is to stick it out here. Well, anyhow, it's not a thing you want to rush into. Let's wait and see. Why what... should I wait? It's a good thing. I don't want to lose it. Look... I've got all the papers in my briefcase. I'll go and get them, and you can see for yourself. And I have a couple of photographs of the bungalow to show Leslie. I don't want to see them. Please, Robert. Oh, calm, darling. That's just nerves. That shows how necessary it is for you to get away. But, Robert... I... Leslie, darling, in this case, you must let me have my own way. I won't be a minute. Howard. What are you going to do? What can I do? Oh, don't tell him now. I can't bear any more. You heard what he said? Wants the money at once to buy the estate. Can't. He hasn't got it. Give me a little time. I can pay it back. Leslie, I can't afford to let you have a sum like that. I've mortgaged everything I own. I was glad to advance it, Where but I can't... Where is the letter? I have it in my pocket. Oh, it will break his heart. What shall I do? I don't know, Leslie. If I tell him he'll want to see the letter, of course. Here we are. He's coming. What shall I do, Leslie? It's up to you. Well? Tell him... Tell him and have done with it. The lights come up in the Lux Radio Theater as the curtain falls on Act Two of The Letter, starring Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and James Stevenson. Will everyone remain very quiet, please? Because in this brief intermission, I've asked one of our audience to help me in a little test. Here she comes to the microphone now. Her name is Mrs. Lee Millar. And your home, Mrs. Millar, is... Oakland, California. Well, we are delighted to have you with us, Mrs. Millar. Now, do you see what I have in my hand? Why, two rubber bands. Yes. Will you take this one and stretch it as far as it will go? That's right. It stretches, then snaps right back, doesn't it? Yes, Mr. Roy. Well, now do the same with the other. Why, it's broken in two. Yes, because the second rubber band was all dried out. It lost all its elasticity, so it broke under strain. Now, the reason I asked Mrs. Millar to make this test was because the very same thing can happen to stockings. You see, when stockings are new and live and supple, they have great elasticity. They can stretch as you walk or run or stoop down, then spring back into shape with each motion of your leg. Yes, that's true. But if the threads get all dried out and lifeless, why then... They break when they stretch. Right. Now, one way to weaken elasticity is to use a soap that contains harmful alkali. This dries out the fibers. Another way is to rub with cake soap. This weakens the fibers, makes them less elastic, and more apt to break under strain. And you have a run. Well, I always lux my stockings, Mr. Roy. Good, because lux saves elasticity. New Quick Lux Flakes have no harmful alkali. And with Lux, there's no rubbing. That's why Lux keeps silk elastic and cuts down runs. No wonder it's America's favorite stocking care. 
and recommended by over 90% of the makers of both silk and nylon stockings in the United States. Why not save your stockings by washing them every night with new Quick Lux Flakes? Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain rises on the third act of the letter. Robert Crosby has returned to the room. His thoughts full of plans for the purchase of the new plantation. In silence, Leslie and Joyce watch Robert, brimming over with enthusiasm, arrange his papers on the desk. This is really a handsome estate. We'll be stealing it for 30000 Bob, I, I don't like to throw cold water on your plans, but hasn't it struck you that the costs of uh, what we've just been through will be pretty heavy? Costs? Oh, yes, the legal expenses. Oh, you know, I couldn't charge you anything for my services, but there are certain out-of-pocket oh, expenses... Oh, that's awfully that... decent of you. I'm not sure I could accept that. But what do these other expenses amount to? Well, the principal item is that letter of Leslie's I mentioned to you. Oh, yes, yes I'd almost forgotten. You see, you were going to... I had to pay a great deal of money for it. Well, if you thought it necessary, I'm not going to grouse. How much was it? Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars? Well, you must have been mad. You may be quite sure I wouldn't have given that if I could have got it for less. Oh, that, that's every cent I have in the world. Why didn't you let them bring the letter in and explain it to the jury? I didn't dare. What do you mean? It was absolutely necessary to suppress it? If you wanted Leslie acquitted. <laughs> What was there in the letter? I told you at the time. It was very stupid of me, Robert. I, I remember now. You wrote to Hammond to ask him to come to the bungalow. Yes. You wanted to get something for me, didn't you? Yes, I wanted to get you a gun. He knew all about that sort of thing, and you know how ignorant I am. Buying that letter was a criminal offense, wasn't it? Well, not the sort of thing a respectable lawyer does in the ordinary way of business. It was a criminal offense. Yes, it was. I might be disbarred for it. Then why did you do it? You of all people. What were you trying to save me from? Leslie... You knew I was buying a gun from Cameron. Why did you want to make me a present of another? But how should I know you're going to buy a gun? Well, because I told you. Well, I've forgotten. I can't remember everything. You haven't forgotten that. What do you mean, Robert? Why are you talking has, to me like who this? Who has the letter now? I have. Where is it? Bob, it's not your letter or mine. It's... I've got to pay $10,000 for that letter. I'm going to see it. Let him see it. Thank you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No, you couldn't. We've been in love for years. It's not true. I used to meet him constantly, once or twice a week. Every time we met, I hated myself for it. It was horrible. I loathed myself. I was like a person who was ill. Then came a time about a year ago when he began to change toward me. I didn't know what was the matter. I was frantic. I made scenes. I threw myself at his feet. Leslie! Then I heard about that... that native woman. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her walking in the village with those hideous pangles and that chalky face and eyes like a cobra's eyes. But I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. You've read the letter. I would always been so careful about writing before. But this time I didn't care. I hadn't seen him for ten days. He came and I told him I knew about his marriage. Oh, at first he denied that I was frantic. I don't know what I said to him. I hated him because he'd made me despise myself. I insulted him. I cursed him. At last he turned on me. He told me he was sick and tired of me. That it was true about the other woman. That she was the only one who really meant anything to him. He said he was glad I knew because now I'd leave him alone. I knew if he went out that door I'd never see him again. I seized the revolver and fired. He gave a cry and I saw I'd hit him. I ran after him and I fired and fired and fired until there were no more cartridges. That's what happened. And I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. How could you do this to me, Leslie? How could you? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have let myself go. I've got to think. Leslie. Well, 
He's going to forgive you. Yes. He's going to forgive me. And the fifth couple are the Prescott. Oh, yes. Robert's told me about them. You'll adore them, Leslie. Now, both of you get a good sleep because it'll be a late party. Good night. Good night, Dorothy. Good night. Robert, it's lucky you brought your dinner coat. You'd hardly fit in one of Howard's. Now, let's see what else you'll need. Oh, how about your studs? They're probably still in the bureau at home. Home. Robert, it's no use, is it? We can't make it go, can we? I don't know. I'm not sure. Robert, you're so kind and so generous. You should have had the sort of wife you really deserve. And through no fault of yours, I've failed you. Wrecked your life. I can't ask you to forgive me. If you love a person, you can forgive anything. But what about you? Can you go on? Oh, I'll try. I'll really try. That's not what I was asking. I'll do everything to make you happy. Everything in my power. That isn't enough. Unless, Leslie, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. Kiss me, then. Kiss me. As if... Robert. No. No, I can't. I can't. I can't. Leslie, tell me, Leslie, what is it? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. My dear, they're all waiting for you. This is your party, you know. I'm sorry, Dorothy. I took rather long to dress. Leslie, isn't that your lace work? Yes. Were you working on it just now? A little. I'm anxious to finish it. Leslie, please come downstairs. Of, of course, dear. In a few minutes. Very well. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. At last, he turned on me. He was sick and tired of me. She was the only one who meant anything to him. She was the only one. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired, fired, and fired, and fired until there were no more cartridges. I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to... Who's out there? Who is it? You, I see you there. Mr. Crosby! Come here. What are you doing out there? I don't want to come. She, Maggie, may come. She tell me I come here. She? Mrs. Hammond? Yo, Mrs. Hammond. She tell me I come here. Bling dagger. Leave it outside window. Yes. Dagger, Missy. She say, bling dagger to you. She's here, then. Miss Hammond on path by gate. You no go in garden, Miss Crosby. She kill you. She wait there. That is what a dagger me. She kill you. You go in garden. Missy, you know tell the police I come. You know tell the police I come. You know tell the police I come. Miss Dagger, see the workmanship on the ivory handle. Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes. One against himself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. Leslie. 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 Yes. You've got to do something about Bob. He's behaving very strangely. What is it? Uh, I don't know. First I thought he was drunk, but it's worse than that. I'll be right down. <laughs> but where will you ship from, Crosby? Oh, it's near a good harbor, only five, six miles away. And I can ship my rubber for less money. I want to get ahead fast. In 10, 15 years, I can live in London, travel, <laughs> do anything I please. Uh, Robert, will you come outside with me, darling, please? Not now, darling. Maybe later. I'm telling the boys about my new plantation. Sounds like quite a place. Of course, we'll miss Singapore. Our friends are here. We've had some mighty fine times. No English people in that part of Sumatra, only Dutch and natives. Going to be a little lonely at first, maybe. But we'll get used to it. Robert, I... There'll be just... The two of us. 
But my wife's a good sport. Always can count on her. She's not afraid of anything. And we'll have each other. That's the important thing. Stop it! Stop, stop it! I can't stand anymore. I can't stand it! Give me a drink. I want a drink. <laughs> Howard, where is Leslie? Where did she go? She ran out into the garden. The garden? I'll find her. No, let her alone. There's nothing you can do for her. You no go in garden. She kill you. You no go in garden, Missy. The worst on the She'll kill you. I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I couldn't give him up. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. That's not true. It means I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No. We've been in love for years. We've been in love for years. We've been in love for years. Miss Crosby, go back. Go back. Oh. You kill her. You kill her. Heard, I say. Who is that? Who move? Oh, police! Police! Don't move, I will shoot! What? What you do here? I do nothing! I tell her not go into garden! I tell her! Oh, this woman. She. she is dead. Her John had I said, What does the She say. she kill her. It was right. She died. Leslie! 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 Bring to a close tonight's performance of The Letter. In a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But while we're waiting, listen to this. Hear that clock? Morning, noon, and night. Three times a day, seven days a week, the dishes have to be washed. You can't get around it, but you can make it pleasanter the way thousands of women have. That's with new, quick, Lux Flakes. It helps do away with one of the things women hate most about dishwashing, the red, rough housework look it gives your hands. Yes, new, quick Lux is kind to hands. This was recently proved by hundreds of dramatic one-hand tests made in a laboratory under conditions similar to home dishwashing. Five different soaps frequently used for dishwashing, including Lux, were tested. Three times a day, for weeks, hundreds of women dipped one hand in Lux suds, the other in suds from another soap. The results were amazing. The Lux hands looked so much softer and smoother than the other hands. Now you know that lovely hands are such an important part of a woman's charm. You want yours to stay soft and smooth, of course. So why not try new Quick Lux Flakes in your dishpan tomorrow? Will you do that? It's in the same familiar box, and it costs you no more. It's fast, thrifty, and so kind to your hands. Here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Back for a curtain call come the stars of the letter. Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall... And James Stevenson. Mr. DeMille, I know Herbert Marshall and James Stevenson join me in thanking every member of the fine cast which appeared with us tonight. Mm -hmm, and so do we. Tell me, how is your vacation, Betty? Oh, I always have a wonderful time in New Hampshire. We've been reading about the big celebration they had of the premiere of your new picture, The Great Liar, Littleton. Your birthday, too, wasn't it, Betty? Yes, Jimmy. We were trying to raise some money for local charity, and Warner Brothers very kindly came through with the premiere of The Great Lie to help us raise the money. After that birthday party, Hollywood must seem like a ghost town. Well, it seems restful for the first time. I've enjoyed very much coming back to the Lux Radio Theater tonight, Mr. DeMille, and I'd like to know what you plan for next week. Next week's play, Betty, is the delightful comedy Wife, Husband, and Friend. And who's in the cast, Mr. DeMille? We're going to have George Brent, Priscilla Lane, and Gail Patrick. You'll hear George Brent as a perfectly normal businessman whose wife... 
played by Priscilla Lane, is ambitious to become an opera singer. The solution to this domestic problem comes in a surprise twist that made the 20th Century Fox picture a hit on the screen and gives us a gay and exciting prospect for next Monday night. That's a show I certainly don't want to miss, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. You've written your names in red letters here tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have just learned that the Lux Radio Theater has again been selected by the readers of the Movie Radio Guide magazine as the best dramatic program on the air. It's the third consecutive year that this theater has received the Movie Radio Guide Award. And to all who participated in the poll, we express the gratitude of our sponsors and of the entire staff of this theater. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Brent, Priscilla Lane, and Gail Patrick in Wife, Husband, and Friends. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Herbert Marshall will soon be seen in the Columbia picture Adventure in Washington. James Stevenson appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and will soon be seen in their production of Shining Victory. Now, an important announcement. As you know, many localities switch to daylight saving time next Sunday. If your community is one of those changing to daylight saving time, you will hear this program at the usual hour. If your community remains on standard time, tune in one hour earlier. Check your newspaper or radio magazine for the correct time. Included in tonight's play were Richard Davis as Withers, Charlie Lung as head boy, Gloria Holden as the woman, and Suzanne Caron. Wally Mayer, Eleanor Stewart, Eric Snowden, and Leela Hyams McIntyre. Our music is directed by Louis Silver. Our Lux Radio Theater production of The Letter has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of new quick Lux flakes, the tissue-thin soap flakes used by smart housewives everywhere and by the great picture studios here in Hollywood to protect the million-dollar wardrobes that you see on the screen. Your announcer has been Melville Roy, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. of this woman who came up from cheap honky-tonks to take her place in society in the grandest house on the smartest street in town, Flamingo Road. But what was the shadowy story behind her spectacular rise? Who were the men of power and influence who became the stepping stones that took her to Flamingo Road? Was it Dan who taught her to trust? Or was it Fields who taught her to love? Was it Semple who taught her to hate? I'm going to crucify you. You and Dan both. You're going to tell him it was a frame-up and that Dan is innocent. Because if you don't, I'll kill you. I was in love with you. You at least knew you weren't in love with me. I thought I had more power than he had, and you'd be secure. Dan, that's not true. No one has ever played me for quite such a sucker.
the warrior of the woodlands, Ranger Bill, is coming up next. <laughs> Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. <laughs> A fellow once asked me if being a ranger didn't get rather monotonous. I said, sure it does. About one hour a week. That might be for one hour on Sunday afternoon right after church. This is a crazy business, too. Every time that phone rings, the chills run up and down my spine. Uh -oh. There they go. The chills, I mean. Well, let's find out what's on the other end of the wire. Ranger headquarters, Bill Jefferson speaking. Windows and awnings on your home, Mr. Jefferson? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I, I do. <laughs> ah, fella just never knows what's coming over that talking machine. I like the call I received during today's adventure. Say, I almost forgot to tell you about it. And it's a real spine chiller, too. The Deadly Laundry Basket. a beautiful day. Oh, it's a lovely day. Too nice to do laundry, but George will have to go to work in his denim shirt if I don't wash. Honestly, Madge, where do all the soil clothes come from? Oh, I've asked myself the same thing. I certainly am thankful for automatic washers and dryers. Yes, indeed. Why, I remember my mother using the old-fashioned washing machine and then hanging the clothes by hand. And in nasty weather, she had to hang the clothes in the basement. And then it took days for them to dry. Oh, I know. It must have been terrible. Why are you going in the garage? Jeff carried the laundry basket full of clothes out here last night before he went bowling. Now I'll have to sort it and get to work. Oh, is that a hint for me to go? <laughs> yes, for both of us if we want to make that PTA tea this afternoon. Oh, good grief. I forgot about the tea. Well, I'd better get up a full head of steam. Bye till later. Bye, dear. Oh, let me see. Jeff's socks, Peter's shirts. Oh, my, where did that grease spot come from? Well. What? Rattlesnake! <laughs> oh, no. Polly, what is it? Rattlesnake in the basket bit me. Oh, I'll get help. Get out of the garage and stay still. <laughs> Frank, get the first aid kit on the double. Got it. Let's get to work. Only this will hurt. It'll save your life. Go ahead. Got the fang marks, Frank. Right. Hold still, ma'am. Here's the suction cup. Mitch! Fred! Let's pick her up. Put her in the squad car. Okay. Lift. Get going. I'll radio for a clear road to the hospital. Take it easy, Madge. She'll be at the hospital in five minutes. And... Can they save her? I don't know. She has a good chance, believe me. Now, I've got to empty that basket. Oh, oh! how are you going to do that without getting hurt? You watch. Soon that rattler will be dead as a doornail. Be 
careful, Jim. Don't worry. I'll pull the basket out on the lawn with the hoe. How are you going to get that terrible thing out of the basket? Easy. Stand back now. I'm going to shoot. Is this far enough? That's fine. Now I'll tip the basket over with the hoe. It isn't in there. Oh, that's just what he wants us to think. I'll push the clothes around a little with the hoe. Oh, it might bite. No, he can't reach the length of the hoe handle. Oh, there it is. Uh, That rattler won't bite anyone again. Oh, thank the Lord. I'll pick over the rest of the clothes to make sure there's only one in there. I'm scared to touch my own laundry now. I'll go home with you and make sure that all you have in your laundry basket is soiled clothes. I don't know yet. She's a very sick woman. I was afraid of that. It was too long before our first aid was administered. Yeah, I'll say. Jim, we've we've got to do something about this. Yeah, and how? This is the fifth rattler bite case in two weeks. Yeah, and they all come from the homes along the edge of the woods. What are you thinking about, Jim? When I went to police school in Washington, I met a ranger by the name of Bill Jefferson. Oh, a Texas ranger? No, a forest ranger. What was he doing at police school? Oh, they have to know law enforcement and crime prevention, too, Frank. Oh, that figures. Oh, pardon me. What were you going to say about him? Uh, uh, no, yeah. He's got quite a reputation out west as really being on the ball. Well, how do you know? Say, you sure are a noise- nosy cop, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I should be. You taught me. <laughs> okay, okay. I stopped to see him several years ago when we took our vacation out west. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. At that time, Bill and his firefighters had... Just put out one of the worst fires in history. Hmm. There's a lot of talk about Bill's ability. I'm going to call him. And don't ask how I know his phone number. Or I'll pinch you for abusing an officer. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, by the way, hadn't I better report to the chief? No, you don't have to. Well, why not? Because you and I, buddy, have been assigned to stamp out this rattlesnake problem. <whistles> this isn't going to be easy. I know. But our orders are to get rid of the pesky snakes, right down to the last rattle. And maybe Bill Jefferson can give us the answer as to how to do it. Ranger headquarters, Bill Jefferson speaking. I have a call for you, sir, from West Grove, Illinois. Hmm. West Grove? Now I'll take it, operator. Your party's reg- ready, Sergeant Donato. Thank you. Hello, Bill. Uh, yes, this is Bill Jefferson. This is Jim Donato, Bill, West Grove Police. Jim Donato? Hmm. Oh, sure, now I know you are. Long time no see or hear, Jim. Likewise. How are you, anyhow, Bill? Fine, how about you? Same. Except I've got a big headache right now. Hmm? Real problem. Mm, too bad. Sounds serious. It is. Not large, but serious. The problem's only two feet long at the most. Ah, snake? Yeah. Not one, but dozens. Maybe hundreds. They're biting and harassing the folks here that own homes along the edge of the woods. Sounds like uh, rattlesnakes or copperheads. Well, they shake their tails. At least they're supposed to before they bite. <laughs> you sound rather bitter, Jim. Yeah. One struck kind of close to home this morning. Neighbor lady was bitten. We still don't know if she's going to live or not. Mm, Sorry to hear that. How about flying up on the next plane and see what you can do, Bill? We'll pay the freight. Sure, I'll be glad to. Uh, How do I get to West Crow? Oh, never mind that. You wire me plane time, and I'll be at Midway to meet you. All right. Uh, See you sometime tomorrow. Thanks, Bill. Thanks a lot. Don't mention it, Jim. Goodbye. Uh, say, Bill. Hmm? Yeah? You you are a good snake man, aren't you? <laughs> You'll have to ask the snakes about that. Are 
Are you comfortable, Mr. Jefferson? Yes, I was very comfortable, thank you. That's fine. If you need anything, please ask me, all right? Right. Fine with me. Hey, what's ailing you, Henry? Bugs in your safety belt? No. Boy, is she making eyes at you. <laughs> it's the uniform. Oh, sure. Of course, the, uh, the handsome cut of your face and the... The way those muscles bulge under your shirt has nothing to do with it. Oh, cut it out, will you? You jealous? Yes. As a matter of fact, I am. She hasn't asked me ten dozen times if I'm comfortable. Say, uh, how'd you find out her name? It's sewn on her uniform blouse, <laughs> knucklehead. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, maybe you could faint or something so she could really go for you. Is that so... How would you like to make the rest of the trip to Chicago sitting on the wing of this no, plane? No, thanks. I'm quite comfortable right here. <laughs> Say, Bill, uh, what about this snake business? What about it? Well, do you think it's really as serious as it sounds? Yes, I think so, Henry. It sounds to me like a plague of small rattlers has struck the area. The snakes are called swamp rattlers, about two feet long. <laughs> two feet or ten feet? Doesn't make much difference if they bite you with a full load of venom. Well, this is West Grove, fellas. Oh, very nice suburban community, Jim. Yeah. I suppose you fellas are used to seeing mountains as a backdrop, huh? Yeah. Why, well, this is a very nice town. <laughs> Calling squad three. Calling squad three. Uh-oh. Squad three, bye. Where are you? Just entering town. The child's been bitten by a rattler at the West Elementary School. Proceed at once. We'll send ambulance. Acknowledge. We're on our way. 10-4. Must be over there, Jim, close to the shrubbery. Right. I've got the first aid kit. Let's go. All right. You teachers, get the children back. Henry, get the snake. Right. Ready, Bill. Yeah. I'll hold the child still. You give the treatment. Brave youngster. Not a whimper. Yes, I miss my guess. This child is paralyzed by fear. Hardly breathing. <sighs> Finished. Okay, I'll carry him. Uh -oh. That snake's out of business. Uh, two of them. <sighs> Great Scott, he must have run into a nest of rattlesnakes. Yeah. There he is, boys. Take good care of him. We've done the preliminary work. I better get that boy some help. Squad three to motorcycles five and six. Cycle five, six is with me. Heat ambulance going to General Hospital at Green and Elm. Snake bite case. First aid delayed. Critical. 10-4. We're on our way, Sarge. 10-4. Well, we did what we could do. Sure hope the little guy makes it. Yeah, so do I, Jim. Now, how's the neighbor lady you mentioned when you called? Okay now, Bill. She just made it. Oh, good. Glad to hear it. Bill? Hmm? Told me to get that snake. Well, I did all right, but then all his relatives showed up. Boy, boy, the woods is crawling with them. That's what I thought, Henry. Uh, Jim, can you get every man, woman, and child in this area here at the school this evening? Uh, school teachers, too. Sure. Especially if it's about the snakes. It is. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I've asked you here this evening to listen and learn from a man who knows all the answers as far as the outdoors is concerned. And he knows an awful lot about snakes. Where he comes from, they have to deal with a savage and deadly diamondback rattlesnake and sundry other snakes. I'd like to present my personal friend, Chief Ranger Bill Jefferson. Good evening, folks. The purpose of this meeting is twofold. First, to teach you how to identify a rattlesnake or any poisonous snake, and how to give first aid for snake bite to yourself or anyone else. Secondly, I hope to overcome your fear of snakes by helping you to understand them and their habits and their fears. Now, I have in this box a real and very much alive rattlesnake. There isn't any need for anyone to get excited or panic. I won't let it loose. But uh, I do want to show it to you. Its coloring and markings and its size. This is very important, since you must be able to recognize this poisonous snake instantly. I have in my hand a snake pole with which I will hold the snake on this table under the light. As an extra safety precaution, the reptile is now under sedation. I'll remove it from the box, place it on the table, and hold it there with this pole and loop. Those of you who wish may file past and spend all the time you like looking at it, so you'll know it the next time you see it. If you'll file in back of these chairs... You'll be at more than a safe distance from the snake. Are you ready, pal? Sure. Okay, open the box. Okay. Stand back now. Right. There we go. Out of the box and onto the table. Now you may file up and see this troublemaker that's been giving you near heart failure and some of you near death. Look at that thing, Jim. Look at that baby. It's fantastic. Well, you're telling me. You know, Bill says that fear is worse than the bite itself. Yeah, I can understand that all right. Look, it's like everyone's going to come up here and take a look at it. Oh, that's good. It's for their own good. Yeah, I'll say it is. After all, we have a lot of good snakes in this part of the country. There's no use getting all bothered and killing them off. Man, Bill's sure got control of his audience. <laughs> yeah, just like he's got control of that killer on the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, take the box and put it in the trunk of the car, will you, pal? Sure, I'd be glad to. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your fine cooperation. The Lord put many good snakes on earth. The non-poisonous snakes eat mice and rats and other pesky rodents, and they do a good service to man. In fact, several non-poisonous snakes, such as the king snake, are bitter enemies with the rattlesnake, and the two cannot and will not inhabit the same area. If the king snake moves in, the rattler packs his bags and leaves town. And why don't we get a thousand king snakes and bring them in here? Well, the idea is fine, but uh, the king snake wouldn't like it here, sir. I knew it sounded too easy. <laughs> now, I want to teach you first aid technique and how to tell the difference between the poisonous and non-poisonous snakes. There's one final word I want to give you before we quit. Boys and girls, you remember this especially. When you see a snake, leave it alone unless you positively know what kind of snake it is. Repeat that over and over to yourself so you won't forget it. Well, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you, and good night. You did a wonderful job, Bill. This night's work will save a lot of pain and anguish. 
Maybe some lungs. I shouldn't have any more delayed first aid. We'll hope we don't have any more bites. I hope so, too, Jim. I told them where to expect the snakes to hide and how to safely flush them out into the open to kill them. Oh, but what if it doesn't help? Then we'll have to hold a snake hunt. But, oh, isn't that dangerous, Bill? I mean, shouldn't experienced men do the job? When you've got dozens and dozens of rattlesnakes corralled, anything can happen, Jim. Yeah, I'll say it could. Like disarming a dud bomb. Oh, it's so nice to have you home, Polly. It's wonderful being home, Madge. I think. What do you... Madge, look over there! Polly! There it is! It. There in the bushes! Oh, oh. That's only a piece of garden hose. Are you sure? Yes. Here, I'll pick it up and show you if you like. No, please. Please, don't go near the bushes. Polly, please, get a hold of yourself. I'm sorry, Madge. But I'm just a bundle of nerves. I was afraid of this. Let me stay with you until Jeff comes home. Well, certainly. We're going to have to move. That's all there is to it. Well, everything seems to have quieted down this week. No snake bite cases. That's right. For which I'm very thankful. I agree, Henry. Things seem calm and serene. Here comes Frank with hot news. I'll say it's hot. Here, read this paper, Jim, and see for yourself. You joking? Hmm. Where's the hot news? This is the want ads section. Mm, go on, read them. Hey, if you think I'm going to read all these ads, you're not... Go on, not... here. Look at this column over here, under Homes for Sale. Great day in the morning. Every house along the edge of the woods is for sale. Uh, honestly? Yes, honestly. Every home except Jim's. They won't sell them. That's the point. They won't because who'd buy them? But you know what they are going to do? Sue the builder? No, they gave that up. But they're going to abandon them. They'll lose them. That amounts to considerable money and, and hard work. Why are you guys looking at Bill like that? Oh, maybe that big fat meeting the other night made them too snake conscious. No, Frank. Now they're just getting to the saturation point. The nerves are giving out now. The tension's been on too long, and I can't blame them. But what can we do to keep them from throwing away their homes? Say something, will you, Bill? Did you fellas ever see an electric screen door in action? Electric screen door? Yes, I have. By George, Bill, you know it might work. Let's go out and talk to your neighbors, Jim. like such a puny fence to keep snakes out. In what way, Polly? It's so yeah. low. <laughs> I've never seen a rattler jump a fence yet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I sounded pretty foolish. No, not at all. Polly, you laughed. You haven't done that in days. You're right, Madge. I guess I'm getting used to living dangerously. Oh, come on now. It's not that bad. And it won't be as bad if you follow the simple rules I set up. Keep your garage floors clean of all boxes, bags, baskets, and... Everything you can behind which a snake could be concealed. Put uh, wire mesh around your evergreens, shrubbery, or, and trim the bottom high and thin. Keep garage doors closed, and all other doors should have strong closing devices on them. Uh, incidentally, snakes don't like power mowers. Uh, keep your lawns cut short. In other words, don't give them any place to hide, right? That's right. Well, what about the children going to and from school? If they stay on the walks, they'll be all right. Perfectly safe. But are we going to have to live this way for the rest of our lives? No, you won't, Madge. I'll train the men how to hold snake hunts safely, and you'll soon be rid of them. They'll go back into the swamp and stay there. Henry and I and Jim and Frank will uh, make a snake hunt in the morning and see how many we find. Who, me? Sure. You'll soon be the best snake man this side of the Mississippi, Frank. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, hmm. hello, Polly. How many did you get so far? Not a one. Aw, oh, come on, Bill. You can't hand me that line. Hold up the sacks, fellas. Here's mine, man. Here's mine. This one doesn't rattle. Why, I just can't believe it. What happened? I think all the vibration from building the fence drove them away. They don't like that. Boy, I'm so relieved, and I'm happy, too. You know, I didn't really want to move, and now we don't have to. Uh, just one request, Polly. Yes? Please keep your laundry basket off the garage floor. <laughs> I understand Polly has the garage floor so clear of objects that even a cricket has it hard to find places to hide. The fear of snakes is far worse than the snake really is. If you understand them and know their habits, you can act promptly when they get pesty and dangerous. And there are good snakes, too. And remember, never go near a snake you can't positively identify as being harmless. Well... See you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill features Myron Canaday in the title role with Roger Compton as Henry and Ed Ronnie as Grey Wolf. Written by Charles Urquhart and John Rowan, Ranger Bill is produced and directed by Jim Grant and Charles Christensen, with sound effects including reproductions from the Cook Laboratories of Stamford, Connecticut, by John McComb. Original music for this transcribed series by Dick Anthony. of the United States Marine Corps shakes the skies, the seas, the enemy island fortresses. It is history in the making as the flying leathernecks set the dramatic pace along the battle-scarred, blood-stained pathway to world freedom. You just can't bring yourself to point your finger at a guy and say, go get killed. You got enough troubles of your own for one man. Stop trying to pack everybody else's around. Schedule admission. Roger. I got a belly full of you. And I'm not buying the bill of good you're selling. I hope you'll say, let's take off these insignia and step out in the boondocks and get it settled. But out of the turmoil of a world at war comes a romantic adventure of such infinite tenderness that it will rank with the screen's great love stories. Are we all buttoned up? Cat's out. Door's locked. All secure, sir. personal favorites, George Burns and Gracie Allen are up next in our lineup. Well, hello. Come right in. Oh, George, we've got company. <laughs> Good 
This is Bill Goodwin speaking for Lever Brothers, makers of Swan, the new white floating soap. Well, it's Tuesday night again, and that means another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, their guest, Rita Hayworth, Jimmy Cash, and Paul Whiteman and his music. And now meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Gracie, Gracie, did, uh, did the postman get here yet? Now, George, that's the fourth time you've asked me. But, honey, it's important. Well, don't worry. He'll be here any minute with your copy of Cowboy Love Tales. Oh, gee. I wish he'd hurry. Oklahoma, Texas, in a terrible spot. You see, he, he and Lucy were alone in the, in the ranch house, and Lucy was cooking their dinner, then suddenly six bandits came in. Oh, that's terrible. You bet. Poor Lucy only cooked dinner for two. <laughs> I'll see you later. Uh, Texas in trouble. My goodness. <laughs> He's like a child. Good morning, Mrs. Burns. Oh, it's the postman. Good morning. Here's your husband's magazine. Oh, thank you. Well, how are you feeling today, Mr. Postman? Oh, fit as a fiddle. <laughs> of course, I'm always in top-notch condition. Oh, yes. <laughs> I know. Did you have a nice Christmas? Yes, indeed. Was a little old man with a red nose and big stomach good to you this year? Oh, yes. George gave me... Oh, you mean Santa Claus. Oh. <laughs> oh, yes. I got some lovely things. Well, that's nice. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Burns. Happy New Year. Oh, and a very, very happy New Year to you, although I know it won't show. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. And remember, keep smiling. <laughs> Oh, boy, let's see it. Texas in a terrible spot. I've got to... Hey, hey, there's been a mistake. What? Look at this cover. It's Hopper's Bazaar. Oh, I wondered why Oklahoma Tex was wearing a backless evening gown. <laughs> I'm going to sue the post office for every cent they've got. Oh, now, George, calm down. They can't down. do that Calm down. They hey. just delivered it to the wrong address. And the other people must have gotten your magazine. I'll go and get it. Yeah, well, hurry back. Oh, me, well, let me Texas in trouble. Oh, it's just down the street, hmm. dear. That's it. It's Rita Hayworth's house. I'll be right back. Yeah, you go right... Who's, uh, whose house? Rita Hayworth. Rita? Well, maybe a little fresh air wouldn't do me any harm. <laughs> George Burns, get that gleam out of your eye. Gracie, it's, it's, it's... I've always got that gleam in my eye when I'm worried about Oklahoma Tex. No, I've, I've seen that one. This is a new gleam entirely. Gracie, stop being silly. I meant we'll both go. Oh, well, all right. Hmm. Hello, kids. Oh, oh hello, hello Bill. Bill. I'll be back as soon as I get my hat here. You going out, George? Yeah. Going over to Rita Hayworth's house. Rita Hayworth? <whistles> That's a lie. <laughs> I'm only going over to get my magazine. Mm, uh-huh. On your way, will you drop me off at Betty Grable's house? I want to get my shoes shined. <laughs> very funny. Very funny. That's a scream. Bill, the postman left cowboy love tales at Rita Hayworth's. Oh. Well, I'll go get it for you, George. Goodbye. Come back here. You'd stay there all day. I want to find out if Oklahoma Tech's got away from those bandits. Oh, well, I can tell you that. Sure he gets away. Really? Yeah. But how, Bill? They had him cornered in the ranch house. Well, I'll tell you, George. You know, the bandits were backing Tex slowly down the hall. Yeah? And, and you know how fast Tex is on the draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, quick as a flash, yeah. he whips out a bar of swan soap and jumps in the bathtub. Oh, <laughs> Well, you see, Tex knows that Swan is the new white floating soap that's purer than the finest Castiles. He knows that money can't buy a purer soap. Okay, okay. I'll read it myself. Gracie, hurry. Hey, don't you want to know how Oklahoma protects Lucy and her ranch hands? Yeah, but you won't tell me. I know you. Oh, sure, I'll tell you. Lucy's hands are protected with Swan. Gracie, hurry. You see, George, Swan is not only a suds and whiz, but remember, it's purer than the finest Castile, so it's just got to be kind to your hands. That's why you should use Swan for washing the dishes or for any other soap and water job in the house. So then, Oklahoma, Texas... I don't want to hear any more about it. You don't want to hear how he saved Lucy? No. Or how he shot his way out of the nest of rattlesnakes? No. Or how he... No. No. Well, gee, George, don't you even want to hear how you can break Swan in two with a simple twist of the wrist? Yep. And use half in the kitchen for dishes and housework and half in the bathroom for your hands and face? Yep. That I want to hear. Good, Bill. Tell me all about Swan. 
Oh, now you're just trying to milk me. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Come on, Gracie, hurry up. Aren't you, dear? Yes, I am. Well, George Burns, remember this. The only thing Rita Hayward's got that you're interested in is cowboy love tales. Well, of course. Yes? Is this the Burns residence? That's right. Say, aren't you uh, Rita Hayward? Yes. Oh. I came over to give little Georgie Burns his magazine. Uh, <laughs> little Georgie Burns? Yes, the postman left it at my house. <laughs> it's called Cowboy Love Tales. The trash those kids will read. <laughs> <laughs> those kids will read trash, yes. I knew he must be a very small boy. You know, these stories naturally appeal to an undeveloped mind. <laughs> Oh, sure. <laughs> is, uh, is little Georgie here? Uh, little Georgie. Oh, 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 little Georgie, yes, yes. He's, uh, he's a very smart little fellow. He's just six years old last month. Oh, how nice. Do you have any other grandchildren? <laughs> no, he's, he's my son. Uh, George Burns Jr. We call him Georgie Boy. Georgie boy. Oh, that's a sweet name. Is he cute? Looks like me. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, well, anyway. Oh, all right, uh, dear. I'm ready. Oh, oh we have Gracie. Company. Yes, Gracie. This is uh, Rita Hayward. Uh, she came over to swap the magazines. I'll go and get her copy of Hopper. Oh, well, it was sweet of you to save us a trip, Miss Hayward. Oh, not at all. You know, I knew Georgie boy must be dying to read his cowboy love tales. Did you say Georgie Boy? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me, does he really look like his father? Well, it's uh, hard for me to say. You see, his father and I aren't very intimate. <laughs> well, well, I can understand that. But uh, tell me more about Georgie Boy. Does he bathe himself? <laughs> well, certainly. Of course, once in a while I scrub his back. <laughs> oh, how adorable. I'd love to come over and watch him splash around. <laughs> well, I, 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 he, he wouldn't like that. He's kind of bashful. Oh, well, do you think Georgie would, would like to come over to my house one day and play? Well, he might like to, but he won't. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but don't you think I could amuse him? Miss Hayworth, if you don't mind, I prefer to amuse my husband myself. Oh, your husband? I thought Georgie was your son. Well, how could he be my son? I'm married to him, and that would make me my own mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Why, this is wonderful. You know, he pretended to have a son because he didn't want to admit he reads cowboy love tales himself. Oh, so that's it. <laughs> uh, okay, Miss, uh, Miss Hayworth, thank you. Hey, 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 hey. What's, uh, what's, what's a joke? Hello, little Georgie boy. <laughs> ah, so you had to tell her. Well, all right, so I read Cowboy Love Tales. I happen to love Oklahoma Tex. He's a square shooter and he's very brave. Oh, isn't he cute? Whoa. <laughs> you're not in love with somebody else, the boys and the six hits and a miss have a question for you. It's, why don't you fall in love with me?
for the last three hours, Rita Hayworth and Gracie have been having a very exciting conversation. Oh, and Rita, it was the cutest little hat you ever saw. I... Well, I know it must have been darling, Gracie. I get such a kick when I buy a new hat, don't you? Oh, yes. In fact, I get two kicks. The second one's from George. <laughs> I heard that, and it's not true. Gracie, how about Rita staying for dinner? Well, of course. Rita, wouldn't you... Oh, no, you must have a date tonight. No, I don't have a date tonight or any other night. I can't get a date. Oh, stop. No, I mean it. <laughs> well, you see, the movie people have built me up as such a glamour girl that every man thinks I'm dated up, so no one ever calls me. Honest? Honest. Nobody takes you out at all? Nope. Not even Rudy Valley? <laughs> Not even Rudy Valley has asked me for a date. You know you can get on We the People. <laughs> Look, it's no joke, George. How do you think I feel sitting home alone, night after night, staring out of my window and watching Patsy Kelly go merrily off to the Palladium? I don't believe this. I'd swear that a girl like you would be dated up six months in advance. Well, that's what every man thinks. That's why nobody ever calls me. Oh, well, cheer up, Rita. Maybe that isn't the reason at all. Maybe it's your looks. Well, that's nice sharing Rita, I'll bet I can get you a date Oh, Gracie, don't waste your time Nobody can Well, I can I, I do things that no other woman does Don't I, George? You said it, you said it now, Gracie, if you really want to help Rita Look who's coming up the walk Who? Oh, Bill Goodwin Rita, quick, go into the living room You're going to have a date tonight I certainly hope so Hello, Gracie Hi, George. Still mad at me? Yeah, I'm mad. Oh, Bill, Bill, there's a surprise for you in the living room. A surprise for me? Yeah, go on in. Okay. Wow! <laughs> well, hello. Oh, oh, George, that should end her lonesome streak. Well, I hope so. But who would ever, who would ever believe that Rita Hayworth couldn't get a date? I just... Come in. Oh, Gracie, darling! Oh, Gracie, Oh, I'm so glad you dropped in. Guess who's in the living room with Bill Goodwin? Rita Hayworth. Rita Hayworth? Uh-huh. And Tootsie, you'll be so proud. Do you realize that you and Rita have something in common? <gasps> really? What? Neither one of you can get a date. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, now, don't feel bad, Tootsie. Rita Hayworth is beautiful and charming and has no excuse. But look at all the reasons you've got. <laughs> Gracie, you're the most comforting friend I've got. Where am I? Oh, my Bill. Bill. George, what's the matter with him? He's in a daze. Hey, Bill, speak to me. Gotta go now. <laughs> Thanks for the drink. Oh, if I could only do that to a man. Well, George, George, run after him. That hat he just put on his head is one of our nicest ashtrays. <laughs> That boy, he, he needs looking after. I'll see you later. Well, I wonder what happened to Bill. Oh, Rita. Yes, Gracie? Rita, what happened in there? Oh, this is my friend, Tootsie Sagwell. How do you do, Mr. Sagwell? <laughs> Darn these slacks anyway. Oh, <laughs> pardon me. Uh, Rita, tell us, what happened with you and Bill? Well... We sat down on the sofa. Ooh, and did you have the curtains drawn? Oh, that's your technique, Tootsie. Rita can work in the light. Go ahead, Rita. <laughs> well, he, he started out fine. He told me I had a neck like a swan. Yes? Well, from then on, it was all swan and no neck. <laughs> oh, but you know... Way, the only way I could change the subject was to grab him and kiss him. Well, and what happened after you kissed him? Nothing. He just crawled to the door and left. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, Gracie, it's, it's just impossible for me to get a date. Oh, well, now, don't give up, Rita. I'll get you a date yet. <gasps> Wait, I've got an idea. Tootsie, run next door and see if that good-looking Edgar Myers is home. All right. Oh, he'll be perfect for you, Rita. Not only is he handsome, but he's very intelligent and has a world of charm. In fact, there's only one small disadvantage. What's that? He's 15 years old. <laughs> well, Gracie, I don't think well, that I... Oh, Rita, Rita, don't be silly. There's a war on. <laughs> See, it was either him or his grandfather. Well, go into the living room. I'll call you, Rita. Well, all right, Gracie. Here he is. Hello, Mrs. Burns. 
You wanted me? Yes, Edgar. Um, Edgar, do you like pretty girls? Well, yes, ma'am. Uh, would you uh, would you like a date with a pretty girl? Well, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Where would you like to go? Oh, <laughs> it isn't me, but it's a girl just as pretty. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rita. Yes, Gracie. Um, Edgar, I want you to meet Rita Hayworth. Rita. Hey, Worth. Yes, go ahead, Edgar. Go ahead. Ask for a date. Miss Hayworth, I... I, uh... Oh! Oh, 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 oh Rita, do that. Oh, do something. Do the mouth. Oh, dear, I'll get you again. And now here's Jimmy Cash with the song that fits the season. My best to you. Here's to love and laughter. Yours forever after. May there always be happiness in your heart. My best. you a date. Oh, there he is. Quick, get into the living room. This one can't miss. At least it never missed before. Hello. Oh, uh, hello. Come in, sailor. I'm so glad the USO managed to find one for me. One what? A sailor who was interested in pretty girls. Oh, yeah. There's only a few of us. <laughs> well, look, here's $10 for expenses. I want you to take a girl out on a date tonight, and she's really gorgeous. Who cares about that? I'd go out with the worst dog in the world for ten bucks. Oh, so the USO did send one over. Hello, sailor. Here's your ten bucks, lady. Goodbye. Oh, no, no, wait, wait. She isn't the girl, sailor. Your date is in the living room. That door right there. Oh, okay. Be seeing you. Well, I guess Rita's worries are over at last. Yeah. Gee, I give anything to know what's going on in there. Oh, well, it can't be very exciting, Tootsie, after all. They just met. They're probably discussing the latest books and looking at his tattooing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Well, goodbye, lady. Sorry it didn't work out. Why, sailor, you mean you're not going to take her out? Lady, that dame in there is Rita Hayworth, the picture actress. If I take her out, I'll have no teeth. You'll, you'll have no teeth? No. Tomorrow the boys will say to me, where was you last night? And I'll say, me? Oh, I was out with Rita Hayworth. And they'll say, oh, a wise guy, huh? Bang, I'll have no teeth. <laughs> oh, dear. Rita, even the sailor walked out. I knew he would. See, so how'd you get your hair mussed up? Well, until the sailor recognized me, we were going steady. <laughs> oh. I'd better go up and fix it. Wait, see, I don't care what you say. Rita isn't giving them enough romantic atmosphere. I'm going in that living room and pull down all the blinds and spray some perfume around. Oh, all right, Tootsie. 
Well, I never would have believed that there'd be such a thing as too much glamour. It would never hurt me any. <laughs> I can't understand it. Hello, sweetheart. I brought Bill back. Hello, oh. Gracie. Here's your ashtray. Well, thanks, Bill. Well, I'm going in the living room and apologize to Miss Hayward. Oh, but Bill, uh, Rita isn't... Bill! Bill! Gee, it's dark in here. Where are you, beautiful? Huh? <laughs> oh, I hear you now. On the sofa, huh? Uh, mind if I sit down? <laughs> well, come on, baby. Slip your little hand into my great big strong one. Say, are you wearing pigskin gloves? <laughs> Gee, gorgeous, if I didn't know better, I'd swear I just shook hands with Maxie Rosenblum. <laughs> How about a little kiss now? <laughs> oh, hey, that's not fair. Every time I get close to your face, you push me away with your finger. <laughs> that's not my finger, that's my nose. <laughs> Wait a minute, I know that voice. You're Tootsie Sagwell. <laughs> well, goodbye, and my apologies to Rosenblum. <laughs> Gracie, that's Tootsie in there. Oh, I know, Bill. I tried to tell you, but you were in too much of a hurry. I certainly was. Well, you know what I always say? Haste makes, uh, well, whatever it makes, you wouldn't want it. <laughs> Guess not. Where's Rita Hayward? She's in the library. Well, I'm going in there and sweep her off her feet. Oh, hello. Oh, uh, hello, Miss Hayworth. I guess I kind of acted like a stoop before. Well, Mr. Goodwin, I... Oh, not Mr. Goodwin. Girls who like me likes to call me, uh, Billy. Oh, oh. Well, Mr. Goodwin, I... <laughs> oh, now, don't be angry, Rita. I, I was sort of in a daze. Just what did I say to you? Well, you asked me to pucker up, so I did. Then you puckered up. Yes. Then you said... Swan is a new white flowing soap that's pure than the finest castiles. Oh, murder, that wasn't a thing to tell you. It certainly wasn't. Oh, no, you knew that. I should have told you that because Swan is purer than the finest castiles, <laughs> it's grand for even a baby's tender skin. You know, Rita, women have long considered castile soaps the standard of purity, but Swan is purer than the finest castiles. Well, don't you ever forget Swan soap. Well, I... I guess not. I get sort of carried away. Well... I'll bet I can make you forget, Swan. Gee, I'll bet you can't. <laughs> but I wish you'd try. <laughs> Come here, Billy. Put your arms around me. That's it. Now look into my eyes. There. Now isn't there something else you'd like to say? Yes. Well? Well, if Swan is kind to a baby's tender skin... <laughs> Then it must be great for anybody's hands and complexion, shower or tub, if you'll pardon the expression. Bill. What? Oh. Oh. Well, Bill, what's the matter? Well, gotta go now. Thanks for the drink. Again. Yeah. <laughs> this time with my cigar in it. <laughs> oh, Gracie, this time I really give up. Oh, dear, I don't know what to say. Rita, are you sure it's your glamour that frightens all the men? I'm afraid so. They just stare at me. Well, maybe they wouldn't if you didn't wear such smart clothes. Why don't you wear something simple, like a sweater? <laughs> forget, it. forget it. Rita is right. Her glamour scares the average guy away. What she needs is a man who's really down to earth. You mean a midget? <laughs> yeah, a little small man, about two inches. Oh, come in. Oh, it's the postman again. Yes, I left the wrong magazine here, Mrs. Burns. Oh, well, never mind that. How would you like to have a date with Rita Hayworth? Who's she? <laughs> you, uh, you don't know her? Never heard of her. Oh, well, how? Uh, this is Rita right here. Rita, this is the postman. Hello. Hello. 
Say, you're kind of cute. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, how about that date? Okay. Do you know how to dance? Well, yes, a little. Well, if you're a beginner, I won't try my fancy one step. <laughs> Bless your heart and let's go. Goodbye, Gracie, and, and thanks a million. Isn't that wonderful? I brought some sunshine into Rita Hayworth's life. Sunshine? That postman is stormy weather. <laughs> but life really is cockeyed. Who'd believe that a big movie star couldn't get a date? Yeah, because nobody had sense enough to ask her. I guess that happens to all movie stars. Oh, really? Oh, Tootsie! Yeah. Come on down, we're going out. Where are you going with Tootsie? Well, I- I'm going to bring a little sunshine into Robert Taylor's life. <laughs> Not leaving this house. George and Gracie will be right back, so I just want to take these few seconds to get across one thing. You just can't beat Swan for washing the dishes. In the first place, Swan suds faster than other white floating soaps. And you need loads of fast, hard-working suds in the dishpan. In the second place, Swan helps keep your hands lovely. And you know why. It's purer than the finest Castiles. So what do you say? Get up. Get Swan. Well, here they are, George and Gracie. Oh, gee... Tootsie left without taking my waste kitchen fat to the butcher. Well, we can turn it in ourselves. The government uh, can still make bombs and bullets out of it. Oh, well, that isn't it. Every time Tootsie turns in a can of fat, Louie the butcher lets her kiss him. Well, no. There is a patriotic man. Oh, yes. He's in Washington right now. They're giving him the Congressional Medal for Bravery Beyond the Call of Duty. Well, I don't know. Really... The makers of Swan, the new white floating soap, join George and Gracie in inviting you to tune in again next week, same time. Remember, Swan also brings you another of radio's top shows. Tommy Riggs and Betty Lou over another network. And now till next week, this is Bill Goodwin saying, Well, I, Swan, how about you? Good night. Last Western outpost. Here live the long, lean cavalrymen who fear no living soul. Here, too, are their women, wives, mothers, sweethearts. Brought to the screen with dramatic intensity by director John Ford, Fort Apache stars John Wayne, Henry Fonda, Shirley Temple, Pedro Armendariz, with Ward Bond, George O'Brien, Victor McLaughlin, Anna Lee. Irene Rich, Dick Foran, Guy Kibbe, Grant Withers, John Agar. Colonel, if you send out the regiment, Cochise will think I've tricked him. Exactly. We have tricked him. Tricked him into returning to American soil, and I intend to see that he stays here. Colonel, Thursday, I gave my word to Cochise. No man is going to make a liar out of me, sir. Tell them I find him without honor. El coronel lo encuentra sin honor. Tell them they're not talking to me, but the United States government. No está hablando él, sino al gobierno americano. Tell them if they have not started by dawn, we will attack. Y le da de Tell them that. Alba, si no atacará. Biggest of all game with the Green Hornet and Cato coming up next. The Green Hornet. He hunts the biggest of all game. Public enemies who try to destroy our America. His faithful Filipino valet Cato, Rip Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with racketeers and saboteurs. 
risking his life that criminals and enemy spies will feel the weight of the law by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Bert Reed in the thrilling adventure Black Market for Profit. The Green Hornet strikes again. Reed, young man about town and publisher of the Daily Sentinel, was sitting in the living room of his apartment reading, while Cato, his faithful Filipino valet, was about to remove the coffee service. Their attention was suddenly attracted by the words of a commentator on the radio. Black market racketeers. We're going so far as to hijack cutthroats with me. Black market racketeers get more bad every day, Mr. Reed. Yes, yes Cato. They're creating a meat shortage for the people who can't or won't pay. Taking a meat company truck. Hmm. They're taking another truck. Wait. The driver is still unconscious and in serious condition. Well, that's not the good. Now, oh, listen. They will tell the police with a mask and let the attack on the truck. Presumably, the Green Hornet. The Green Hornet? Therefore, the Someone pulls that Hornet, no doubt. This is criminal. If the driver should die, of course, the charges... Shut it off, Kato. Many other charges are... Evidently, that news had just come over the teletype. The papers will be on the streets shortly, screaming for the capture of the Green Hornet. Racketeers blame black market activities on Hornet, so they'll be able to continue unmolested, Mr. Britton. Yes, it's evident they've planned it so the police and public will believe the Green Hornet is behind the whole thing. That helper must have seen someone wearing a Hornet mask. They made sure he lived to tell it. Well, someone used smart way to avoid suspicion. Yes, whoever's at the head of the gang is smart, Cato. Probably smart enough to realize the Green Hornet will try to run down the gang, too. Well, then you think Leader deliberately laid plan to trap Hornet, perhaps? Could be, Kato. At least he'd be ready in case it were necessary. But it stands to reason as long as those racketeers can cast suspicion on the Hornet without his being caught, the better for the game they're playing. Well, then it's better they be caught soon. All right, but I don't... Miss Reed's apartment. Kato, this is Axford. Let me talk to Reed. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Axford. <laughs> Axford, Hello, Axford. What's up? Meat. The meat racketeers are at it again. Yes, I heard about them over the radio just now. Sure. But I bet you didn't hear what I'm going to tell you. I got a straight from Sergeant Burke at Cop's headquarters. That I did. Well, I'm listening. The Green Hornet's at the head of the whole thing. He phoned Cop's headquarters and said so. He did what? Old headquarters. And he told Sarge he wasn't through by a long shot. Said he'd make the headlines again tomorrow night. Now, what do you think of that for nerve? Sarge was fit to be tied. He did have a lot of nerve at that. I say he did, especially since he's wanted for murder. And that driver died just a while ago, the one who was held up tonight. I see. So they're hunting the Hornet for murder, eh? That's right. Sarge told him that, too. But he just laughed and hung up. He's a smooth one, that guy. But Sarge says they won't let up now till they track him down. I can understand that. Well, Axford, you'd better stick around headquarters in case anything breaks. If it does, be sure to let me know. That I will read. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. So long, Reed. Axford tell you bad news, maybe? That driver died, Cato. And the Hornet is blamed for his murder. Also, someone had the nerve to phone the police and say he was the Green Hornet. Why he do that, I wonder? Well, it seems he told him he was going to make the headlines again tomorrow night. Something's got to be done, and soon. You think of something, perhaps? No. But sitting here isn't any help. I think I'll take a run out along River Road where that truck was held up tonight. Maybe I can turn up something. If you go as Green Hornet, 
You'll be in danger from searching police, Mr. Britt. The chance I'll have to take. I'm not going to let up until I get some clue that'll lead to the man or the men behind this black market deal. They can't get the Hornet blamed for murder and get away with it. Well, black beauty ready. Also, gas weapon and mask. Good. We've got a big job on our hands, Cato. Let's go. In the meantime, in the office of the meat company, Cliffwood Butler and Edgar Duncan, partners of the firm, were discussing the situation. If they don't do something soon, Ed, we'll be put out of business. The loss of both trucks and the meat that's been hijacked is too much. Yes, of course, but we have insurance on every load as well as on the trucks. What good is that when we can't get other trucks or more meat to sell? You're right about that, Cliff. Since you're general manager of the company, Ed, it's up to you to see that our deliveries get through. Isn't there some way you Oh, wait a minute, Cliff. I know I'm responsible for getting the orders filled. But it isn't my fault because of what's been happening. Decided to send out another truckload tonight. Have them travel by back roads into the city. That's a good idea. But do you have men who are willing to take a chance on taking the load through? Yep. Gave the driver a gun to carry just in case. If the Green Hornet and his gang stop that truck, they'll be in for a surprise. Good idea. Did you notify the police that you were sending out another truckload? No. Thought it best not to tell anybody. Then there's no chance of the news leaking out. Well, let's hope that one gets through safely. If it doesn't, I'll be about ready to give up. Go out of business, though. <laughs> Don't be so pessimistic. They'll get through all right. Why shouldn't they? From what I hear of that green hornet, he has ways and means of finding out things. If he should... Ah, don't worry. If he bothers that truck, they'll be prepared to put up a fight. Good. Well, as we'll get the truck on its way. And remember, don't worry. Just leave everything to me. I'll see that we get our deliveries made one way or another. <laughs> Must have been right along here that the truck was hijacked, Cato. Oh, yes, Mr. Britt. This is route they were supposed to have followed tonight. I... Listen. Police come, Mr. Britt. Yes, I overlooked the fact they'd be patrolling this road tonight. What we do now? They're coming fast. We'll have to lose them. Take to the back roads, Cato, and if necessary, use the smoke screen. Step on it. Them, Cato, but it took some time. We turn around now and go back to River Road? I was thinking of doing that. We've come so far, we might as well go the rest of the way to town on this back road. Let's go. The police sure to blame Hornet for everything, not look for anybody else. That's where the danger lies, Cato. While the police are concentrating their hunt on me, the others can continue with their dirty work. Well, that's true. If they. Look, Mr. Britt, on side of road. Stop the car, Cato. Come on. I'm coming. Got your flashlight handy? Yes, sir. Here, light. Hmm. Two men, both unconscious. Look like they've been hit on head. They have been hit, but good. Here, gun by hand of this one. Let's see. Hmm. Looks as though it dropped from his hand. I'll take it. Well, this is interesting. What you find, Mr. Britt? Look here, Cato. Oh, the police have picked up our trail. We'd bad if we found That's here. It's time for us to leave, Cato. Run for the car. Here we are. I'll drive, Cato. Yes, sir. You must hurry, Mr. Britt. And how? morning, Lenore Case, secretary to Britt Reed, entered the young publisher's office. 
Oh, well, what is it, Miss Kay? There's a gentleman to see you, Mr. Reed. Mr. Butler, an official of the meat company. Mr. Butler? Oh, very well, show him in, Miss Kay. Yes, sir. I'll tell him to come right in. Mr. Reed will see you, Mr. Butler. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Butler. Come right in. Morning, Mr. Reed. Have a chair. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Mr. Reed, I, uh, I came here because of the unfortunate happenings to our truck. No doubt you're familiar with the details. Yes, the black market racketeers are after your trucks with a vengeance. You say black market racketeers, but you know as well as I do that the person responsible is the Green Hornet. I understand everyone blames the Hornet. And with reason. The evidence is irreputable. So it seems. Why have you come to see me, Mr. Butler? Well, I came here because I understand your paper offers a standing reward for the capture of that criminal. So? So I want to add to that offer. My partner and I have decided to give an additional reward of $10,000 for his capture. I see. Evidently, there's no doubt in your mind that the Hornet is responsible for the attacks on your truck. As a matter of fact, it's my partner, Mr. Duncan, who insisted we post this reward. He's our general manager, you know. And he's determined to run that Hornet to earth, one way or another. Well, I guess Mr. Duncan has reason to be disturbed after all the setbacks to your company. Yes, and he feels certain, as do the police that no one but the Green Hornet could pull those jobs. Where he disposes of the meaty steels is beyond me. But I guess there are plenty of unscrupulous retailers that would buy black market meat these days. No doubt. People who refuse to buy black market products, the racket would die out. Exactly. Now, I should think your drivers would be on the guard knowing that previous truckloads were stolen. Oh, they've been warned, of course. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the driver of the truck that was taken last night, the second truck, carried a gun which Mr. Duncan had given him in case of attack. Uh, evidently, he uh, didn't get a chance to use it. That's right. The Green Hornet must have taken him by surprise, knocked him and the helper out, and taken the gun as well as the truckload of meat. You say Mr. Duncan gave the gun to the driver? Yes. See. Well, we'll publish the fact that your company offers an additional reward. Let's hope our combined rewards result in the capture of the man you're after. That's what we're all hoping, Mr. Reed. Oh, by the way, I understand the Hornet has boasted that he'll make the headlines again tonight. Yeah. Imagine the impudence of the man calling the police last night and saying, I'm going to make the headlines again tomorrow night. It's outrageous. In a way, it is, Mr. Butler. All we can do is wait and see if he makes good his boast. Well, we'll be ready for him. Tonight, Mr. Duncan has planned to send out one of our trucks along River Road. But it'll carry a squad of police instead of a load of meat. The regular load will go by way of the post road, which is a long way around. Mr. Duncan seems to be quite a planner. No doubt he hopes to trap the Hornet on the River Road. That's the idea. Of course, that information is off the record. Well, that goes without saying, Mr. Butler. Well, thank you. I, I won't keep you any longer. Let's hope our plan works. And your headlines tonight will carry the news of the capture of the Green Hornet. If the plans work out according to schedule, there's no reason why we shouldn't have news of the capture of the man responsible for what's taken place. I'll see that your offer's printed the next edition, and uh, thank you for coming in. The money will be paid gladly, I can assure you that. Good day, Mr. Reed. Goodbye, Mr. Butler. So they plan a trap for the Green Hornet. There's one thing they don't know. The Hornet has an ace in the hole that may spring another trap to catch the real leader of that black market gang. And the showdown will come tonight. We'll continue our Green Hornet adventure in just a moment.
now back to our story. After the departure of Mr. Butler, Britt Reed went to the outer office to talk over some letters with Miss Case. While they were talking, Axford entered. Hi, Reed. How are you, Cassie? Oh, not feeling as well as I did a moment ago. <laughs> feeling the heat, maybe? No, but I do expect to get a bit of hot air any time now. Ah. <laughs> Is this a new battle or a continuation of the old one? Oh, it's just our way of showing a bit of good neighbor policy, Mr. Reed. <laughs> Says you, Casey. Say, Reed, I come to tell you. Get ready for a scoop in the Daily Sentinel tonight. Are you going to bring it in, Axford? That I am. That ought to rate a headline in itself. <laughs> ah, there you go, belittling again as usual. Casey, if I ever came in here and heard you say one nice word... <laughs> never I... mind, Axford. <laughs> Go on, tell me what scoop you expect to get for the Sentinel tonight. About the capture of the Green Hornet, who's been doing all that black market hijacking and all. That's what. Well, what makes you think you'll get such a scoop? Reed, this is supposed to be confidential. Well, don't you or Casey breed it to us all? I suppose you're afraid we'll run to the Hornet and tell him whatever you tell us. Is that it? Yeah, that's right. You see? Ah! <laughs> Will you shut up, Casey? Run to the Hornet. <laughs> okay, Axford, I'll keep quiet. Go ahead and talk. Yes, what's the off-the-record news you were about to tell us? Just this, Reed. The meat company and the cops are planning a trap for the harness tonight. Really? Yeah. Instead of with a load of meat, a truck's going to go out with a load of cops in it. And the harness and his gang hold it up. Louie, they got him! Sure. Are you going in the truck? No. I'm going to do a bit of patrolling with Sergeant Burke in the squad car in hopes of getting a line on that faulty. In other words, you're going to play safe, is that it? Play safe, you say. Casey, the way you talk, you'd think I was afraid of the green harness. Well, aren't you? Ha! Did you hear that, Reed? <laughs> aren't I, she's asking. <laughs> sure, and I wouldn't stoop to answer such a question. Me, afraid of the green harness. Ha! Why, if I could put my hand on him, I'd grab him just like I'm doing to Reed here. I'd... Oh, excellent, white <laughs> goat. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Reed. Me, afraid of the green harness. Come to think of it, that's an insult to me manhood, that it is. So I'll be leaving you right now. So long, Reed. Goodbye. Goodbye, Axford. Ah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You certainly put him in a good mood to face the Hornet tonight. Oh, it'd be just <laughs> like that big goof to get a scoop at that. Who knows? <laughs> That evening, Britt Reed phoned Cato on the private line and directed him to bring the Black Beauty to the prearranged meeting place downtown. Soon, the gleaming, powerful car was speeding through the dark back streets of the city. You'll not say where we go, Mr. Britt. Before I tell you where we're heading, Cato, I want you to stop in the vicinity of a drugstore. And then, as Britt Reed, I'm going to make a phone call. Who you make call to? Well, listen, must be a police call coming on the radio. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. A company truck hijacked on Post Road. Driver reports, truck and load taken by Green Hornet. Watch all roads for Green Hornet. That is all. They did it again, Cato. Whoever lead gang must know truck going on other road carry police instead of meet Mr. Britt. Yes, that gang leader's smart, but not quite smart enough. Find a drugstore so that I can make that phone call and hurry, Cato. Meantime, Mr. Butler and Mr. Duncan were discussing the latest developments in the office at the meat company. Ed, for the life of me, I can't understand how that hornet finds things out. How could he have found out we were sending a second truck out tonight on the post road route? The guy's much smarter than we give him credit for it, Cliff. Evidently, he got wind of our plan somehow. It's ruining his head. It won't be long before we'll be out of business for good. Yeah, doesn't seem to be much we can do about it. We... But... Yeah, no. Hello, this is Britt Reed, publisher of the Daily Sentinel. Is this Mr. Butler? No, I'm Edgar Duncan, his partner. Oh, yes. Well, you probably know that Mr. Butler was in my office today to offer a reward for the capture of the Green Hornet. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, Mr. Reed. Well, I thought you might like to know that the authorities think they've found out where the stolen trucks are being hidden. They're getting ready to close in for the capture. You, you mean they they think they found the hideout of the Green Hornet and his gang? Yes, I thought you might like to know. Yes, I, uh, I'm very glad to know, Mr. Reed. Very glad. Thanks for calling. Don't mention it. If the tip off of the police is correct, or maybe your troubles will soon be over. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks again. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Duncan. So Mr. Reed says they think they've found the hideout of the Green Hornet, huh? Yes. 
Police are preparing to move in on him and his gang. I, uh... I think I'll drive down to police headquarters and be there in case they do make the capture. I'll see you later, Cliff. Yes, yes, of course. I'll be here, waiting. You'll get person you want on telephone, Mr. Britt? Yes, Cato. And I will sit here in the car and watch that gate for a short time. Who we watch for to come out gate of meat company? That remains to be seen, Cato. Of course, I do have a certain person in mind. Look, car coming from Meat Company now. I hope this is it, Kato. Well, wait till it comes through the gate, then we'll follow. All right, start the Black Beauty. And don't let that car out of your sight. job ain't worth two cents after this night. That doggone hornet's done it again. Well, what are we going back to cops' headquarters for, I'd like to know? Why ain't you staying out to hunt that guy? Sarge, to my way of thinking, the whole force is slipping if they give up the hunt so easy like. Is that so now? Listen to me, Mike Expert. It is the likes of you and your squawking that makes Reed and other publishers rake over the force in them editorials like they do. Well, no, Reed does ask me help in writing them editorials now and then. So you better be nice to me, Sarge. Shut up. For two pins, I'd bounce you right out of this car on that drooping derby of yours. In fact, I... Uh Uh-oh. That car coming toward us is breaking the speed law. If we weren't going the other way, I'd... Hey, look! Here comes another one. Looks like he's chasing the car that passed. Holy crow, Sarge! It's him! The harness! Heaven is to the Betsy. For once, you're right. Well, hurry up! Turn around! Get the move on, Sarge! Come on! Shut up and let go of the wheel, you nitwit. I'll get after him, all right. And this time I'll stay right behind him, or my name ain't Patrick Burke. In the back office of an old warehouse, two men sat at a table going over some figures on a piece of paper before them. On a chair nearby were two crudely made hornet masks. Well, let's see now. As I figured, we each got about two grand coming for what we've done to date. Not including the truck we just rolled in. Why, we ought to get more than that. Why let the boss cop all the gravy? We'll find a way to get more out of him. Don't you worry. Ah, that's a boss. Wonder why he come here now. Uh, uh, I'll let him in. Well, hiya, boss. We got the truck okay. Yeah. And we've been getting a laugh out of all them cops you sent on a wild goose chase, too. You sure are a smart one of the... He's not so smart. Take some of this, double-crosser. The Green Hornet. He gassed the boss. He took us by surprise. We got to do something. I'll do something, all right. I thought that one killer. Now you can have this. I'll help you get that Hornet. I think not. Drop that gun, you drop it. Oh, oh my arm. This will do it. This one and tough. Get me, will you? If I can get that rod. I can work with this mug. Yes. No! Well, there are masks they use. On chair. Yes. Stick one of them on the boss there while I put this gun in his hand. Why well, you put gun in hand? It's the gun I found in the hand of that driver last night. Duncan gave it to him for protection, but it was loaded with blank cartridges. Oh, making it safe for these two men to hold up truck as usual. Right. That tipped me off to the probable leader. I couldn't let the police know because I couldn't explain how Brett Reed would come to have that gun. The police. Let's get out of here quick, Cato. Later that night, in the city room of the Daily Sentinel... Reed, you should have been there. Such excitement you never saw in all your life. Did the police get the gang and recover the stolen trucks and the meat? That we did, Mr. Reed. We followed the hornet to the hideout But they didn't get the hornet. (laughs) But at first I thought they did have him. (laughs) You should have heard him strutting. (laughs) Though it only lasted about two minutes. Is that so now? You were too doggone weak to strut when you saw that masked guy lying there on the floor. Masked guy? Who was he? Sure, it was one of the guys that owned the meat company. Mr. Cliffwood Butler, that's who. Butler? Really? That it was, Reed. Mr. Duncan and his partners followed the cops out there to identify him. He had the gun that Mr. Duncan gave to the truck driver last night. Sure, Butler confessed everything when them two mugs we found with him came to and started talking. 
Seems Butler knew Duncan was going to give that gun to the driver, so he got to it first and loaded it with blanks so his men wouldn't get shot when they held up the truck. That's amazing. And what's more, Reed, we found the trucks had been sprayed with paint and had the serial numbers filed down, all but the last truck they got. And in the back part of the warehouse was a big coal box where they kept all the meat. I suppose it was to be sold on the black market. That's right. Butler was putting his partner right out of business, stealing everything. But it did him no good. He's up for murder now. Sure. And it serves him right, too, for hobnobbing with the green harlot. But I thought you said it wasn't the real green hornet, that he had his men wearing masks like the hornet. That's right, Mr. Reed. But was the real hornet we followed out there all right. He got sore at the bunch and cleaned up on them, leaving them for us to pick up and... He got away. Well, that sentence, uh, he got away, sounds uh, familiar, Sergeant Burke. Ha! <laughs> that it does. Shut up, you. <laughs> now, now look, Mr. Reed. Can't you for once uh, just say we caught the black market gang that was working with the hornet... Uh, Without playing up that part of it, uh, uh, about him getting away, I mean, just this once, maybe. <laughs> well, Sergeant, perhaps just this once, but uh, keep after him. We will, that, Mr. Reed. And I promise you, if we ever catch that devil, you'll be the first to know you can count on that. I'm sure I can, Sergeant. I'm very sure I'd be the first to know. <laughs> These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. All characters, names, places, and incidents are fictitious. Henry Stambaugh speaking. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company. of their romances carried through an entrancing new adventure. A story complete in itself, not only greater than four daughters, but one of the few perfect entertainments the screen has ever offered. Ben, I've got something to tell you, but you've got to promise not to scream. I never scream. Oh, Ernest, we're much better off. We don't have to worry about our child. <laughs> Emma, you better shift over to the other shoulder. You don't mind if I see him first, do you? Oh, we aren't patients. We're waiting for our sister. Remember, I saw him first. Go, Felix, before you lose as Mickey did. He threw his life away. You're throwing away everything you've worked for. There's nothing I've worked harder for than you. 
But I can't fight thin air. I'm no match for a memory. You think they'd let me win? Who? They. The fates, the destinies. Well, you put all this together and you got Michael Borden. with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty hi -yo silver, the Lone Ranger. Outlaws roam the new territory and gun law rule the range in the early days of the western United States. It was not until the masked rider of the plains started his great fight for justice that the honest ranchers found peace and security in their new homes. Without thought of reward, the Lone Ranger devoted his life to the establishment of law and order on the frontier, and the memory of his deeds will remain as long as the memory of the early West itself. Return with us now, those thrilling days of yesteryear, when adventure lay at the end of every trail. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come along, Silver! We're heading for the mission! Someone's waiting for us there! Hi, oh, Silver! Away! The padre of the mission had long been a close friend of the Lone Ranger and had helped him on several occasions. As our story opens, the two men are talking in the little patio near the chapel, and some of the people in town were surprised when you went there to help serve justice, Padre. Someday, my friend, and I hope it may be soon, the people of Pecos will build a church and let one of us go there and live among them. I hope so. There's such a need for it. If only there could be more like you to ride and fight in the name of justice. I pray for the time when there will no longer be any need of fighting. But you have returned. Forgive me for not asking sooner. But can I be of service? You remember I came before to ask about the murder of a man named Slocum? I remember. Before Carlos, who knew part of the plans for Slocum's murder, was executed for another crime, he talked to you. At great length. He wanted to make his peace. I told Carlos there were things he must do. Among them was to write a signed confession, 
telling what he knew about the murder of Senor Slocum. And he gave you that signed confession? He did. He told me to use it. If the time came when it would save another person from being punished for the crime. That's exactly it. Sam Slocum was thought to have taken his own life. That was a false accusation. He was considered a murderer. But my friend, that matter is closed. I showed you what Carlos left for me to show. Proof that Senor Slocum was killed by another. That, with the facts you knew, found the real murderer. And I understand he is now in prison. Is not the matter closed? I went with you to Pecos. My word was believed. Padre, I want to take that note to Pecos with me. For the law to keep? No. There are a few people there who didn't understand the facts. They didn't know that Carlos had given you that written and signed message. They think you violated a confidence. You wish to do this for me? Yes, Padre. I appreciate it, amigo, but I do not wish it so. You don't want me to show these people the proof that you did only what Carlos asked you to do? No. Those who know and understand me and my teachings would know the truth and would want no proof or explanation. They would have implicit faith in me, and they would know that anyone of my order would gladly choose death in preference to the violation of the seal of confession. You mind if I explain to some of those people? Explain, my friend, if you wish to do so. They will believe you. You need not take proof. But wait. I am glad to have you come here. Look. You see that man who comes from the chapel? Yes. I want you to know him, my friend. His name is Lawson. He is called Arizona. Lawson? Yes. He is a hunter, a good man, but one who rides alone. He might sometime need a friend. If he's your friend, you know he can count on me. And he could have no better friend than you. But come, let me introduce you. After the Lone Ranger left the mission, he joined Tonto. And as the two rode, he spoke about the young bounty hunter he had met. He was a likable fellow, Tonto. Him called Arizona? That's right, he's from Arizona. Well, that's what he calls himself. Him not stay in one place long? No, he's restless. He travels around with his dog, following the tracks of wolves. Bringing one down now and then and collecting the bounty for it. Oh. The Padre thought he might be of help to us from time to time. Isn't that good? He gets around a lot and learns a lot about outlaws and crooked lawmen. Ah. Uh, Tonto think that... What is it, Tonto? You here? It sounds like the stage for Pecos. It come plenty fast. Yes, faster than the safe of the horses on this sort of ground. Must be just around the bend there. Ah. Uh. There it is, Tonto. You look. Those horses are out of control. Driver not got rain. Come on, Get him up, Scout. Come on, Silver. Get on this side, Tonto. I'll circle to the far side. Get him off the shelf. Get a hold of them, stranger. Stop them horses before the stage gets over. Hold back, you. No. Steady there, steady boy. The Lone Ranger and Tonto raced alongside the six plunging, terror stricken horses. The stage driver, helpless, had a hard time hanging onto the rocking, shaking coat. Working together, the masked man and his Indian friend ranged alongside the leading pair, gripped the reins by leaning far out of their saddles, and by sheer strength pulled the horses to a stop. Whoa! Oh, Any fella! Any more! Any more! Any more! Steady, boy! Steady! Steady. Yeah. You all right, Tonto? Uh, me? You all right? There you are, driver. It's lucky your stage didn't tip. Sure as shooting is a miracle, mister. Here are your reins. Uh, thanks. I don't think any of the gear is broken, but you'd better examine it. I... Have you been wounded? Oh, just winged. I ain't hurt serious. But I reckon my passenger's killed. Well, what happened? Tonto, look inside and see if you can help the passenger. Uh, Tonto, look. Got shot up a few miles back. I don't know who the critter was. He had his face covered. Uh, like you. Land sakes, I just noted that mask. Tell me some more. Now, well, look at here. There ain't nothing worth taking. I all the highwaymen I could tolerate for one day. Take it easy. But, but that mask... I... I'm not going to try and rob you. You did give me a helping hand. I can't forget that. Color inside. Him dead. Yes, huh? Mm. Gosh, that's what I was afraid of. His missus is going to be hit awful hard about this. Tonto, have a look at the driver's wound. Mm. I'll get down from here, Redskin. You needn't climb up. Here to look at my wound. It ain't nothing. Did one man do the job? Yeah. Ouch! Hey there, Redskin, let me be. Tonto, look at wound. Did he steal anything? No, he, he didn't even search us. Just stopped the stage and throwed lead into the banker, and when I tried to say something, he shot me. Where did this happen? Just a few miles back. You can see the place all right. 
The ground is pretty bad mark up from the hoofs. Would you recognize the horse or the clothing of the man? Shucks, nine men out and ten around Pecos has the same sort of outfit. Mm, not bad. All right, Tonto. Get back to the saddle now. Now, can't I get on, stranger? I gotta get to town. I gotta report this to the sheriff. And I reckon I'll have to bust the tough news to poor Miss Whipple. She's the banker's wife. Go ahead, driver. He ain't gonna rob me? I'm not a robber. Go on. Yes, sir. Get along there. Get. Well, it seems there is still a killer at large near Pecos. Isn't that right? Wait, that fellow Arizona. What about him? I wonder if he might have seen anything. He was heading away from the mission. He might have passed the killer. Tonto, you ride out that way and see what you can learn from the tracks. I'm going to head into Pecos and see what develops there when the driver reports that murder. Hail Silver Howard! In Pecos, a little later that same day, the widow of the banker was with the sheriff and... It's hard, Sheriff. Mighty hard. Whipple was as fine a man as ever lived. I know, Mrs. Whipple. Helped them as needed it and was deserving of it. And all his read and studied papers from the East so as he could give the men around here free advice and lent most all his personal cash to the government for the war. Oh, why did it have to be him? You gave me the names of three men, Matilda. It's one of them three. It's got to be. There ain't no one else that want to kill him. It was a spite murder. That's what it was. Jim wasn't killed for his money. He didn't have none on him that was worth the taking. And Leif says they didn't even search him. He was killed for spite. We'll find the snake that done it, Matilda, and string him from the highest tree in Pecos. It's one of them three. I know it is. I sent men out to look over the scene and try and get a clue. It, it won't bring Jim back. But I'll feel a sight better to see the killer punished for it. The three you mentioned will be here before long. I'll let word go out I want to speak to them. If it ain't Sam Smead or Wendy Hoagland, it's got to be Ben Hawkins. I'd stake my life on it. Here. I hear you don't see me. Yes, I do, Smead. Sit down there. Uh, howdy, Miss Whipple. I'm uh, right sorry about the banker. That ain't true, Sam Smead. Huh? You ain't a bit sorry. You're laughing in your sleeve about it. You had it in for Jim Whipple ever since he organized the men to beat you when you tried to get elected sheriff. You don't think I done it? I don't know yet. Can you prove any alibi? Gosh, no, Sheriff. I was on my ranch to the word time you wanted to see me. Howdy, Sheriff. Come in, Ben. I am in. Here's Wendy. Uh, hello. Ben, you had it in for Whipple ever since he wouldn't let you marry his daughter. Have I? You know it, Ben. You told him then that someday he'd be sorry. And you, Wendy. Whipple foreclosed the mortgage on your place. Yeah, sure. What about it? Where was you around noon? Me, you... Gosh, Sheriff, I reckoned home. Can you prove that? Gosh, no, I, I was there alone. And where was you, Ben? Why should I tell? Because one of you three shot and killed Jim Whipple. What? what? I didn't even know he was dead. I suppose you lie and say you're sorry. Well, sure, I'm sorry. I was sore at him when he wouldn't let Betsy marry me, but I got over that. He's dead? Yes. Oh, Leif, come in here. Look at these three critters. Yeah, I see him. How's your shoulder now, Leif? Oh, shucks, that ain't nothing, ma'am. Does any one of these look like he might have been the killer? Well, no. You I... can't pin that on me. <laughs> You're just guessing, Sheriff. Shut up. They're all about the size of the critter, and I reckon any one of them might have done it. On the other hand, I figure it's more likely the jet the boys just come into town with. Who? There's some sort of a pilgrim or a bounty hunter or something. Where is he? He's riding a bay horse, and he hasn't got much of a story. Anyone know him? Nope, he claims his name is Arizona, and that's all the name he'll give out. Got a pretty bad dog with him. Mm. He's probably the killer. Well, why'd the boys bring him in? Well, they found the dog tracks around where the stage was stuck up. They seen where the dog had been tied, and it might have been why this Arizona fellow was shooting us up. They couldn't get no clues but them dog tracks, so they followed him and brought this hombre in. Where is he now? Well, they're fetching him. That ought to let us out. Not yet, it don't. This stranger ain't no reason that I know of to murder my husband. Keep that dog here, There's a dog. That's him. Wait till I see Get that dog out in here. Chain it up somewhere. Come on, stranger. The sheriff will want a lot of talk with you. Well, mister, what's your name? Just call me Arizona, that's all, Sheriff. Did you murder the banker? Sheriff, that's just about the blamedest fool question I ever hear asked. Well, did you or didn't you? If I tell you I did kill the banker, you'd throw me in jail and have me hung. If I say I didn't, you'd throw me in jail anyhow, figuring I'm lying about it. What was you doing at the scene of the holdup? Looking around. Why was your dog tied up? That dog of mine's the best wolf hunter that ever lived. He helps me catch the wolves that I collect bounty on. And after he gets one, I have to rope the critter or he'd tear it to pieces before I could get the ears that I got to show to collect bounty. I ain't got a notion to lock all four of you up till we get to investigating this thing more complete. You won't need to, Terry. Hey, what the sand is? Take it easy. I can draw these guns fast if I have to. Where'd you come from, stranger? Arizona is the only man you'll have to lock up, Sheriff. Well, doggone. A friend is sure arrived. Yeah. Hear what he says, Sheriff? 
Lock him up. I ain't used to taking the word of a masked man, mister, but you've been in Pecos before. You're the hombre who rides a horse named Silver. Yes. But look here, Miss Tidy. Lock the man up. Hold him for trial. Hear that, boys? Take Arizona to jail and lock him up. And keep a tight rope on that dog of his. Go on now. Get going. There you are, Mrs. Whipple. Reckon that'll clean up the murder of your husband. Sheriff, it ain't right somehow. What do you mean, it ain't right? I don't know. That good-looking young bounty hunter ain't no murderer. Not if I know faces. Well, if the Lone Ranger says it's so, it's got to be so. I'd a heap sooner believe one of them other three critters was guilty. And besides, Sheriff, huh? the masked man said to lock Arizona up. Sure. But he didn't say Arizona was the killer. The curtain falls on the first act of tonight's Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. to continue our story. With Arizona, the young bounty hunter whom the Lone Ranger had met at the Spanish mission, locked in jail and held on suspicion of murder, the other three suspects felt greatly relieved. After the sheriff had retired that night, the Lone Ranger entered his home and shook him gently by the shoulder. Uh, well, what's the matter? What is this? Tate morning yet? Wake up, Sheriff. I want to talk to you. Why the... Who... Reaping sassafras, it's you. Yes. Great sakes alive. What are you doing here, mister? I want to speak to you, Sheriff. Get wide awake and pay attention to what I'm going to say. Yeah, I'm awake. I'm wide awake. What is it? You have Arizona locked in jail. Sure. It was you told me to do so. Arizona's not the murderer. He ain't? Then what in Sam Hill did you tell me to lock him up for? So we could find the real murderer. Huh? Tyler was in town while you were questioning those three men. He told me about them. Yeah? Which one of the three do you suspect? Shucks, any one of the three is likely to have been the killer. But you told me about Arizona. You told me to lock him up. Yes. Arizona did have his dog tied up near the scene of the murder. But that doesn't say that he's the killer. Well, who is? I don't know. But yet. If the, if the dog was there and Arizona was there, ain't that proof enough? Arizona came here while I was looking around. Tonto and I stopped the stage, as Leif may have told you. Yeah, he mentioned that. Tonto came on to town, and I went back to the scene of the murder. While I was there, Arizona came along. I'd met him just a little while before at the mission. Yeah? The two of us looked over the scene together, but we couldn't find a clue. Then we outlined the scheme. And Arizona come on here to get locked up? Yes. Well, doggone, if that don't beat all. Mrs. Whipple said she didn't think he was a killer. She was right. If he hadn't been such a good-looking young critter, he'd likely be lynched by this time. I had a hunch there might be a lynching tonight, but nothing's turned up. If you'll take all the suspected men with you and question Arizona in the morning, I think it'll lead to the capture of the real killer. How's that? Arizona knows what to tell you. Just do what he asks. If you say so, mister. You'll see how it'll work out. And, Sheriff, there's something else I want to tell you. Yeah? Don't be surprised at anything that happens in the morning while you're questioning Arizona. be right neat to see you question him, Sheriff. I thought you might enjoy it, Ben. How about you, Wendy? Oh, sure. Uh, there's Sam. We let him in on it, too. Hi, Sam. Yeah? Come on. Come on with us. Where are you going? Going to the jail. 
We're going to question Arizona and see if we can't make him confess to the murder of Banker Whipple. Yeah, that suits me. Right down to the ground. The more we have there to see the questioning, the more nervous it's likely to make Arizona. Yeah. For a while, I thought you was going to frame me for that murder, Sheriff. I won't frame no man, but I'll find the one that done it. Hope you got your keys to the jail. I never travel without them. That sure is a big dog, Arizona owns. Yep. If we hang him, I'm going to sort of adopt the critter. It's a first-rate dog. Quiet there, boy. Quiet down. Morning, Sheriff. Arizona, I got some things to speak to you about. I figured you might have. But you needn't think I'm going to admit I killed that man in that stagecoach. You didn't, huh? No, and if you'll give me half a chance, I can find the one that done it. How is that? Uh, wait a minute. I'll open up the cell. Then you can come out and talk. All right, come on. Thanks, Sheriff. Now, what's this about you finding the one that done it? We seen it. We? Meaning who? Me and my dog. You seen it, huh? Yep. The way that killer had his face covered up might fool a man, but it wouldn't fool no dog. That dog seen the murder. <laughs> That's too bad dogs can't talk. That's a likely story, Arizona. <laughs> Maybe if we ask the dog, he'll tell us which one done the shooting. <laughs> <laughs> you just can laugh, but that dog's powerful smart. Arizona, I'm going to give you a chance to confess the murder. You confess it, and you might get away with life in jail. If you don't confess it, we're going to hang you. Whether I done it or not, you're going to hang me, huh? I reckon you done it all right. The mask man said to lock you up. He ought to know. Sheriff, you know where that killing took place, don't you? Yeah, what about it? You go to that place, then look to the south about 200 yards or so, and you'll see an old dead tree. Oh, yeah? If you go to that tree, I got a notion you'll find your killer. What's he doing there? Can't tell you right now what he's doing. Maybe he's sitting waiting to confess, eh? <laughs> I ain't saying he's there right now, but if you go there, you'll get the clue that'll find him. I promise you that. That's plumb crazy. No, nope, taint. He had a spare horse tethered by that tree. The ground there's soft enough to see the hoof prints. Might be worth a trip out there just to satisfy my curiosity. I'd sure admire to see you go. Oh, hey, somebody shot him. He jumped through that window. I seen the gunfire. Get around outside of the place. He's around and back of the jail. Don't let him get away. It was the masked man. There he goes. No, oh, them shooting irons, you blame fools. You can't drill a man riding at that speed. Why'd you shoot Arizona? I wonder what that mask hombre has again, Arizona. Sure was determined to see him killed. He seen there was a chance of him getting out of this murder charge. He just drilled him through the window. Yes, this thing is getting complicated. Maybe me help. Where'd you come from, Redskin? What do you mean, help? What's that you say? Me help you. Shut that dog up. Quiet, Flash, you quiet. Hey, you. Yeah? Take that dog away from here and lock him up. Me go. Look at feller inside. Yeah, go ahead, Injun. See how bad he's hurt. Tonto think maybe him dead. You wait here. No, we'll wait here till you come out. Not good. While the sheriff and the three men waited for Tonto outside the jail, they watched the masked rider disappearing in the distance astride a snow-white horse. Then Tonto came out and said, You not help him now. Can't help him, huh? No. Well, boys, I tell you what I'm going to do. What's that, Sheriff? I'm going to take a posse and go to that tree Arizona spoke of. I'm just curious enough to investigate and see what he was talking about yeah, there. Ah, shucks, won't be anything there. Like there's not Arizona who was the killer, but just the same. Oh, he, he sure must have been the killer. You boys get your horses and come along with me. We'll ride out the stage trail to where the holdup took place and then head for the tree and see what we can find there. Get Leaf the driver to go along with us and a couple other boys. Time to go, too. Good enough, Injun. You can go along if you want to. If anyone else wants to go, come on along. Get your horses and let's start traveling. But, Sheriff, what about taking up the trail of that mask rider? Oh, one thing at a time. If he killed the prisoner, we got to get him. Uh, who's giving orders around here, anyhow? Uh, you are. Them orders is downright confusion. You let that stranger shoot down the prisoner? If and, folks had wanted you for sheriff, they'd have voted that way. Now shut up and come along. After racing away from the jail, the Lone Ranger circled back to where the big wolf hunting dog was tied. The sheriff and his posse had ridden out along the stage trail, and when they arrived at the spot Arizona had described, they left the trail and headed for an old dead tree some hundred yards away. I'm staking a lot on what you tell me, Tonto. Isn't that good? Are you sure about Arizona? Ah, uh, Tonto, pretty sure. I never hear the location of killer in this way, but I'm willing to try anything if it'll bring the guilty man into the open. You see, pretty soon. Hey, Sheriff, reckon that must be the tree over yonder, ain't it? That right, Sam. Uh... 
I'm telling you, Sheriff, that critter must have been loco. Say, we find any clues there? Now, we'll see about that, Sam. Uh, just a waste of time, that's all. All this riding for nothing. You ain't afeard of being found guilty, are you, Sam? Why should I be afeard? I don't know. We're both at the tree, Sheriff. I got eyes, Ben. Arizona says it was hoof marks there. Yeah, that's what he said. Well, the ground will have to be a heap softer than it is to show any hoof prints. Maybe it is. It don't look so. We'll see in just a couple of seconds. Uh, Sheriff, is it the place? Yeah, here we are. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't spoil the tracks around here, fellas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, don't see no clues. No clue here. What's that, Redskin? You not find clue here. We won't? No. There no hoof print here. Then why in tarnation was we brought here? Me tell you. Well, go on. Dog a hunter, see killer. What about it? Dog plenty smart. Him think Arizona dead now. What's that to do with it? You look yonder, near stage trail. Well, there's the masked man. There's the white horse. He's got that hunting dog with him. What's the big idea, anyhow? Dog know who killed Banker. And dog think same feller kill Arizona. What about it? Dog come now. Him get killer. Him plenty bad dog. And him kill. Now, hold on. You can't let that dog come with a pack of men like this. You can't. The, the dog can't tell who the killer is. Him, no. You mean to say that's the reason that we're all sent here? Uh. So the dog could get the scent of the killer from near the stage trail, then come here and pick that critter out in our group? Is that it? That's right. Well, maybe the dog will make a mistake. I don't see no sense to leave it to a dog's judgment. Now, hold on, Jim. Let's go get that mask, fella. He shot Arizona. Now, take it easy. Here come dog. He's heading straight for us. Sure, he can't do this. He'll toss up. Now, take it easy, Jens. Take it easy. I don't reckon the dog will get the wrong man. He's got the scent. That dog's a man killer. I'm going to shoot the critter. No, you ain't. Put that gun down. There ain't going to be no shots fired. I'm trusting to the judgment of that there dog. He's followed wolves all over this part of the country. Now he's going to track down a human wolf. By thunderation, if the dog can do that, I'll take my hat off to that masked man. The masked man killed Arizona. I'm beginning to have my doubts about that. Him not kill Arizona. Arizona not hurt. He ain't hurt at all? No. You find silver bullet and wall at jail. So that is why the masked man told me not to be surprised at anything that happened. I don't want to stay here and get shot up by that dog. Uh, oh. Maybe you're the killer. Hey, hey. Don't let him get me. Hey, Wendy. Hey, what's the matter, Hogan? Look at Wendy. Where's he gone? What's wrong with Wendy? Yeah. He's heading for that tree. Hey there, Wendy. Come back here. He's trying to climb the tree. Don't let him get me. Uh, look at the dog. He's going right for the tree. He's picked Wendy. Don't let that dog get me. Don't let him get me. Come on, Silver. There comes a masked man now. Dog wants feller in tree. What do you make of that, Kent? What do you make of it? The dog's picked Wendy Hogan as the killer of Banker Whipple. Let me down. Let me down here. Get that dog. The dog is treat Wendy Hogan. How about it, Wendy? Do you want to confess, or are you going to stay up there until you starve? Don't let that dog get me. Don't let him get me. You're the one the dog's after, Wendy. Confess, and we'll rope the dog so you can come down. I, I confess. I killed the banker. I done it. Don't let the dog get me. I done it all right. I admit it. How about that, Sheriff? Is that confession enough? It certainly is. Wendy Hogan, of all people. That child. And he had us all in a suspicion. Come on down now, Wendy. The dog won't bother you. Quiet, boy. Quiet. Tie the dog. Tie him up. The dog isn't after you, Wendy. He's after the carcass of a wolf that we dragged across the ground and tied up in that tree. You'll see it hanging above your head. Well, I'll be doggone if this don't beat all. So it was the wolf the dog was after. Yes. You see, Sheriff, Arizona and I met on the stage trail. When Arizona told me how his dog would follow the track of a wolf, we decided to try a scheme to trap a human wolf. And you sure done that. We got the killer, Lone Ranger. And now if you want to take my keys, you can go and get your friend, the bounty hunter, out in jail. Here you are. Catch him. Yep. Arizona will be glad to hear that his plan worked. I O Silver, away! Come on, there, Silver, old boy! We're heading for Pine Bluff. There's trouble at the Gold King Mine. I O Silver, away!
story you have just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. Kid is coming. The first old kid. Yeah. He's the most dangerous man on the Barbary Coast. If he's looking for trouble, he's come to the right place. My business to be lucky. Not a bad business. Are you playing? Playing. That makes us even. We'll give him his choice of weapons. Knives or pistols. No, we better make it pistols with this guy. And we'll make it ten paces. When we start the pace off, I'll turn on eight and shoot. And you shoot too. And we'll make a good job of it. You're gonna marry me. I can't lie to you, Beth. I love you, but we can never mean anything to each other. There's a world of difference between us. You won't change and, and live my life. And you certainly won't live mine. No. Well, nevertheless, you're going to marry me. But what Mora needs is hanging. Yeah. And if his friends object, We'll hang them, too! Show Marx is your host, as some of the most interesting contestants you will ever meet compete on You Bet Your Life, up next. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is smile, S-M-I-L-E. <laughs> really? <laughs> you bet your life. <laughs> It's Groucho Marx in You Bet Your Life, a comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood and brought to you by the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers, the dealers who have on display the outstanding DeSoto Automatic with fully automatic power flight transmission and the all-new Plymouth, your best buy in the low-priced field. And now, here he is, the one, the only... Groucho! What a grisly name. Oh, that's me! <laughs> Well, here I am again with $1,500 for one of our couples. Well, Groucho, we have a young married couple for you tonight. And uh, when you meet them, I think you'll understand why I invited them to the show tonight. They're sort of special guests. So, Mr. and Mrs. Bob Mathias, would you come in, please, and meet Groucho Marx? <laughs> Well, 
are welcome, kids, for the DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Say the secret word and take home uh, an extra $100. It's a common word, something you always have uh, with you. Mr. and Mrs. Bob Mathias, well, the, the stool I'm sitting on is just like 42nd Street and Broadway. Sooner or later, the whole world passes by your door, <laughs> like Port Said. In case there's anybody who doesn't recognize him, this fellow happens to be the greatest all-around athlete of our time. He's the male Babe Dittrickson. <laughs> <laughs> He's this year's Jim Thorpe. <laughs> if you don't believe me, I'll ask Mrs. Matthias, isn't he? Sure, yes. <laughs> well, that proves it. What's your first name, Mrs. Matthias? Melba. Melba. Obviously, you're the toast of California. <laughs> How long have you been married, Melba? Oh, about eight and a half months, Groucho. Mm -hmm. But you knew all about him when he was doing all that jumping and running, huh? That's right. Uh -huh. Well, since you caught him, I'd say you were the greatest athlete of our time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> how old are you, Bob? 23, Groucho. Well, you're a pretty big fella, huh? How, how big are you? Well, I'm six foot three, mm -hmm. 205 pounds. And what do you weigh, Melba? Uh, about 118. He's twice as big as you are. <laughs> Does he scare you? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was always that way, ever since Samson and Delilah. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably planning to give him a haircut any day now. <laughs> How'd you meet Bob? Uh, do you remember the very first time you saw him? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, he was on the cover of Life magazine. And what did you do? Ask him to get off so you could read it? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you actually meet him? Well, it was at Stanford University. Uh, I was going around the corner, and he was coming from the opposite direction. And he, we bumped into one another, and he knocked me down, and he said, excuse me, and picked me up and went on. That's all he did, huh? Mm -hmm. Probably shows more sympathy when he knocks down a high hurdle. <laughs> <laughs> How about Bob's athletic victories? What are some of his achievements, Melba? Do you recall? Well, uh, I think two of his greatest was... Uh, Marrying you, I think. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, was during the last two Olympics in 48 and 52. He won the decathlon event both years. And uh, in 52, he set a world and Olympic record and amassed the most points for the event. Have you always been athletic, uh, Bob? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, when I was 13, I was anemic. And I was tired and, and weak and a 90-pound weakling. You were tired and run down at the age of 13? Yes, sir. Took me 40 years to get in that condition. <laughs> Well, how did you change from this miserable little crawfish <laughs> into this legendary athlete? Well, my father is an MD and surgeon, a doctor, mm -hmm. and uh, he prescribed lots of rest, the proper foods, and gave me iron shots mm -hmm. to build back my uh, blood. Mm -hmm. so what is your ambition, Bob? Are you still continuing your athletic career? Well, I took up golf about five, five months ago. Golf? Say, you really yeah. have a high ambition, huh? <laughs> you want to be president, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what is your best score at golf? 85. 85. Well, we're about the same there. Is that for 18 holes or 9? 18, I'm, I'm afraid. 18, yes. Yeah. Well, mine is for 3 holes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's for cheating, huh? <laughs> What are your plans for the immediate future, Bob? Are you in training for the next Olympics? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm through with track and field, but right now uh, we're getting ready to make a motion picture called The Bob Mathias Story, oh. a picture about my life. Who's going to play the part of Bob Mathias? I am. Could you use me as the 13-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to play yourself in the picture? Yes, I am. Well, no one ever plays himself in a Hollywood movie. <laughs> I should think the part would call for a real brawny type like uh, Clifton Webb. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie Bartholomew. Uh, <laughs> what happens when the picture's over? What are you going to do? After the picture, I go into the United States Marine Corps for two years. Oh. <laughs> well, in that case, my congratulations to the Marine Corps. Huh? <laughs> They're certainly getting a one-man army. <laughs> well, I've certainly enjoyed meeting you two. It would be nice if all the American couples looked like you, too. Beautiful girl and a handsome athlete. Thank you very much. And here I am. <laughs> well, let's see how much money you can win. You're going to play your bet your life. We'd start you off with a bankroll of $100. You're both college students, so you ought to be pretty smart. Every time you miss a question, you lose half of whatever your bankroll amounts to at the time. You're entitled to four questions, but you can quit any time you feel you've won more than the other couples. Clear? Right. Mm -hmm. You select a general information quiz. 
Okay. And remember, the more the question is worth, the harder it is. Seventy. Seventy. Is that all right with you? Uh, That's fine. <laughs> what was the name of the celebrated French line of fortifications along the German frontier? Mm -hmm. Mosino. Was that the Mosino line? Maginot line. Maginot well, line. Enough, yes. <laughs> You're on your way. Your bankroll is now $170. Now what do you want to try? Want 60? We'll try 60. 60. What, are the, what do the following have in common? Kohinoor, Great Mogul, and Hope. Kohinoor, Great Mogul, and Hope. They're all the same. They have different names. Mm. It's not, not, not hope, is it? Mm -mm. I don't you don't know, guess. Comedians. <laughs> well, there is a hope, comedians. <laughs> I don't know any Cohen or though, a great mogul. Well, they're all famous diamonds. Well, oh. you oh, lost yes. uh, half your bankroll, so you still have $85. All right, now what do you want to try? Eighty. Eighty dollars. What do you associate with words cumulus, stratus, and cirrus? I believe that's how you pronounce uh, it. Clouds. Clouds is good enough. Mm -hmm. Don't go any further. <laughs> The bankroll is now $165. Now, what do you want to try? Here's your last chance to be the other couples. $90. $90. This is the last hurdle. <laughs> Whose picture is on the regular issue of the three-cent stamp? <laughs> you don't know Washington guess. Washington or Jefferson? Which one? Jefferson. 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 That's Jefferson. right, Jefferson. You gave me a heart rate. <laughs> Thanks, and good luck oh, from Soda Plymouth Deal. And you wind up with a total of $255. This year, DeSoto is automatic with power flight drive that's the best. Just the turn of a key and you're ready to breeze. No clutch and no shifting, just drive as you please. DeSoto has beauty that's clean and modern. Both inside and out, it's a dream. For the finest car yet, you should drive, you should get the DeSoto Automatic. Yes, drive a new DeSoto Automatic, equipped with Power Flight, America's finest fully automatic transmission. You'll find driving is easier and far less tiring because DeSoto's fully automatic Power Flight transmission was designed to carry out your sudden orders quickly, smoothly, quietly. So for a new driving thrill, drive a new DeSoto Automatic with Power Flight. And if it's power you're looking for, get behind the wheel of a DeSoto Fire Dome. The mighty Fire Dome 170 horsepower V8 engine gives you all the power you can possibly use at the touch of a toe. Ready to perform the instant you call on it. Visit your DeSoto Plymouth dealer tomorrow and treat yourself to the beauty and luxury of a new DeSoto Automatic. Available in two great series, the mighty 170 horsepower Fire Dome 8 and the superb Power Master 6. Remember, DeSoto puts you ahead automatically. All right, George, who's next? We invited some business women to the show tonight, Groucho, and just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Mrs. Lindy Jamel to be your guest. Her partner is a businessman, Mr. C.W. Wiggle. So, folks, would you come in, please, and meet Roger Marks. <laughs> Welcome, folks, to your Bet Your Life. Say the secret word and divide $100. It's a common word, something you see every day. Mrs. Lindy Gunnell. Let's know? start with you. Uh, where is your home, Lindy? Well, I came from Sigourney, Iowa. Uh, Sigourney Island? Sigourney, Iowa. That's an Indian chieftain's name. What sort of work do you do, uh, Mrs. Gim? Well, I have a foster freeze. I didn't ask you where you were frozen, Mrs. Gamble. <laughs> I just was interested to know what sort of work you do. Oh, you mean what Foster Freeze is? Well, um, we're an ind small independent business, mm -hmm. and uh, we have 200 stores in the state of California. A small independent business? Small right. independent 200 business. Stores? 200 stores in what the state of California. What do you consider a large uh, business? Well, larger than the little store I offer. The Treasury Department? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what is the stuff good for? Do you rub it on your chest when you have a cold? Oh, no, it's food. It's the most delicious and healthy food there is. Well, we have chocolate, taste? strawberry, chocolate riffle. Uh -huh. And uh, who, are you, who are you again? Uh... I am C.W. Wiggle. <laughs> That's an odd name. 
set, and you knew twelve. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like an English name, is it? No, it is not, Groucho. It's Swiss origin. Swiss? That's right. Can you yodel? No, I cannot. I ask all Swiss people if they can yodel, because <laughs> it's commonly accepted that they can all yodel. Huh? What is your full name, Mr. Wiggle? Uh, C. Wilbert Wiggle. I'd rather, I'd rather see Marilyn wiggle if I had any <laughs> However, go ahead. <laughs> I'd be glad to see uh, uh, Wiggle, uh, Wilbert Wiggle. Wilbert, is it? Uh, That's right. I'm sure you must get kidded about your name, huh? Yes, I do, Groucho. You must hear many wisecracks. What are some of those you hear? Why, when I was a kid in school, the teacher in school called me Wiggle by name and Wiggle by nature, and then as I grew up and put on this weight, why, everybody called me Wee Willie Wiggle. <laughs> what sort of job do you do, uh, Wiggle, or have? I am or district operate, huh? manager for the National Federation of Independent Business. Uh -huh. Now, that's an organization of... Do you have a drop-in on, on Linda here? I haven't as yet, but probably I will after the show. <laughs> what we do is call on these businessmen. Are you married? You're married. Oh, yes, I'm married. Would you take your wife with you when you went to visit? My them? wife is always with me. She's right up in the audience right now. Would, uh, would she go with you to the Foster Freeze place? Oh, certainly, at all times. Oh. Apparently, she's on to you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but I'm, I'm all in favor of the small businessmen. I think they're a very necessary and essential part of our economy. And after the show, we'll all have a Foster Freeze, shall we? Yeah? That's right. Followed by a chaser of antifreeze. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, let's play you bet your life. We'll start you off with a bankroll of $100. You try to build it up by answering four questions. Every time you miss one, you lose half your bankroll. In the race for the $1,500, the first couple won $255, and the secret word is smile. You selected food quiz, and remember, the more the question is worth, the harder it is. Now, which question do you want to start with? Better make it a cheap one. Okay, we'll make it 40. 40. Okay, if the meat from a sheep is called mutton, what do you call meat from a calf? Veal. That is right. You now have one hundred forty dollars. Now, uh, what so do you want to try? Fifty one or the thirty one? Fifty. All right, we'll try the fifty, Groucho. Fifty. What kind of a fruit is a royal lamb? That's a cherry. That is right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a cherry. Your bankroll is now one hundred ninety dollars. Let's try a thirty this time. Okay. Let's try a thirty this time. A thirty? Yes. Okay. What do you call the heart, liver, and gizzard of poultry? Talk it over. Entrails. Entrails? <laughs> what do you say? Uh, I don't know. Well, it's giblets. Here's your last chance to beat the other couples. Well, you've, uh, you've lost half your bankroll, so you have $95. You have $95. Now, right. you can quit or go ahead. No, we'll go on. Okay. What I'm do you want? this one. $100 one, 10 Anything. It's hard to stick the easy one. 20 20 or 60? 60. 60. A popular Japanese alcoholic beverage is made from rice. What is it called? Uh, sake. That is right. Sake is right. Uh, Thanks and good luck, Minnesota Plymouth And you wind up with $155. George, who's next? Well, Groucho, we invited some dog show judges to our program tonight. And before we went on the air, our studio audience selected uh, Donya Klein to be on the show. And her partner is a visitor from the Middle West, Mr. Louis Menke. So, folks, would you come in, please, and meet Groucho Marx. Welcome to your Bet Your Life. Say the secret word and divide $100. Something, yeah. It's something, it's a common word. Something you always have with you. I've been saying this for seven years, and I still can't say it. Mrs. Uh, Donya Klein and Mr. Louis Menke, huh? Mrs. Klein, you're a dog show judge? Yes. Well, don't be nervous. I won't bite. Louis <laughs> Menke, eh? Menke. Yes, sir, that's me. Are you, you're a dog judge? No, I'm just a farmer. Oh, farmer. Pig judge, eh? Well, I'm a pretty good judge of pigs, yes. Oh. Well, don't look at me, eh? But I, <laughs> I still have a, a good dog, though. You have? Oh, huh? yeah. We keep one good dog. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, Mr. Marks, I'll tell you, a good dog is worth $1,000 on a farm. I'll tell you why. If I'd have a dog down in my cellar and my house would go fire, he'd bark and scratch on the door, he might save my whole family's life. Well, if he didn't come out, he'd be a hot dog. He would be a hot dog. 
<laughs> he's still going to come out if he's able to. Yes, you're, you're a dog, right. A dog is your best friend. He'll yes. never go back on you. You That's can thank right. him a dozen times, and when he, you say, come on, puppy, he'll always... He's got more, he's got more sense than lots of people have. You can say that again. Absolutely. You can say that again, and I hope you don't. <laughs> I, are you married? I... No, sir, I never married. You're not married? I'm not married. Uh, but I'm the happiest... Why not? I'm the happiest old bachelor in the state of Iowa. Uh, do, you, do you enjoy being a bachelor? Do I ever enjoy? If I wasn't an old bachelor, I couldn't be in California tonight. I'd have to be down in Iowa taking maybe dictation from my wife. But I have no wife. So what do you do? Take dictation from the dog? Yeah. No, sir, he don't dictate me either. So do, you, do, you, do you have a lot of fun as a I bachelor? Have, I have more fun than any man in the United States. I do for a fact. Well, how is that? Do you well, take I'll all tell your you, corn and distill it? I don't even drink, Mr. Mark. But I'll tell you what I do. You don't drink? I, I don't drink, cuss, swear, or even run women. But my pleasure... What do you mean, run women? You, <laughs> you don't run women, you run cattle and well, sheep. Well, that's the fellow chasing. Yeah. That's the fellow chase women, but I don't do that. You don't chase no, women? Sir. Don't they, they have no attraction for you well, at all? I would say just no attraction, but I never hooked up with one. I love them all, but I never hooked up with one. <laughs> In fact, I never want to be under a woman's thumb. I want to be my own boss. And I want to keep it that way. I've done it for 54 years, and I believe I can try it a little longer. <laughs> But listen, if I ever do get married, if I ever do go and get married, I'm going to stick with her for life. I ain't going to do it like some of these folks. The first thing you know, when you get married to a half a dozen women, it'll be your kids and my kids is fighting our kids. <laughs> Not over... if, if, if you don't get married soon, you won't have any kids. <laughs> They always say there's one and only Groucho Marx. So you're a very good sport. I'm the only one and only Louis Mank in the state well, of Iowa. Well, I and admire you, Louis. Uh, you're you're fine, well, fine we, we'll keep it that way, Groucho. <laughs> He's got an answer for everything. Eh? Doesn't always add up, but it's an answer. <laughs> Don't you? You're a dog show judge. Is that that's right? Well, yes. Uh, I may have a question to ask you later about a certain gay dog that I know. Huh? <laughs> what kind of dogs do you judge? Four-legged or two-legged? Well, uh, I judge the four-legged kind. I judge uh, all of the hounds in the... Four-legged hounds. or two-legged? Eh? Four-legged ones. Mm -hmm. Afghans, beagles, bloodhounds, borzois, whippets, those that are in the hounds, mostly. Well, pretend we're at a dog show, uh, Donya, and you're about to judge a bloodhound. What is the first thing you do? You see if he's anemic? Uh, no. After the dogs come in and parade around the ring and stand for your judgment... I look at the teeth, and uh, then I look at the wrinkles in the dog's head and see uh, if it has a dip behind its withers so that its back doesn't I beg grow. Your what was that? <laughs> you see if it has a dip behind its withers? Do you yes. understand this, uh, Louis? It's all, it's all Latin to me. <laughs> I don't know much about dogs, no. We have one dog, but he's just a mutt. He's just a, just a dog. But does he have a dip behind his withers? Uh? I wouldn't know anything about the dip, no. <laughs> Mrs. Klein, I, I happen to read a piece in a recent issue of Coronet Magazine called Dogs Are Dumb. Uh, did you read that? Uh? Yes, I certainly did. And do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with it because the, the man uh, asked the dogs to drop little round balls and square holes and uh, do a lot of uh, kindergarten stuff uh, that dogs are not inclined for. And if uh, the man who wrote this article knew anything about dogs, he wouldn't say that they're dumb, because I'd like to send the man down into a badger hole and see what he could do with a badger. That's what our dachshunds do. And I'd like to see uh, what he could do about retrieving a duck or pointing birds out in the field and, and uh, a few of the things that dogs really can do. Perhaps the most wonderful example of intelligence uh, with dogs are the dogs which are trained for seeing eye. Yeah. And if anyone can say that dogs are dumb and watch one of those seeing eye dogs work, and, uh, well, I just can't agree with him at all. <laughs> <laughs> in, in other words, we see it all with you. We see it all. Well, Louie, uh, tell us about your farm in Iowa. What kind of a farm is it? Well, it's a, it's a stock farm. It's mostly cattle and, and cattle and hogs is the main goal. Mm -hmm. We raise uh, corn and beans and oats and a little wheat for the chickens and alfalfa. And is, there, is there money in farming? Well, if there wasn't, I wouldn't be here today. Where would you be? Uh, well, I'd probably be out working every day. You well, don't really. regard that as work? On well, a sure it's work. But I'll tell you where we have a farmer has over most city people. I'll tell you why. If I want to work, if I want to work 24 hours, I can work 24 hours. If you want to punch a clock for eight hours and you miss an hour or so in the morning, you're out. But if I oversleep, 
I can work an hour over in the evening, I can make it up. If I have a rainy day, I can go to town all day. When it gets good, I can put two days in one. I got it over you. I can put you in the factory, Mr. Marks, and, and you run a machine. Not so loud. My sponsor's lively here. Well, I don't care for your sponsor. I'm, I got the floor now. Well, I, I do. <laughs> well, how about a bride, Louie? A uh, bride? Do you have any ideas on uh, what you'd like if well, you get married? Yes, sir. I, I, I like a little beauty, but beauty's only skin deep, and the other fellow said, for Lord's sake, skin her. But we'll not do that tonight. <laughs> Some people try to live on love. They try that for about six months. They find out that doesn't work. But we have a sign in our little restaurant down home. It says, if your wife can't cook, don't divorce her. Keep her for a pet and eat here. But who wants to keep her for a pet? <laughs> well, you're sort of a cracker-barrel philosopher, aren't you? <laughs> more, more truth and poetry. Last week, it was a couple had a bunch of kids going to school, and one little kid said, I don't like your daddy. He says, why? He said, because he drinks. He said, how do you know? He said, we had him last year. <laughs> Who knows who'll get them next year? <laughs> <laughs> your, ju- your guess is good as mine. It's been a delightful experience talking to you two. <laughs> now it's time to play your bet your life. Mm-hmm. We start you off with a bankroll of $100, and you try to increase it. In the race for the $1,500, Mr. and Mrs. Bob Mathias are still leading with $255. Let's see how much money you can make. You selected the animal kingdom, and remember, the more the question is worth, the harder it is. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? You can start off with anything you want. Well, you were worried about starting too high, so we'll start at about $60. $60. $60. What kind of an animal is a Clydesdale? That's a horse. That's a horse is correct, huh? Real real, really teaching you. Well, your bankroll is now $160. Now, what do you want to try? You want to go up or down? Well, it's up to you. Well, I thought you didn't want any women to rule your life. (laughs) (laughs) Age, age before beauty. Age before beauty. Say for $50. All right, we'll say 50 50 dollars What is the name of the huge vulture of the South American Andes? It is one of the largest birds that flies. Oh, the vulture in the Andes. Talk it over. Part of the vulture family. Pelican? No, that's not a vulture. No, it's a condor. C-O-N-D-O-R. Well, you lost half your bankroll. You now have eighty dollars. All right. Now, what do you want to try? We better take uh, seventy or eighty. Yeah, what do you want let's to take do? seventy. All right. All right. What is the science of ornithology? Talk it over. Oh, birds. Mm-hmm. Science of birds. Study of birds is right. You now have one hundred fifty dollars. And it's your last chance to beat the other couples. You can quit or you can proceed. Let's take ninety dollars. All right. Ninety dollars. What kind of animals live in warrens? In where? Warrens. W A R R E N S. Those aren't there. Talk it over. Wings that live in warrens. Warrens. Some of the bird family, aren't they? Wrens. No, you should have known this, Louie. It's rabbits. And you wind up with one half your bankroll, so you have $75. Thanks, and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. That means, Groucho, that Mr. and Mrs. Bob Mathias, with $255 in just one minute, get the chance of the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is National Safety Month. Can you see, steer, stop safely? If not, check your car. Check accidents. With a busy driving season here, now is the time to check your car. Be safe by driving a safe car. Last year, over a million people were killed and injured in needless automobile accidents. A good percentage of these accidents would have been avoided if the car owners had taken a small amount of time to have their cars checked. And to make sure your car gets a complete safety checkup, there's no better place to take it than to a DeSoto Plymouth dealer. His factory-trained mechanics will go over every part of your car that can affect your safety to make sure they are all in perfect working order. Wheels, brakes, headlights, tires, steering, windshield wipers, glass, horn, muffler, taillights, everything you need for safe driving. You'll be surprised how little time and money it takes to keep you and your family safe on the highways. Remember, 
To be a safe driver, you must be able to see, steer, stop safely. Check your car. Check accidents. Stop in where you see the sign of better service, the friendly sign of your DeSoto Plymouth dealer. And here's the winning couple, Groucho. Mr. and Mrs. Bob Mathias, all set for the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question. Here we go for $1,500. I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you. Think carefully and please no help in the audience. In the last presidential election, Adlai Stevenson ran on the Democratic ticket. For $1,500, who was his running mate? Talk it over. You got 15 seconds. Is it, uh... Is that... <laughs> What's the answer you two have decided upon? No, I know he's, he's from Alabama, Alabama or Southern State, but that's Well, it's John Sparkman. Oh. <laughs> so that means the big question next week will be worth two thousand dollars. Well, you lost the big money, but how much did they win the quiz, George? Uh, two hundred and fifty-five dollars in the well, quiz. Congratulations and thanks to both Thank of you, you and to all of our contestants on the show tonight. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night for the Groucho Marx Show. And don't miss Groucho on television. Also brought to you by the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. And when you drive in, tell them Groucho sent you. Good night, folks. And remember, just be sure to see the DeSoto Automatic. <laughs> the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers salute the great state of Michigan during Michigan Week. Vacation in Michigan, the water wonderland, this summer. You Bet Your Life, transcribed from Hollywood, is produced by John Goodell, directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith, music by Jack Meekin. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. You Bet Your Life is heard by our armed forces throughout the world. there, Tom. We're going to get them skunks. We're going to kill them the way they killed Joe. Whatever you say, Charlie. And whenever. What are you talking about? Are you crazy? I know he's alive, Charlie. I know he's alive. You shut your mouth. Let me talk to my please. Please, let me tell her I didn't mean to. Let me ask her to forgive me. stormed and burned the jail and lynched Joseph Wilson. What are you trying to do, Hummel? Where did you say you spent the night before last? I ain't answering the questions, buddy. You are. Come on, get out. Will you swear that during those hours, Frederick Garrett was peaceably at home? Yes. The witness. We've got him. Same as everybody else. Talking and drinking. She must love you an awful lot.
What do you mean? Uh, I think I figured out something that should impress those Disney executives with my acting ability. You really think they're gonna care? They're gonna be hiring you because of a Twitter hashtag. Well, I still want to do a good job. Uh, just listen to this, cause I've been practicing. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike fairy, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised fear spirit that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or maybe cram within this wooden O the airy cast that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon. Since a crooked figure may test in little place a million, and let us, ciphers to this great eat account, on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchs. Whose high, upraised, and abutting fronts the perilous narrow oceans parts asunder. Piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man, and make imaginary faces. Wink when please talk of horses that you see them, printing their proud full hooves in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Car carry them here and there, jumping over our times, turning the accomplishments of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply at me, me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble, humble peasants pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge. Our play. Okay, uh, that wasn't too bad. However, I think you're miscalculating something. You know what? I really don't think anybody at Disney is going to recognize Shakespeare or care about it. Ugh. Maybe I should just do something from Keeping Up with the Kardashians. That seems more on their level. Yeah, sorry. See you next time, folks.